Chapter 1 of The Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Blanchard. The Conquest by Oscar Majot. Discontent. Spirit of the Pioneer. Good gracious, has it been that long? It does not seem possible, but it was this very day nine years ago when a fellow handed me this little, what would you call it, Ingalls call it, opportunity. I've a notion to burn it, but I won't. Not this time. Instead, I'll put it down here, and you may call it what you like. Master of human destiny am I. Fame, love, and fortune on my footsteps wait. Cities and fields I walk. I penetrate deserts and seas remote, and passing by hovel and mart and palace soon or late i knock unbidden once at every gate if sleeping wake if feasting rise before i turn away it is the hour of fate and they who follow me reach every state mortals desire and conquer every foe save death but those who doubt or hesitate condemn to failure penury and woe seek me in vain and useless implore i answer not and i return no more yes it was that little poem that led me to this land and sometimes i wonder well i just wonder that's all again i think it would be somewhat different if it wasn't for the wind it blows and blows until it makes me feel lonesome and so far away from that little place and the country in southern illinois I was born twenty-nine years ago near the Ohio River, about forty miles above Cairo, the fourth son and fifth child of a family of thirteen, by the name of Devereux, which of course is not my name, but we will call it that for this sketch. It is a peculiar name that ends with an E-A-U-X, however, and it is considered an odd name for a coloured man to have, unless he is from Louisiana, where the French crossed with the Indians and slaves cause many louisiana negroes to have the french names and many speak the french language also my father however came from kentucky and inherited the name from his father who was sold off into texas during the slavery period and is said to be living there today he was a farmer and owned eighty acres of land and therefore considered fairly well to do that is for a colored man the country in which we lived bordered on the river some twenty miles and took its name from an old fort that used to do a little cannonading for the federal forces back in the civil war the farming in this section was hindered by various disadvantages and at best was slow hard work along the valleys of the numerous creeks and bayous that emptied their waters into the ohio the soil was of rich alluvium where in the early spring the back waters from the ohio covered thousands of acres of farm and timberlands and in receding left the land plastered with a coat of river sand and clay which greatly added to the soil's productivity one who owned a farm on these bottoms was considered quite fortunate here the corn stalks grew like saplings with ears dangling one and two to a stalk and as sound and heavy as green blocks of wood the heavy rains washed the loam from the hills and deposited it on these bottoms years ago when the rolling lands were cleared and before the excessive rainfall had washed away the loose surface the highlands were considered most valuable for agricultural purposes equally as valuable as those bottoms now are farther back from the river the more rolling the land became until some sixteen miles away it was known as the hills and here long before i was born the land had been very valuable large barns and fine stately houses now gone to wreck and deserted stood behind beautiful groves of chestnut locusts and stately old oaks where rabbits quail and woodpeckers made their homes and sometimes a raccoon or a possum found its den during the cold bleak winter days the orchards formerly the pride of their owners now dropped their neglected fruit which rotted and mulched with the leaves the fields where formerly had grown great crops of wheat corn oats timothy and clover were now grown over and enmeshed in a tangled mass of weeds and dewberry vines 
while along the branches and where the old rail fences had stood blackberry vines had grown up twisting their thorny stems and forming a veritable hedge fence these places i promised mother to avoid as i begged her to allow me to follow the big boys and carry their game when they went hunting in the neighbourhood and throughout the country there had at one time been many coloured farmers or ex-slaves who had settled there after the war many of them had built up nice homes and cleared the valley of tough rotted hickory gum pecan and water oak trees and the highlands of black white red or post oak sassafras and dogwood they later grubbed the stumps and hauled the rocks into the roads or dammed treacherous little streams that were continually breaking out and threatening the land with more ditches but as time wore on and the older generation died the younger were attracted to the towns and cities in quest of occupations that were more suitable to their increasing desire for society and good times leaving the farms to care for themselves until the inevitable german immigrant came along and bought them up at his own price tilled the land improved the farm and roads straightened out the streams by digging canals and grew prosperous as for me i was called the lazy member of the family a shirker who complained that it was too cold to work in the winter and too warm in the summer about the only thing for which i was given credit was in learning rapidly I always received good grades in my studies, but was continually criticised for talking too much and being too inquisitive. We finally moved into the nearby town of Empels, not so much to get off the farm or to be near more coloured people, as most of the younger Negro farmers did, as to give the children better educational facilities. The local coloured school was held in an old building made of plain boards standing straight up and down, with batten on the cracks it was inadequate in many respects the teachers very often inefficient and besides it was far from home after my oldest sister graduated she went away to teach and about the same time my oldest brother quit school and went to a nearby town and became a table waiter much to the dissatisfaction of my mother who always declared emphatically that she wanted none of her sons to become lackeys when the spanish-american war broke out the two brothers above me enlisted with a company of other patriotic young fellows and were taken to Springfield to go into camp. At Springfield, their company was disbanded and those of the company that wished to go on were accepted into other companies and those that desired to go home were permitted to do so. The younger of the two brothers returned home by freight. The other joined a Chicago company and was sent to Santiago and later to San Luis de Cuba, where he died with typhoid pneumonia. Empels was an old town with a few factories, two flour mills, two or three sawmills, box factories, and another concern where veneering was peeled from wood blocks softened with steam. The timber came from up the Tennessee River, which emptied into the Ohio a few miles up the river. There was also the market house, such as are to be seen in towns of the southern states and parts of the northern. This market house, or place, as it is often called, was an open building except one end enclosed by a meat market and was about 40 by 100 feet with benches on either side and one through the centre for the convenience of those who walked, carrying their produce in a homemade basket those in vehicles back to a line guarded by the city marshal forming an alleyway the width of the market house for perhaps half a block depending on how many farmers were on hand there was always a rush to get nearest the market house a case of the early bird getting the worm the townspeople who came to buy mostly women with baskets would file leisurely between the rows of vehicles hacks and spring wagons of various descriptions looking here and there at the vegetables displayed we moved back to the country after a time when my father complained of my poor service in the field and in disgust i was sent off to do the marketing which pleased me for it was not only easy but gave me a chance to meet and talk with many people 
and I always sold the goods and engaged more for the afternoon delivery. This was my first experience in real business, and from that time ever afterward I could always do better business for myself than for anyone else. I was not given much credit for my ability to sell, however, until my brother, who complained that I was given all the easy work while he had to labour and do all the heavy farm work, was sent to do the marketing. He was not a salesman and lacked the aggressiveness to approach people with a basket and never talked much, was timid and when spoken to or approached plainly showed it. On the other hand, I met and became acquainted with people quite readily. I soon noticed that many people enjoy being flattered and how pleased even the prosperous men's wives would seem if bowed to with a pleasant good morning, Mrs. Quanta, nice morning. And would you care to look at some fresh roasted ears? Ten cents a dozen, or some nice ripe strawberries. Two boxes for fifteen cents. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And oh, Mrs. Quanta, would you care for some radishes, cucumbers, or lettuce for tomorrow? I could deliver late this afternoon, you see, for maybe you haven't the time to come to market every day. From this association, I soon learnt to give each and every prospective customer a different greeting or suggestion which usually brought a smile and a nod of appreciation, as well as a purchase. Before the debt swamped my father, and while my brothers were still at home, our truck gardening, the small herd of milkers, and the chickens paid as well as the farm itself. About this time, father fell heir to a part of the estate of a brother, which came as a great relief to his ever-increasing burden of debt. While this seeming relief to father was on, I became very anxious to get away. In fact, I didn't like Ample's, nor its surroundings. It was a river town and gradually losing its usefulness by the invasion of railroads up and down the river. Besides, the coloured people were in the most part wretchedly poor, ignorant and envious. They were set in their ways of their localisms and it was quite useless to talk to them of anything that would better oneself. The social life centred in the two churches where praying, singing and shouting on Sundays to backbiting, stealing, fighting and getting drunk during the week was common among the men. They remained members in good standing at the churches. However, as long as they paid their dues, contributed to the numerous rallies or helped along in camp meetings and festivals, Others were regularly turned out, mostly for not paying their dues, only to warm up at the next revival on the mourner's bench and come through converted and be again accepted into the church and, for a while at least, live a near righteous life. There were many good Christians in the church, however, who were patient with all this conduct, while there were and still are those who will not sanction such carry-on by staying in a church that permits of such shaming and hypocrisy. These latter often left the church and were then branded either as infidels or human devils who had forsaken the house of God and were condemned to eternal damnation. My mother was a shouting Methodist and many times we children would slip quietly out of the church when she began to get happy. The old and less religious men hauled slop to feed a few pigs, cut cord wood at 50 cents per cord and did any odd jobs or kept steady ones when such could be found. The women took in washing, cooked for the white folks, and fed the preachers. When we lived in the country, we fed so many of the elders with their long-tailed coats and assuming and authoritative airs that I grew to almost dislike the sight of a coloured man in a Prince Albert coat and clerical vest. At sixteen, I was fairly disgusted with it all and took no pains to keep my disgust concealed. This didn't have the effect of burdening me with many friends in Empools, and I was regarded by many of the boys and girls who led in the whirlpools of the local coloured society as being of the too slow to catch cold variety, and by some of the elders as being worldly, a free thinker, and a dangerous associate for young Christian folks. Another thing that added to my unpopularity, perhaps, was my persistent declaration that there were not enough competent coloured people to grasp the many opportunities that presented themselves, and that if white people could possess 
such nice homes, wealth and luxuries. So in time could the coloured people, you're a fool, I would be told, and then would follow a lecture describing the time-worn long and cruel slavery, and after the emancipation, the prejudice and hatred of the white race, whose chief object was to prevent the progress and betterment of the Negro. This excuse for the Negro's lack of ambition was constantly dinned into my ears, from the Kegel corner loafer to the minister in the pulpit, and I became so tired of it all that I declared that if I could ever leave Empel's, I would never return. More, I would disprove such a theory, and in the following chapters I hope to show that what I believe fourteen years ago was true. End of chapter one. Chapter two of The Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lyndon Godsell. The Conquest by Oscar Mayhew. Leaving Home, a Maiden. I was seventeen when I at last left Empless. I accepted a rough job at a dollar and a quarter a day in a car manufacturing concern in a town of eight thousand population, about eight hundred being coloured. I was unable to save very much, for work was dull that summer, and I was only averaging about four days' work a week. Besides, I had an attack of malaria at intervals for a period of two months, but by going to work at five o'clock a.m. when I was well, I could get in two extra hours, making a dollar fifty. The concern employed about twelve hundred men and paid their wages every two weeks. Holding back one week's pay, I came there in June, and it was some time in September that I drew my fullest pay envelope, which contained $16.50. About this time, a fire-eating colored evangelist, who apparently possessed great converting powers and unusual eloquence, came to town. These qualities, however, usually became very uninteresting towards the end of a stay. He had been to Emplus the year before I left, and at that place his popularity greatly diminished before he left. The greater part of the colored people in this town were of the emotional kind, and to these he was as attractive as he had been at Emplus in the beginning. Coincident with the commencement of Reverend McIntyre's soul-stirring sermons, a big revival was inaugurated and although the little church was filled nightly to its capacity, the aisles were kept clear in order to give those that were steeping in hell's fire, as the evangelists characterized those who were not members of some church, an open road to enter into the field of the righteous, also to give the mourners sufficient room in which to exhaust their emotions when the spirit struck them, and it is needless to say that they were used. At times they virtually converted the entire floor into an active gymnasium, regardless of the rights of the other person or of the chairs they occupied. I had seen and heard people shout at long intervals in church, but here after a few soul-stirring sermons, they began to run outside where there was more room to give vent to the hallucination and this wandering of the mind. It could be called nothing else, for after the first few sermons the evangelist would hardly be started before some mourner would begin to come through. This revival warmed up to such proportions that preaching and shouting began in the afternoon instead of evening. Men working in the yards of the foundry two blocks away could hear the shouting above the roaring furnaces and the deafening noise of machinery of a great car manufacturing concern. 
The church stood on a corner where two streets or avenues intersected, and for a block in either direction the influence of fanaticism became so intense that the converts began running about like wild creatures, tearing their hair and uttering prayers and supplications in discordant tones. At the evening services, the sisters would gather around a mourner that showed signs of weakening and sing and babble until he or she became so befuddled they would jump up, throw their arms widely into the air, kick, strike, then cry out like a dying soul, fall limp and exhausted into the many arms outstretched to catch them. This was always conclusive evidence of a contrite heart and a thoroughly penitent soul. Far into the night this performance would continue, and when the mourner's bench became empty the audience would be searched for sinners. I would sit through it all quite unemotional, and nightly I would be approached with, Aren't you ready? to which I would make no answer. I noticed that several boys, who were not in good standing with the parents of girls they wished to court, found the mourner's bench a convenient vehicle to the homes of these girls, all of whom belonged to church. Girls over eighteen who did not belong were subjects of much gossip and abuse. A report in some inconceivable manner soon became spread that Oscar Devereux had said that he wanted to die and go to hell. Such a sensation. I was approached on all sides by men and women, regardless of the time of day or night, by the young men who gloried in their conversation and who urged me to get right with Jesus before it was too late. I do not remember how long these meetings lasted, but they suddenly came to an end when notice was served on the church trustees by the city council, which irreverently declared that so many converts every afternoon and night was disturbing the white neighborhood's rest as well as their nerves. It ordered windows and doors to be kept closed during services, and, as the church was small, it was impossible to house the congregation and all the converts, so the revival ended and the community was restored to normal and calm once more prevailed. That was in September. One Sunday afternoon in October, as I was walking along the railroad track, I chanced to overhear voices coming from under a water tank where a space of some eight or ten feet enclosed by four huge timbers made a small secluded place. I stopped, listened, and was sure I recognized the voices of Douglas Brock, his brother Melvin, and two other well-known colored boys. Douglas was betting a quarter with one of the other boys that he couldn't pass. You who know the dice and its vagaries will know what he meant. This was mingled with words and commands from Melvin to the dice in trying to make some point. It must have been four. He would let out a sort of yowl. Little Joe, can't you do it? I went my way. I didn't shoot craps nor drink neither did I belong to church, but was called a dreadful sinner while three of the boys under the tank had, not less than six weeks before, joined church and were now full-fledged members in good standing. Of course, I did not consider that all people who belonged to church were not Christians, but was quite sure that many were not. The following January, a relative of mine got a job for me bailing water in a coal mine in a little town inhabited entirely by Negroes. I worked from 6 o'clock p.m. to 6 a.m. and received $2.25 therefore. The work was rough and hard and the mine was very dark. The smoke hung like a cloud near the top of the tunnel-like room during all the night. This was because the fans were all but shut off at night and just enough air was pumped in to prevent the formation of black damp. 
The smoke made my head ache until I felt stupid, and the dampness made me ill. But the two dollars and twenty-five cents per day looked good to me. After six weeks, however, I was forced to quit, and with sixty-five dollars more money than I'd ever had, I went to see my older sister, who was teaching in a nearby town. I had grown into a strong, husky youth of eighteen, and my sister was surprised to see that I was working and taking care of myself so well. She shared the thought of nearly all of my acquaintances that I was too lazy to leave home and do hard work, especially in the winter time. After a while, she suddenly looked at me and spoke as though afraid she would forget it. Oh, Oscar, I've got a girl for you. What do you think of that? Smiling so pleasantly, I was afraid she was joking. You see, I had never been very successful with the girls. And when she mentioned having a girl for me, my heart was all of a flutter. And when she hesitated, I put in eagerly. Ah, go on. Quit. You're kidding. On the level now, or are you just chiding me? But she took on a serious expression, and speaking thoughtfully, she went on. Yes, she lives next door, and is a nice little girl and pretty. The prettiest coloured girl in town. Here I lost interest, for I remembered my sister was foolish about beauty, and I said that I didn't care to meet her. I was suspicious when it came to the pretty type of girls, and I had observed that the prettiest girl in town was oft times petted and spoiled, and a mere butterfly. Oh, why? She spoke like one hurt. Then I confessed my suspicions. Oh, you're foolish! She exclaimed softly, appearing relieved. Besides, she went on brightly. Jessie isn't a spoiled girl. You wait until you meet her. And in spite of my protest, she sent the landlady's little girl off for Miss Rooks. She came over in about an hour, and I found her to be demure and thoughtful, as well as pretty. She was small of stature, had dark eyes and beautiful wavy black hair, and an olive complexion. She wouldn't allow me to look into her eyes, but continued to cast them downwards, sitting with folded hands and answering when spoken to in a tiny voice quite in keeping with her small person. During the afternoon, I mentioned that I was going to Chicago. Now, Oscar. You've got no business in Chicago," my sister spoke up with a touch of authority. "You're too young, and besides," she asked, "do you know whether W O wants you?" W O was our oldest brother, and was then making Chicago his home. "Ha!" I snorted. "I'm going on my own hook, and drawing up to my full six feet, I try to look brave, which seemed to have the desired effect on my sister." Well, she said resignedly, "You must be careful and not get into bad company. Be good and try to make a man of yourself." End of chapter two. Chapter three of the Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Blanchard, The Conquest by Oscar Michaud, Chicago, chasing a will o' the wisp. That was on Sunday morning, three hundred miles south of Chicago, and at nine forty that night, I stepped off the New Orleans and Chicago fast mail into a new, different world. It was, I believe, the coldest night that I had ever experienced. The city was new and strange to me. And I wandered here and there for hours before I finally found my brother's address on Armour Avenue. But the wandering and anxiety mattered little, for I was in the great city where I intended beginning my career, and felt that bigger things were in store for me. The next day, my brother's landlady appeared to take a good deal of interest in me and encouraged me so that I became quite confidential, and told her of my ambitions for the future and that it was my intention to work. Save my money and eventually become a property owner. 
I was rather chagrined later, however, to find that she had repeated all this to my brother, and he gave me a good round scolding, accompanied by the unsolicited advice that if I would keep my mouth shut, people wouldn't know I was so green. He had been travelling as a waiter on an Eastern Railroad dining car, but in a fit of independence which had always been characteristic of him, had quit, and now in midwinter was out of a job. He was not enthusiastic concerning my presence in the city, and I had found him broke, but with a lot of fine clothes and a diamond or two. Most folks from the country don't value good clothes and diamonds in the way city folk do, and I, for one, didn't think much of his finery. I was greatly disappointed, for I had anticipated that my big brother would have accumulated some property or become master of a bank account during these five or six years he had been away from home. He seemed to sense this disappointment, and became more irritated at my presence, and finally wrote home to my parents, who had recently moved to Kansas, charging me with the crime of being a big, awkward, ignorant kid, unsophisticated in the ways of the world, and especially of the city, that I was likely to end my career by running over a streetcar and permitting the city to irreversibly lose me, or something equally as bad. When I heard from my mother, she was worried and begged me to come home. I knew the folks at home shared my brother's opinion of me, and believed all he had told them, so I had a good laugh all to myself, in spite of the depressing effect it had on me. However, there was the reaction, and when it set in I became heartsick and discouraged, and then and there became personally acquainted with the Blues, who gave me their undivided attention for some time after that. The following Sunday I expected him to take me to church with him, but he didn't. He went alone, wearing his $5 hat, $15 made-to-measure shoes, $45 coat and vest, $11 trousers, $50 tweed overcoat, and his diamonds. I find my way to the church alone, and when I saw him sitting reservedly in an opposite pew, I felt snubbed, and my heart sank, however only momentarily, for a new light dawned upon me, and I saw the snobbery and folly of it all, and resolved that some day I would rise head and shoulders above that foolish, four-flushing brother of mine in real and material success. I finally secured irregular employment at the Union Stockyards. The wages at that time were not the best, common labour a dollar fifty per day, and the hours very irregular. Some days I was called for duty at five in the morning, and laid off at three in the afternoon, or called again at eight in the evening, to work until nine the same evening. I soon found the mere getting of jobs to be quite easy. It was getting a desirable one that gave me trouble. However, when I first went to the yards, and looked at the crowds waiting before the office in quest of employment, I must confess I felt rather discouraged. But my new surroundings, and that inevitable interesting feature about these crowds, with their diversity of nationalities and ambitions, made me forget my own little disappointments. Most all new arrivals, whether skilled or unskilled workmen, seeking jobs in the city, find their way to the yards. Thousands of unskilled labourers are employed here and it seems to be the mecca for the down and out who wander thither in a last effort to obtain employment. The people with whom I stopped belong to the servant class and live neatly in the Armour Avenue flat, the different classes of people who make up the population of a great city are segregated more by their occupations than anything else. The labourers usually live in a labourer's neighbourhood. Tradesmen find it more agreeable among their fellow workmen, and the same is true of the servants and others. I found that employment which soiled the clothes and face and hands was out of keeping among the people with whom I lived. So after trying first one job then another, I went to Joliet, Illinois, to work out my fortune in the steel mills of that town. I was told that at that place was an excellent opportunity to learn a trade. But after getting only the very roughest kind of work to do around the mills, such as wrecking and carrying all kinds of broken iron and digging in a canal, along with a lot of jabbering foreigners whose English vocabulary consisted of but one word, their labourer's number. 
it is needless to say that I saw little chance of learning a trade at any very early date. Payday happened every two weeks with two weeks held back. If I quit, it would be three weeks before I could get my wages, but I was informed of a scheme by which I could get my money by telling the foreman that I was going to leave the state. Accordingly, I approached the renowned imbecile and told him that I was going to California and I would have to quit and would like to get my pay. Pay days every two weeks, so be sure to get back in time, he answered in that officious manner, so peculiar to foreman. I had only four dollars coming, so I quit anyway. That evening I became the recipient of the illuminating information that if I would apply at the coal chutes, I would find better employment as well as receive better wages. I sought out the fellow in charge, a big coloured man, weighing about two hundred pounds, who gave me work cracking and heaving coal into the chute at a dollar fifty per twenty-five tons. Gracious, I expostulated. A man can't do all that in a day. Pooh! And he waved his big hands depreciatingly. I have heaved forty tons with small effort. I decided to go to work that day, but with many misgivings, as to the cracking and shoveling twenty-five tons of coal. The first day I managed, by dint of hard labour, to crack and heave eighteen tons out of a box car, for which I received the munificent sum of one dollar, and the next day I fell to sixteen tons, and likewise to eighty-nine cents. The contractor, who superintended the coal business, bought me a drink in a nearby saloon, and as I drank it with a gulp, he patted me on the shoulder, saying, Now, after the third day, son, you begin to improve, and at the end of the week, you can heave thirty tons a day, as easy as a clock ticking the time. I thought he was going to add that I would be shoveling forty tons like Big Jim, the fellow who gave me the job. But I cut him off by telling him that I'd resign before I became so proficient. I had to send for more money to pay my board, my brother, being my banker, sent a statement of my account, showing that I had to date just twenty-five dollars, and the statement seemed to read coldly between the lines that I would soon be broke, out of a job, and what then? I felt very serious about the matter, and when I returned to Chicago, I had lost some of my confidence regarding my future. Mrs. Nelson, the landlady, boasted that her husband made twenty dollars per week showed me her diamonds and spoke so very highly of my brother that I suspicioned that she admired him a great deal and that he was in no immediate danger of losing his room even when he was out of work and unable to meet his obligations. My next step was to let an employment agency swindle me out of two dollars. Their system was quite unique and I presume legitimate. They persuaded the applicant to deposit three dollars as a guarantee of good faith, after which they were to find a position for him. A given percentage was also to be taken from the wages for a certain length of time. Some of these agencies may have been all right, but my old friend the hoodoo led me to the one that was an open fraud. After the person seeking employment has been sent to several places for imaginary positions that prove to be only myths, the agency offers to give back a dollar and the disgusted applicant is usually glad to get it, I myself being one of many of these unfortunates. I then tried the newspaper ads. There is usually some particular paper in any large city that makes a speciality of want advertisements. I was told, as was necessary, to stand at the door when the paper came from the press, grab a copy, choose an ad that seemed promising, and run like wild for the address given. I had no trade, so turned to the miscellaneous column, and as I had no references, I looked for a place where none were required. If the address was near, I would run as fast as the crowded street and the speed laws would permit, but always found upon arrival that someone had just either been accepted ahead of me or had been there a week, I having run down an old ad that had been permitted to run for that time. About the only difference I found between the newspapers and the employment agencies was that I didn't have to pay three dollars for the experience. I now realized the disadvantages of being an unskilled laborer and had grown weary of chasing a will-o'-the-wisp. 
and one day while talking to a small indian looking negro i remarked that i wished i could find a job in some suburb shining shoes in a barber shop or something that would take me away from chicago and its dilly-dally jobs for a while i know where you can get a job like that he answered thoughtfully where i asked eagerly why out at eton he went on a suburb about twenty-five miles west a fellow wanted me to go but i don't want to leave chicago i found that most of the colored people with whom i had become acquainted with who lived in chicago very long were similarly reluctant about leaving but i was ready to go anywhere so my new friend took me over to a barber supply house on Clark Street, where a man gave me the name of the barber at Eton, and told me to come by in the morning, and he'd give me a ticket to the place. When I got on the street again, I felt so happy and grateful to my friend for the information, that I gave the little mulatto a half dollar, all the money I had with me, and I had walked for the forty blocks to my room. Here I filled my old grip, and the next morning beat it, for Eden, arriving there on the 1st of May, and a cold, bleak spring morning it was. I found the shop without any trouble, a dingy little place with two chairs. The proprietor, a drawn, unhappy-looking creature, and a hawkish-looking German assistant, welcomed me cordially. They seemed to need company. The proprietor led me upstairs to a room that I could have free, with an oil stove, and a table where I could cook, so I made arrangements to batch. I received no wages, but was allowed to retain all I made shining. I had acquired some experienced shining shoes on the streets of Empoles, with a homemade box, getting on my knees whenever I got a customer. Shining shoes is not usually considered an advanced or technical occupation requiring skill. However, if properly conducted, it can be the making of a good solicitor. While Eton was a suburb, it was also a country town, and this shop was never patronised by any of the metropolitan class who made their homes there, but principally by the country class, who do not evidence their city pride by the polish of their shoes. Few city people allow their shoes to go unpolished, and I wasn't long in finding it out. And when I did, I had something to say to the men who went by, well-dressed, but with dirty shoes. If I could argue with them into stopping, if only for a moment, I could nearly always succeed in getting them into the chair. Business, however, was dull, and I began taking jobs in the country from the farmers, working through the day and getting back to the shop for the evening. This, however, was short-lived, for I was unaccustomed to farm work since leaving home and found it extremely difficult. My first work in the country was pitching Timothy Hay side by side with a girl of sixteen, who knew how to pitch hay. I thought it would be quite romantic before I started, but before the night came I had changed my mind. The man on the wagon would drive alongside a big cock of sweet-smelling hay, and the girl would stick her fork partly to one side of the hay cock and show me how to put my fork into the other. I was left-handed while she was right, and with our backs to the wagon we could make a heavy lift, and when the hay was directly overhead we'd turn and face each other, and over the load would go onto the wagon. Toward evening the loads thus balanced seemed to me as heavy as the load of Atlas bearing the air. I am sure my face disclosed the fatigue and strain under which I laboured, for it was clearly reflected in the knowing grin of my companion. I drew my pay that night on the excuse of having to get an overall suit, promising to be back at quarter to seven the next morning. Then I tried shocking oats along with a boy of about twelve, a girl of fourteen and a farmer's wife. The way those two children did work, whew! I was so glad when a shower came up about noon that I refrained from shouting with difficulty. I drew my pay this time to get some gloves and promised to be back as soon as I dried. The next morning I felt so sore and stiff as a result of my two days' experience in the harvest fields that I forgot all about my promise to return and decided to stay in Eton. It was in Eton that I started my first bank account. The little $20 certificate of deposit opened my mind to different things entirely. I would look at it until I had daydreams. 
During the three months I spent in Eden, I laid the foundation of a future. Simple as it was, it led me into channels which carried me away from my race and into a life fraught with excitement, a life that gave experiences and other things I had never dreamed of. I had started a bank account of twenty dollars, and I found myself wanting one of thirty, and to my surprise the desire seemed to increase. This desire fathered my plans to become a porter on a PN car, a position I diligently sought and applied for between such odd jobs about town as mowing lawns, washing windows, scrubbing floors, and a variety of others that kept me quite busy, taking the work, if I could, by contract, thus permitting me to use my own time and to work as hard as I desired to finish. I found that this plan I could make money faster and easier than by working in the country. I was finally rewarded by being given a run on a parlor car by a road that reached many summer resorts in southern Wisconsin. Here I skimped along on a run that went out every Friday and Saturday, returning on Monday morning. The regular salary was $40 per month, but as I never put in more than half the time, I barely made $20, and although I made little on the side, in the way of tips, I had to draw on the money I had saved in Eton. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the Conquest This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli The Conquest by Oscar Michaud Chapter Four The P Company the P Company is a big palace, dining and sleeping car company, that most American people know a great deal about. I had long desired to have a run on one of the magnificent sleepers that operated out of Chicago to every part of North America, that I might have an opportunity to see the country and make money at the same time and from Monday to Friday I had nothing to do but report at one of the three P offices in my effort to get such a position. One office, where I was particularly attentive, operated cars on four roads, so I called on this office about twice a week, but a long, slim chief clerk whose chair guarded the entrance to the superintendent's office, would drawl out lazily, We don't need any men today. I had been to the office a number of times before I left Eton, and had heard his drawl so often that I grew nervous whenever he looked at me. That district employed over a thousand porters, and there was no doubt that they hired them every day. One day I was telling my troubles to a friendly porter, whom I later learned to be George Cole, former husband of the present wife of Bert Williams, the comedian. He advised me to see Mr. Miltzow, the superintendent. "'But I can never see him,' I said despairingly, "'for that long imbecile of a clerk. "'Jump him some day when he is on the way from luncheon. "'Talk fast. "'Tell him how you have been trying all summer to get on. "'The old man,' he said, referring to the superintendent, "'likes big, stout youngsters like you, so try it.' "'The next day I watched him from the street, and when he started to descend the long stairway to his office, I gathered my courage and stepped to his side. I told him how I had fairly haunted his office, only to be turned away regularly by the same words, that I would like a position if he would at any time need any men. He went into his office, leaving me standing at the railing, where I held my grounds in defiance, of the chief clerk's insolent stare. After a few minutes, he looked up and called out, Come in here, you. 
As I stood before him, he looked me over searchingly and inquired as to whether I had any references. No, sir, I answered quickly, but I can get them. I was beside myself with nervous excitement and watched him eagerly for fear he might turn me away at the physiological moment and that I would fail to get what I had wanted so long. Well, he said in a decisive tone, get good references, showing what you have been doing for the last five years, bring them around and I'll talk to you. Thank you, sir, I blurted out and with hopes soaring, I hurried out and down the steps. Going to my room, I wrote for references to people in M, who had known me all my life. Of course, they sent me the best of letters, which I took immediately to Mr. Miltsow's office. After looking them over carelessly, he handed them over to his secretary, asking me whether I was able to buy a uniform. When I answered in the affirmative, he gave me a letter to the company's tailor and one to the instructor, who the next day gave me my first lessons in a car called the school in a nearby railroad yard placed there for that purpose. I learned all that was required in a day, although he had some pupils who had been with him five days before I started and who graduated with me. I now thought I was a full-fledged porter and was given an order for equipment, combs, brushes, etc., a letter from the instructor to the man that signed out the runs, a very apt-appearing young man with a gift for remembering names and faces, who instructed me to report on the morrow. The thought of my first trip the next day, perhaps to some distant city I'd never seen, caused me to lie awake the greater part of the night. When I went into the porter's room the next day, or down in the hole, as the basement was called, and looked into the place, I found it crowded with men, and mostly old men at that. I felt sure it would be a long time before I was sent out. However, I soon learned that the most of them were emergency men, or emergies, men who had been discharged and who appeared regularly in hopes of getting a car that could not be supplied with a regular man. There was one by the name of Knight, a pitiable and forlorn character in whose breast hope sprang eternal, who came to the hole every day, and in an entire year he had made one lone trip. He lived by mooching a dime quarter or fifty cents from first one porter, then another, and by helping some porters make down beds and cars that went out on midnight trains. It was said that he had been discharged on account of too strict adherence to duty. Every member of a train crew, whether porter, brakeman, or conductor, must carry a book of rules more as a matter of form than to show to passengers as Knight had done. A trainman should, and does, depend more on his judgment than on any set of rules, and permits the rule to be stretched now and then to fit circumstances. Knight, however, corded his rule book, and when a passenger requested some service that the rules prohibited, such, for instance, as an extra pillow to a berth, and if the passenger insisted or showed dissatisfaction, Knight would get his book of rules, turn to the chapter which dwelt on the subject, and read it aloud to the already disgruntled passenger, thereby making more or less of a nuisance to the traveling public. But I am digressing. Fred, the sign-out clerk, came along and the many voices indulging in loud and raucous conversation so characteristic of porters off-duty gave way to respectful silence. He looked favorably on the regular men, but seemed to pass up the emerges as he entered. 
The poor fellows didn't expect to be sent out, but it seemed to fascinate them to hear the clerk assign the regular men their cars to some distant cities in his cheerful language, such as, Hello, Brooks, where did you come from? From San Antonio? Well, take the car Litchfield to Oakland. Leaves on number three at eleven o'clock tonight over the B and R N. Have the car all ready, eight lowers made down. And from one to the other he would go, signing one to go east and another west. Respectfully silent and attentive the men's eyes would follow him as he moved on, each and every man eager to know where he would be sent. Finally, he got to me. He had an excellent memory and seemed to know all men by name. Well, Devereux, he said, do you think that you can run a car? Yes, sir, I answered quickly. He fumbled his pencil thoughtfully while I waited nervously, then went on. And you feel quite capable of running a car, do you? Yes, sir, I replied with emphasis. I learned thoroughly yesterday. Well, he spoke as one who has weighed the matter and is not quite certain but willing to risk, and taking his pad and pencil, he wrote, speaking at the same time, You go out to the Fort Wayne Yards and get on the car El Tata. Goes extra to Washington, D.C. at three o'clock. Put away the linen, put out combs, brushes, and have the car in order when the train backs down. Yes, sir, and I hurried out of the room, up the steps, and onto the street where I could give vent to my elation. To Washington, first of all places, oh glory, and I fairly flew out to 16th Street, where the P.F. and W. passenger yards were located. Here, not less than 700 passenger and P. cars are cleaned and put in readiness for each trip daily, and standing among them I found the Alteda. Oh, wonderful name. She was a brand new observation car, just out of the shops. I dared not believe my eyes, and felt that there must be some mistake. Surely the company didn't expect to send me out with such a fine car on my first trip. But I should have known better for among the many thousands of P-cars with their picturesque names, there was not another El Tata. I looked around the yards and finally inquired of a cleaner as to where the El Tata was. Right there, he said, pointing to the car I had been looking at, and I boarded her nervously, found the linen and lockers, but was at a loss to know how and where to start getting the car in order. I was more than confused, and what I had learned so quickly the day before had vanished like smoke. I was afraid, too, that if I didn't have the car in order, I'd be taken off when the train backed down and become an emergy myself. This shocked me so it brought me to my senses, and I got busy putting the linen somewhere, and when the train stopped in the shed, the car, as well as myself, was fairly presentable and ready to receive. Then came the rush of passengers, with all their attending requests for attention. Ah, Poida, put my grip in thirteen. And, ah, Poida, will you raise my window and put in a deflector? Holy smithereens, I rushed back and forth like a lost calf, trying to recall what a deflector was, and I couldn't distinguish thirteen from three. Then, ah, Poida, will you tell me when we get to Valparaiso? called the little blonde lady. You see, I have a son who is attending the university there. Now, Poida, don't forget, please, she asked winsomely. Oh, no, ma'am, I assured her confidently that I never forgot anything. My confusion became so intense, had I gotten off the car, I'd probably not have known which way to get on again. The clerk seemed to sense my embarrassment, 
and helped me seat the passengers in their proper places, as well as to answer the numerous questions directed at me. The G.A.R. encampment was on in Washington, and the rush was greater than usual on that account. By the time the train reached Valparaiso, I had gotten somewhat accustomed to the situation and recalled my promise to the little blonde lady and filled it. She had been asleep, and it was raining to beat the band. With a sigh, she looked out of the window and then turned on her side and fell asleep again. At Pittsburgh, I was chagrined to be turned back and sent over the P.H. and D. to Chicago. At Columbus, Ohio, we took on a colored preacher who had a ticket for an upper berth over a southerner who had the lower. The southern gentleman, in that holier-than-thou attitude, made a vigorous kick to the conductor to have the colored sky pilot, as he termed him, removed. I heard the conductor tell him gently but firmly that he couldn't do it. Then, after a few characteristic haughty remarks, the southerner went forward to the chair car and sat up all night. When I got the shoes shined and lavatory ready for the morning rush, I slipped into the southerner's berth and had a good snooze, however longer than it should have been, for the conductor found me the next morning as the train was pulling into Chicago. He threatened to report me, but when I told him that it was my first trip out, that I hadn't had any sleep the night before and none the night before that on account of my restlessness in anticipation of the trip, he relented and helped me to make up the beds. I barely got to my room before I was called to go out again, this time going through to Washington. The PF and W tracks pass right through Washington's Black Belt, and it might be interesting to the reader to know that Washington has more colored people than any other American city. I had never seen so many colored people. In fact, the entire population seemed to be Negroes. There was an old lady from South Dakota on my car who seemed surprised at the many colored people, and after looking quite intently for some time, she touched me on the sleeve, whispering, Porter, aren't there anything but colored people here? I replied that it seemed so. At the station, a near mob of colored boys huddled before the steps, and I thought they would fairly take the passengers off their feet by the way they crowded around them. However, they were harmless and only wanted to earn a dime by carrying grips. Two of them got a jujitsu grip, on that of the old lady from South Dakota, and to say that she became frightened would be putting it mildly. Just then, a policeman came along, and the boys scattered like flies, and the old lady seemed much relieved. Having since taken up my abode in that state myself, and knowing that there were but few Negroes inhabiting it, I have often wondered how she must have felt on that memorable trip of hers, as well as mine. After working some four months on various and irregular runs that took me to all the important cities of the United States east of the Mississippi River, I was put on a regular run to Portland, Oregon. This was along in February, and about the same time that I banked my first $100, if my former bank account had stirred my ambition and become an incentive to economy and a life of modest habits, the larger one put everything foolish and impractical entirely out of my mind, and economy, modesty, and frugality became fixed habits of my life. At a point in Wyoming on my run to Portland, my car left the main line and went over another through Idaho and Oregon. From there, no birth tickets were sold by the station agents, and the conductors collected the cash fares, and had for many years mixed the company's money with their own. I soon found myself in the mire along with the conductors. Getting in was easy, and tips were good for a hundred dollars a month and sometimes more. Good conductors— 
a name applied to colorblind cons, were worth seventy-five, and with the twenty-five-dollar salary from the company, I averaged two hundred dollars a month for eighteen months. There is something fascinating about railroading, and few men really tire of it. In fact, most men, like myself, rather enjoy it. I never tired of hearing the tea clack of the trucks and the general roar of the train as it thundered over streams and crossings throughout the days and nights across the continent to the Pacific coast. The scenery never grew old, as it was quite varied between Chicago and North Platte. During the summer, it is one large garden farm, dotted with numerous cities, thriving hamlets and towns, fine country homes so characteristic of the great Middle West, and is always pleasing to the eye. Between North Platte and Julesburg, Colorado, is the heart of the semi-arid region, where the yearly rainfall is insufficient to mature crops, but where the short buffalo grass feeds the ranchers' herds winter and summer. As the car continues westward, climbing higher and higher, as it approaches the Rockies, the air becomes quite rare. At Cheyenne, the air is so light it blows a gale almost steadily, and the eye can discern objects for miles away, while the ear cannot hear sounds over twenty rods. I shall not soon forget how I was wont to gaze at the herds of cattle ten to thirty miles away, grazing peacefully on the great Laramie Plains to the south, while beyond that lay the great American Rockies, their ragged peaks towering above in great sepulchral forms, filling me alternately with a feeling of romance or adventure, depending somewhat on whether it was a story of the roundup or some other article typical of the West I was reading. Nearing the Continental Divide, the car pulls into Rawlins, which is about the highest, driest, and most uninviting place on the line. From here, the stage lines radiate for a hundred miles to the north and south. Near here is Medicine Bow, where Owen Wister lays the beginning scenes of the Virginian and beyond lies Rock Springs, the home of the famous coal that bears its name and which commands the highest price of any bituminous coal. The coal lies in wide veins, the shafts run horizontally, and there are no deep shafts as there are in the coal fields of Illinois and other central states. From here the train descends a gentle slope, to Green River, Wyoming, a division point in the U.P. South on the D and R.G. is Green River, Utah. Arriving at Granger, one feels as though he had arrived at the jumping-off place of creation. Like most all desert stations, it contains nothing of interest, and time becomes a bore. Here the traffic is divided, and the OSL takes the Portland and Butte section into Idaho, where the scenery suddenly begins to get brighter. Indeed, the country seems to take on a beautiful and cheerful appearance. Civilization and beautiful farms take the place of the wilderness, sagebrush, and skulking coyotes, thanks to the irrigation ditch. After crossing the picturesque American Falls of Snake River, the train soon arrives at Minidoka. This is the seat of the great Minidoka project, in which the United States government has taken such an active interest and constructed a canal over 70 miles in length. This has converted about a quarter of a million acres of Idaho's volcanic ash soil into productive lands that bloom as the rose. It was the beautiful valley of the Snake River, with its indescribable scenery and its many beautiful little cities, that attracted my attention and looked as though it had a promising future. 
I had contemplated investing in some of its lands and locating, if I should happen to be compelled by stress of circumstances to change my occupation. This came to pass shortly thereafter. The end came after a trip between Granger and Portland, in company with a shrewd Irish conductor by the name of Wright, who not only knocked down the company's money, but drank a good deal more whiskey than was good for him. On this last trip, when Wright took charge of the car at Granger, he began telling about his newly acquired dear little wifey, also confiding to me that he had quit drinking and was going to quit knocking down after that trip. Oh, yes, Wright was always going to dispense with all things dishonest and dishonorable at some future date. Another bad thing about Wright was that he would steal, not only from the company, but from the porter as well, by virtue of the rule that required the porter to take a duplicate receipt from the conductor for each and every passenger riding on his car, whether the passenger has a ticket or pays cash fare. These receipts are forwarded to the auditor of the company at the end of each run. Wright's method of stealing from the porter was not to turn over any duplicates or receipts until arriving at the terminus, and he would choose a time when the porter was very busy brushing the passenger's clothes and getting the tips, and would then have no time to count up or tell just how many people had ridden. I had received information from others concerning him and was cautioned to watch. So on our first trip, I quietly checked up all the passengers as they got on and where they got off, as well as the berth or seat they occupied. Arriving at Granger going east, he gave me the wink, and taking me into the smoking room, he proceeded to give me the duplicates and divide the spoils. He gave me six dollars, saying he had cut such and such a passenger's fare, and that was my part. I summed up, and the amount knocked down was $31. I showed him my figures, and at the same time told him to hand over nine fifty more. How he did rage and swear about the responsibilities being all on him, that he did all the collecting and the dirty work in connection therewith that the company didn't fire the porter. He said before he would concede to my demands, he would turn all the money into the company and report me for insolence. I sat calmly through it all, and when he had exhausted his vituperations, I calmly said, nine fifty, please. I had no fear of his doing any of the things threatened, for I had dealt with grafting conductors long enough to know that when they determined on keeping a fare, they weren't likely to turn in their portion to spite the porter, and Wright was no exception. But getting back to the last trip, an old lady had given me a quart of old crow whiskey, bottled in bond. There had been perhaps a half pint taken out. I thanked her profusely and put it in the locker, and since Wright found that he could not keep any of my share of the knocked-down fares, he was running straight, that is, with me, and we were quite friendly, so I told him of the gift and where to find it if he wanted a smile. In one end of the P, where the drawing-room cuts off the main portion of the car, and at the beginning of the curved aisle and opposite to the drawing room is the locker. When its door is open, it completely closes the aisle, thus hiding a person from view behind it. Before long, I saw Wright open the door, and a little later could hear him ease the bottle down after taking a drink. When we got to Portland, Wright was feeling about right, and the bottle was empty. As he divided the money with me, he cried, Let her run on three wheels. It was the last time he divided any of the company's money with a porter. When he stepped into the office at the end of that trip, he was told that they had a message from Ager, the assistant general superintendent, concerning him. 
Every employee knew that a message from this individual meant, Off goes the bean. I never saw right afterwards, for they got me too that trip. The little Irish conductor, who was considered the shrewdest of the shrewd, had run a long time and knocked down a great amount of the company's money, but the system of spotting eventually got him, as it does the best of them. I now had $2,340 in the bank. The odd 40 I drew out and left the remainder on deposit, packed my trunk and bid farewell to Armour Avenue and Chicago's black belt with its beer cans, drunken men and women, and turned my face westward with the spirit of Horace Greeley before and his words, Go west, young man, and grow up with the country, ringing in my ears. So westward I journeyed to the land of raw material, which my dreams had pictured to me as the land of real beginning, and where I was soon to learn more than a mere observer ever could by living in the realm of a great city. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of the Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter Five. Go West, Young Man, and Grow Up with the Country. In justice to the many thousands of pea porters, as well as many conductors, who were in the habit of retaining the company's money, let it be said that they are not the hungry thieves and dishonest rogues the general public might think them to be, dishonest as their conduct may seem to be. They were victims of a vicious system, built up and winked at by the company itself. Before the day of the Interstate Commerce Commission, an anti-pass and two-cent-per-mile legislation, and when passengers paid cash fares, it was a matter of tradition with the conductors to knock down, and nothing was said, although the conductors, as now, were fairly well paid and the company fully expected to lose some of the cash fares. In the case of the porters, however, the circumstances are far more mitigating. At the time I was with the company, there were, in round numbers, 8,000 porters in the service on tourist and standard sleepers who were receiving from a minimum of $25 to not to exceed $40 per month, depending on length and desirability of service. Out of this he must furnish, for the first ten years, his own uniforms and cap, consisting of summer and winter suits, at twenty and twenty-two dollars, respectively. After ten years of continuous service, these things are furnished by the company. Then there is the board, lodging, and laundry expense. Trainmen are allowed from fifty to sixty percent off of the regular bill of fare, and at this price, most any kind of a meal in an a la carte diner comes to forty and fifty cents. Besides, the waiters expect tips from the crew as well as from the passengers and make it more uncomfortable for them if they do not receive it than they usually do for the passenger. I kept an accurate itemized account of my living expenses, including six dollars per month for a room in Chicago and economize as I would, making one uniform and cap last a whole year, I could not get the monthly expense below $40, $15 more than my salary, and surely the company must have known it and condoned any reasonable amount of knockdown on the side to make up the deficiency in salary. The porter's knockdown usually coming through the sympathy, goodwill, and unwritten law of knocking down, that the conductor divide equally with the porter. 
all of which, however, is now fast becoming a thing of the past, owing to recent legislation, investigations, and strict regulation of common carriers by Congress and the various laws of the states of the Union, with the added result that conductors' wages have increased accordingly. Few conductors today are foolish enough to jeopardize their positions by indulging in the old practice, and it leaves the porters in a sorry plight indeed. All in all, the system, while deceptive and dishonest on its face, was for a time a tolerated evil, apparently sanctioned by the company, and became a veritable disease among the colored employees who, without exception, received and kept the company's money without a single qualm of conscience. It was a part of their duty to make the job pay something more than a part of their living expenses. Ignorant as many of the porters were, most of them knew that from the enormous profits made that the company could and should have paid them better wages, and I am sure that if they received living wages for their services, it would have a great moralizing effect on that feature of the service, and greatly add to the comfort of the traveling public. However, the greedy and inhuman attitude of this monopoly toward its colored employees has just the opposite effect, and is demoralizing indeed. Thousands of black porters continue to give their services in return for starvation wages and are compelled to graft the company and the people for a living. Shortly before my cessation of activities in connection with the P Company, it had a capitalization of $95 million, paying 8% dividend annually, and about two years after I was compelled to quit, it paid its stockholders a $35 million surplus, which had accumulated in five years. Just recently, a melon was cut of about a like amount, and over 8,000 colored porters helped to accumulate it at from 25 to $40 per month. A wonder it is that their condition does not breed such actual dishonesty and deception that society would be forced to take notice of it and the traveling public should be thankful for the attentive services given under these near-slave conditions. As for myself, the reader has seen how I made it pay, and I have no apologies or regrets to offer. When that final reckoning comes, I am sure the angel clerk will pass all porters against whom nothing more serious appears than what I have heretofore related." While I was considered very fortunate by my fellow employees, the whole thing filled me with disgust. I suffered from a nervous worry and fear of losing my position all the time, and really felt relieved when the end came and I was free to pursue a more commendable occupation. In going out of the superintendent's office on my farewell leave, the several opportunities I had seen during my experience with the P Company loomed up and marched in dress parade before me. The conditions of the Snake River Valley and the constructiveness of the people who had turned the Alkali Desert into valuable farms worth from fifty to five hundred dollars an acre thrilled me so that I had no misgivings for the future." but destiny had other fields in view for me and did not send me to that land of Eden of which I had become so fond in quest of fortune. Such a variety of scenes was surely an incentive to serious thought. What was termed inquisitiveness at home brought me a world of information abroad. This inquisitiveness combined with the observation afforded by such runs as those to Portland and around the circle, and perhaps coming back by Washington, D.C., gave practical knowledge. Often Western sheepmen, who were ready talkers, returning on my car from taking a shipment to Chicago, 
gave me some idea of farming and sheep raising. I remember thinking that Iowa would be a fine place to own a farm, but quickly gave up any further thought of owning one there myself. A farmer from Tama, that state, gave me the information. He was a beautiful decoration for a pea berth and a neatly made bed with three sheets, and I do not know what possessed him to ever take a sleeper, for he slept little that night, I am sure. The next morning, about five o'clock, while gathering and shining shoes, I could not find his, and being curious, I peeped into his berth. What I saw made me laugh indeed. There he lay, all bundled into his bed in his big fur overcoat and shoes on, just as he came into the car the evening before. He was awake, and looked so uncomfortable that I suggested that he get up if he wasn't sleepy. "'What say?' he answered, leaning over and sticking his head out of the berth as though afraid someone would grab him. As this class of farmers like to talk, and usually in loud tones, I led him into the smoking room as soon as he jumped out of his berth to keep him from annoying other passengers. Here he washed his face, still keeping his coat on. "'Remove your coat,' I suggested. "'You'll be more comfortable.' "'You bet,' he said, taking his coat off and sitting on it, lighting his pipe, he began talking, and I immediately inquired of him how much land he owned. He answered that he owned a section. Gee, but that's a lot of land, I exclaimed, getting interested. And what is it worth an acre? The last quarter I bought I paid eighty dollars an acre, he returned. That is over thirteen thousand, and I could plainly see that my little two thousand dollar bank account wouldn't go very far in Iowa when it came to buying land. That was nine years ago, and the same land today will sell about one hundred and fifty dollars an acre, and the end is not yet. I concluded on one thing, and that was if one whose capital was under eight or ten thousand dollars desired to own a good farm in the great central west, he must go where the land was new or raw or undeveloped. He must begin with the beginning and develop with the development of the country. By the proper and accepted methods of conservation of the natural resources and close application to his work, his chances for success are good. When I finally reached this conclusion, I began searching for a suitable location in which to try my fortune and the harrowing of the soil. End of chapter 5「VI of the Conquest This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter VI. And where is Oristown, the town on the Missouri? It came a few days later in a restaurant in Council Bluffs, Iowa, when I heard the waiters, one white man and the other colored, saying, I'm going to Oristown. And where is Oristown? I inquired, taking a stool and scrutinizing the bill of fare. Oristown, the white man spoke up, drawing away at a pipe which gave him the appearance of being anything from a rover to a freight brakeman. It's about 250 miles northwest of here, in southern South Dakota, on the edge of the Little Crow Reservation, to be open this summer. This is not the right name, but the name of an Indian chief living near where this is written. Oristown is the present terminus of the C and R W Rye, and he went on to tell me that the land in part was valuable, while some portions were no better than western Nebraska. 
a part of the reservation was to be open to settlement by lottery that summer and the registration was to take place in july it was now april and the registration is to come off at orristown i finished for him with a question yes he assented at omaha the following day i chanced to meet two surveyors who had been sent out to the reservation from washington d c and who told me to write to the Department of the Interior for information regarding the opening, the lay of the land, quality of the soil, rainfall, etc. I did as they suggested, and the pamphlets received stated that the land to be opened was a deep black loam with clay subsoil, and the rainfall in this section averaged 28 inches in the last five years i knew that iowa had about thirty inches and most of the time was too wet so concluded here at last was the place to go this suited me better than any of the states or projects i had previously looked into besides i knew more about the mode of farming employed in that section of the country it being somewhat similar to that in southern illinois on the morning of july fifth at U.P. Transfer, Iowa, I took a train over the C.P. and St. L., which carried me to a certain town on the Missouri in South Dakota. I did not go to Orristown to register as I had intended, but went to the town referred to, which had been designated as a registration point also. I was told by people who were hitting in the same direction and for the same purpose that Orristown was crowded and lawless, with no place to sleep, and was overrun with tin horn gamblers. It would be much better to go to the larger town on the Missouri, where better hotel accommodation and other conveniences could be had. So I bought a ticket to Johnstown, where I arrived late in the afternoon of the same day there was a large crowd which soon found its way to the main street where numerous booths and offices were set up with a notary in each to accept applications for the drawing this consisted of taking oath that one was a citizen of the united states twenty-one years of age or over the head of a family a widow or any woman upon whom fell the support of a family was also accepted no person, however, owning over 160 acres of land or who had ever had a homestead before could apply. The application was then enclosed in an envelope and directed to the superintendent of the opening. After all the applications had been taken, they were thoroughly mixed and shuffled together. Then a blindfolded child was directed to draw one from the pile, which became number one in the opening. The lucky person whose oath was contained in such envelope was given the choice of all the land thrown open for settlement. Then another envelope was drawn, and that person was given the second choice, and so on until they were all drawn. This system was an out-and-out -out lottery, but gave each and every applicant an equal chance to draw a claim, but guaranteed none. Years before, land openings were conducted in a different manner. The applicants were held back of a line until a signal was given, and then a general rush was made for the locations and settlement rights on the land. This worked fairly well at first, but there grew to be more applicants than land, and two or more persons often located on the same piece of land, and this brought about expensive litigation and annoying disputes and sometimes even murder over the settlement. This was finally abolished in favor of the lottery system, which was at least safer and more profitable to the railroads that were fortunate enough to have a line to one or more of the registration points. At Johnstown, People from every part of the United States, of all ages and descriptions, gathered in crowded masses, the greater part of them being from Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, Minnesota, North Dakota, Kansas, and Nebraska. When I started for the registration, I was under the impression that only a few people would register, 
probably four or five thousand. As there were twenty-four hundred homesteads, I had no other thought than I would draw and later file on a quarter section. Imagine my consternation when, at the end of the first day, the registration numbered ten thousand. A colored farmer in Kansas had asked me to keep him posted in regard to the opening. He also thought of coming up and registering when he had completed his harvest. When the throngs of people began pouring in from the three railroads into Johnstown, and there were two other points of registration besides, I saw my chances of drawing a claim dwindling from one to two to one to ten, fifteen and twenty and maybe more. After three days in Johnstown, I wrote my friend and told him I believed there would be fully 30,000 people apply for the 2,400 claims. The fifth day, I wrote there would be 50,000. After a week, I wrote there would be 75,000 register, that it was useless to expect to draw, and I was leaving for Kansas to visit my parents. When the registration was over, I read in a Kansas City paper that 107,000 persons had registered, making the chance of drawing 1 to 44. Received a card soon after from the superintendent of the opening, which read that my number was 6,504, and as the number of claims was approximately 2,400, my number was too high to be reached before the land should all be taken. I think it was the same day I lost $55 out of my pocket. This, combined with my disappointment in not drawing a piece of land, gave me a grouch, and I lit out for the Louisiana Purchase Exposition at St. Louis with the intention of again getting into the P service for a time. Oft times, porters who had been discharged went to another city, changed their names, furnished a different set of references, and got back to work for the same company. Now, if they happened to be on a car that took them into the district from which they were discharged, and before the same officials, who of course recognized them, they were promptly reported and again discharged. I pondered over the situation and came to the conclusion that I would not attempt such deception, but avoid being sent back to the Chicago Western District. I was at a greater disadvantage than Johnson, Smith, Jackson, or a number of other common names by having the odd French name that had always to be spelled slowly to a conductor or anyone else who had occasion to know me. Out of curiosity, I had once looked in a Chicago directory. Of some two million names, there were just two others with the same name. But on the other hand, it was much easier to avoid the Chicago Western District, or at least Mr. Miltsow's office, and by keeping my own name, assume that I had never been discharged, than it was to go into a half a dozen other districts with a new name and avoid being recognized. Arriving at this decision, I approached the St. Louis office, presented my references, which had been furnished by other M. businessmen, and was accepted. After I had been sent out with a porter, who had been running three months to show me how to run a car, I was immediately put to work. I learned in two trips, according to the report my tutor handed to the chief clerk, and by chance fell into one of the best runs to New York on one of the limited trains during the fair. There was not much knocking down on this run, but the tips, including the salary, were good for $300 a month. I ran on this from September 1st to October 4th and saved $300. I had not given up getting a Dakota homestead, for while I was there during the summer, I learned if I did not draw a number, I could buy a relinquishment. This relates to the purchasing of a relinquishment. An entry man has the right at any time to relinquish back to the United States all his right, title, and interest to, and in the land covered by his filing. The land is then open to entry. 
A claim holder who has filed on a quarter of land will have plenty of opportunity to relinquish his claim for a cash consideration so that another party may get a filing on it. This is called buying or selling a relinquishment. The amount of the consideration varies with quality of the land and the eagerness of the buyer or seller, as the case may be. Relinquishments are the largest stock in trade of all the real estate dealers in a new country. Besides, everybody from the bank president down to the humble dishwasher in the hotel or the chore boy in the livery, the ministers not omitted, would, with guarded secrecy, confide in you of some choice relinquishment that could be had at a very low figure compared with what it was really worth. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Conquest This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Blanchard The Conquest by Oscar Majot Chapter 7 Oristown the Little Crow Reservation When I left St. Louis on the night of October 4th, I headed for Oristown to buy someone's relinquishment. I had $2,500. From Omaha the journey was made on the C&RW's one train a day that during these times was loaded from end to end with everybody discussing the Little Crow and the buying of relinquishments. I was the only negro on the train and an object of many inquiries as to where I was going. Some of those whom I told that I was going to buy a relinquishment seemingly regarded it as a joke, judging from the meaning glances cast at those nearest them. An incident occurred when I arrived at Oristown, which is yet considered a good joke on a real estate man then located there by the name of Keeler, who was also the United States Commissioner. He could not only sell me a relinquishment, but could also take my filing. I had a talk with Keeler, but as he did not encourage me in my plans to make a purchase, I went to another firm, a young lawyer and a fellow by the name of Slater, who ran a livery barn around the corner. Watkins, the lawyer, impressed me as having more ambition than practical business qualities. However, Slater took the matter up and agreed to take me over the reservation and show me some good claims. If I bought, the drive was gratis, if not four dollars per day, and I accepted his proposition. After we had driven a few miles, he told me Keeler had said to him that he was a fool to waste his time hauling a D-nigger around over the reservation, that I didn't have any money, and I was just stalling. I flushed angrily and said, show me what I want and I will produce the money. What I want is something near the west end of the county. You say the relinquishments are cheaper there, and the soil is richer. I don't want big hills or rocks, nor anything I can't farm. But I want a nice level or gentle rolling quarter section of prairie near some town to be, that has prospect of getting the railroad when it is extended west from Oristown. By this time we had covered the three miles between Oristown and the reservation line, and had entered the newly opened section which stretched for thirty miles to the west. As we drove on, I became attracted by the long grass, now dead, which was of a brownish hue, and as I gazed over the miles of it laying like a mighty carpet, I could seem to feel the magnitude of the development and industry that would some day replace this state of wilderness. To the northeast, the Missouri River wound its way, into which empties the Whetstone Creek, the breaks of which resembled miniature mountains, falling abruptly, then rising to a point where the dark shale side glistened in the sunlight. It was my longest drive in a buggy. We could go perhaps three or four miles on a table-like plateau, then drop suddenly into small canyons like ditches and rise abruptly to the other side. After driving about 15 miles, we came to the town, as they called it, but I would have said village of Hedrick, a collection of frame shacks with one or two houses, many roughly constructed sod buildings the long brown grass hanging from between the sod, giving it a frizzled appearance. Here we listened to a few boasters and mounty banks whose rustic eloquence was no doubt intended to give the unwary the impression that they were on the site 
of the coming metropolis of the West. A county seat battle was to be fought the next month, and the few citizens of the sixty days declared they would wrest it from Fairview, the present county seat situated in the extreme east end of the county. If it cost them a million dollars, or one half of all they were worth, they boasted of Hedrick's prospects, sweeping their arms around in eloquent gestures, in alluding to the territory tributary to the town, as though half the universe were Hedrick territory. Nine miles northwest, where the land was very sandy and full of pits, into the buggy wheels dropped with a grinding sound, and where magnesia rocks cropped out of the soil, was another budding town by the name of Kirk. The few prospective citizens of this burg were not so enthusiastic as those in Hedrick, and when I asked one why they located the town in such a sandy country, he opened up with a snort about some pinhead engineer from the government who didn't know enough to jump straight up at locating the town in such an all-fired sandy place. But he concluded with a compliment that plenty of good water could be found at from 15 to 50 feet. This sandy land continued some three miles west, and we often found springs along the streams. After ascending an unusually steep hill, we came upon a plateau, where the grass, the soil, and the lay of the land were entirely different from any we had yet seen. I was struck by the beauty of the scenery, and it seemed to charm and bring me out of the spirit of depression the sandy stretch brought upon me. Stretching for miles to the northwest, and to the south, the land would rise in a gentle slope to a hogback, and as gently slope away to a draw, which drained to the south. Here the small streams emptied into a larger one, winding along like a snake's track, and thickly wooded with a growth of small hardwood timber. It was beautiful. From each side the land rose gently, like huge wings, and spread away as far as the eye could reach. The driver brought me back to earth, after a mile of such fascinating observations, and pointing to the north, said, There lays one of the claims. I was carried away by the first sight of it. The land appeared to slope from a point, or table, and to the north of that was a small draw, with water. We rode along the south side, and on coming upon a slight rise, which he informed me was the highest part of the place, we found a square white stone set equally distant from four small holes, four or five feet apart. On one side of the stone was inscribed a row of letters, which ran like this, SWC, SWQ, SEC, 29-97-72, W, 5th PM, and on the other sides were some other letters similar to these. What does all that mean? I asked. He said the letters were initials describing the land and reading from the side next to the place we had come to see, read the southwest corner of the southwest quarter of section 29, township 97 and range 72, west of the 5th principal meridian. When we got back to Oristown, I concluded I wanted the place and dreamed of it that night. It had been drawn by a girl who lived with her parents across the Missouri. To see her, we had to drive to their home and here a disagreement arose, which for a time threatened to cause a split. I had been so enthusiastic over the place that Slater figured on a handsome commission, but I had been making inquiries in Oristown, and found I could buy relinquishments much cheaper than I had anticipated. I had expected the price to be about $1,800, and came prepared to pay that much, but was advised to pay not over $500, for land as far west as the town of Magori, which was only four miles northwest of the place I was now dickering to buy. We had agreed to give the girl $375, and I had partly agreed to give Slater $200 commission. However, I decided that was too much, and I told him I would give him only $75. He was in for going right back to Oristown and calling the deal off. But when he figured up that two and a half days driving would amount only to ten dollars, he offered to take one hundred dollars, but I was obstinate and held out for seventy-five dollars, finally giving him eighty dollars, and in due time became the proud owner of a little crow homestead.
All this time I had been writing to Jessie. I had written first while I was in Eton, and she had answered in the same demure manner in which she had received me at our first meeting, and had continued answering the letters I had written from all parts of the continent in such the same way. For a time I had quit writing, for I felt she was really too young and not taking me seriously enough. But after a month my sister wrote me, asking why I did not write to Jessie, that she asked about me every day. This inspired me with a new interest, and I began writing again. I wrote her in glowing terms all about my advent in Dakota, and as she was of a reserved disposition, I always asked her opinion as to whether she thought it a sensible move. I wanted to hear her say something more than, I was at a cantata last evening and had a nice time, and so on. Furthermore, I was sceptical. I knew that a great many coloured people considered farming a deprivation of all things essential to a good time. In fact, to have a good time was the first thing to be considered, and everything else was secondary. Jessie, however, was not of this kind. She wrote me a letter that surprised me, stating, among other things, that she was seventeen and in her senior year high school, that she thought I was grand and noble, as well as practical, and was sorry she couldn't find the words to tell me all she felt, but that which satisfied me suited her also. I was delighted with her answer, and wrote a cheerful letter in return, saying I would come to see her Christmas. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Conquest This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee. The Conquest by Oscar Michel. Far Down the Pacific. The Proposal. After the presidential election of that year, I went to South America with a special party, consisting mostly of New York capitalists and millionaires. We traveled through the southwest, crossing the Rio Grande at Eagle Pass, and on south by the way of Torian, Zacatecas, Aguas, Calientes, Guadalajara, Puebla, Tehuantepec, and to the southwest coast, sailing from Salina Cruz down the Pacific to Valparaiso, Chile, going inland to Santiago, thence over the Trans-Andean Railway, across the Andes and onward to the western plateau of Argentina. Arriving at the new city of Mendoza, we visited the ruins of the ancient city of the same name. Here in the early part of the 15th century, on a Sunday morning, when a large part of the people were at church, an earthquake shook the city, and when it passed, it left bitter ruin in its wake the only part that stood intact being one wall of the church. Of a population of 13,000, only 1,600 persons escaped alive. The city was rebuilt later, and at the time we were there, it was a beautiful place of about 25,000 population. At this place, a report of bubonic plague in Brazil reached us. The party became frightened and beat it in post-haste back to Valparaiso, setting sail immediately for Salina Cruz, and spent the time that was scheduled for a tour of Argentina in snooping around the land of the Montezumas. This is the American center of Catholic churches, the home of many gaudy Spanish women and begging peons, where the people, the laws, and the customs are 200 years behind those of the United States. Still, I thought Mexico very beautiful, as well as of historical interest. One day we journeyed far into the highlands, where lay the ancient Mexican city of Cuernavaca, the one-time summer home of America's only emperor, Maximilian. From there we went to Puebla, where we saw the old cathedral, which was begun in 1518, and which was at the time was said to be the second largest in the world. 
we saw San Luis Potosi and Monterey, and returned by way of Laredo, Texas. I became well enough acquainted with the liberal millionaires, and so useful in serving their families, that I made five hundred and seventy-five dollars on the trip, besides bringing back so many gifts and courtesies of all kinds, that I had enough to divide up with a good many of my friends. Flushed with prosperity and success in my undertaking since leaving southern Illinois less than three years before, I went to Embor to see my sister and see whether Miss Brooks had grown any. I was received as a personage of much importance among the colored people of the town, who were about the same kind that lived in M plus, not very progressive, excepting with their tongues when it came to curiosity and gossip. I arrived in the evening too late to call on Miss Brooks, and having become quite anxious to see her again, the night dragged slowly away, and I thought the conventional afternoon would never come again. Her father, who was an important figure among the colored people, was a mail carrier and brought the mail to the house that morning where I stopped. He looked me over searchingly. I tried to appear unaffected by his scrutinizing glances. By and by, two o'clock finally arrived, and with my sister, I went to make my first call in three years. I had grown quite tall and rugged, and I was anxious to see how she looked. We were received by her mother, who said, Jessie saw you coming, and will be out shortly. After a while she entered, and how she had changed. She too had grown much taller, and was a little stooped in the shoulders. She was neatly dressed, and wore her hair done up in a small knot, in keeping with the style of that time. She came straight to me, extended her hand, and seemed delighted to see me after the years of separation. After a while her mother and my sister accommodatingly found an excuse to go uptown, and a few minutes later, with her on the city besides me, I was telling of my big plans and the air castles I was building on the great plains of the West. Finally drawing her hand into mine and finding that she offered no resistance, I put my arm round her waist, drew her close, and I declared I loved her. Then I caught myself and dared not go farther with so serious a subject when I recalled the wild, rough, and lonely place out on the plains that I had selected as a home, and finally asked that we defer anything further until the claim on the little crow should develop into something more like an Illinois home. Oh, we won't know what will happen before that time. She spoke for the first time with a blush as I squeezed her hand. But nothing can happen, I defended, nonplussed. Can there? Well, no, she answered hesitatingly, leaning away. Then we will, won't we? I urged. Well, yes, she answered, looking down and appearing a trifle doubtful. I admired her the more. Love is something I long for more than anything else. But my ambition to overcome the vagaries of my race by accomplishing something worthy of note, hadn't given me much time to seek love. I went to my old occupation of the road for a while and spent most of the winter on a run to Florida, where the tipping was as good as it had been on the run from St. Louis to New York. However, a month before I quit, I was assigned a run to Boston. By this time I had seen nearly all important cities of the United States, and of them none interest me so much as Boston. Always what appeared odd to me, however, was the fact that the passenger yards were right at the door of the fashionable Back Bay District on Huntington Avenue, near the Hotel Nottingham, not three blocks from where the intersection of Huntington Avenue 
and Boylston Street form an acute angle in which stands the public library, and in the opposite angle stands Trinity Church, so thickly purpled with aristocracy and the memory big with the tradition of Philip Brooks, the last of that group of mighty American pulpit orators, of whom I had read so much. A little farther on stands the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The mornings I spent wandering around the city, visiting Faneuil Hall, the Old State House, Boston Commons, Bunker Hill, and a thousand other reminders of the early heroism, rugged courage, and far-seeing greatness of Boston's early citizens. Afternoons generally found me on Tremont, or Washington Street, attending a matinee or hearing music. There once I heard Caruso, Melba, and two or three other grand opera stars in the popular Rigoletto Quartet, and another time I witnessed Siberia and the gorgeous and blood-curdling reproduction of the Kishnev Massacre with two hundred people on the stage. On my last trip to Boston I saw Chauncey Olcott in Terence the Coachboy, a romance of old Ireland with a scene laid in Valley Bay which seemed to correspond to the Back Bay a few blocks away. Dear old Boston, when will I see you again, was my thought as the train pulled out through the most fashionable part of America, so stately and so grand. Even now I recall the last trip with a sigh. If the little crow with Orristown as its gateway was a land of hope through Massachusetts, Worcester, with the Polytechnic Institute arising in the background, Springfield and Smith School for Girls, Pittsfield, Rookfield, and on to Albany on the Hudson is a memory never to be forgotten, which evolved in my mind many long years afterward in my shack on the homestead. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Conquest This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lyndon Godsell. The Conquest by Oscar Mayhew. The Return, Ernest Nicholson. I left St. Louis about April 1st with about $3,000 in the bank and started again for Oristown, this time to stay. I had just paid Jesse a visit and I felt a little lonely. With the grim reality of the situation facing me, I now began to steel my nerves for a lot of new experience, which soon came thick and fast. Slater met the train at Oristown, and as soon as he spied me, he informed me that I was a lucky man, that a town had been started adjoining my land, and was being promoted by his brother and the sons of a former Iowa governor and gave every promise of making a good town. Also, if I cared to sell, he had a buyer who was willing to pay me a neat advance over what I had paid. However, I had no idea of parting with the land, but I was delighted over the news, and the next morning found me among Dad, Dupre's, through stagecoach passengers for Calliot the new town joining my homestead, via Hedrick and Kirk. As we passed through Hedrick, I noticed that several framed shacks had been put up and some better buildings were underway. The ground had been frozen for five months, so Sod House building had been temporarily abandoned. It was a long ride, but I was beside myself with enthusiasm. Callias finally loomed up, conspicuously perched on a hill, and could be seen long before the stage arrived, and was the scene of much activity. It had been reported that a colored man had a claim adjoining the town on the north, 
So when I stepped from the stage before the post office, the many knowing glances informed me that I was being looked for. A fellow who had a claim near, and who I met in Oristown, introduced me to the postmaster, whose name was Billinger, an individual with dry complexion and thin, light hair, then to the president of the town site company, second of three sons of the Iowa governor. My long experience with all classes of humanity had made me somewhat of a student of human nature, and I could see at a glance that here was a person of unusual aggressiveness and great capacity for doing things. As he looked at me, his eyes seemed to bore clear through, and as he asked a few questions, his searching look would make a person tell the truth whether he would or no. This was Ernest Nicholson, and in the following years he had much to do with the development of the Little Crow. End of chapter 9「but I tell you what I want to do, I replied firmly. I'm not here to sell. I'm here to make good or die trying. I'm here to grow up with this country and prosper with the growth, if possible. I have a little coin back in old chai. My money was still in the Chicago bank. And when these people begin to commute and want to sell, I'm ready to buy another place. I admired the fellow. He reminded me of the richest man in the world, in The Lion and the Mouse, Otis Skinner as Colonel Philippe Bredou, an officer on the staff of Napoleon's army in The Honour of the Family, and other characters in plays that I greatly admired, where great courage, strength of character, and firm decision were displayed. He seemed to have a commanding way that one found himself feeling honoured and willing to obey. But getting back to the homestead, I looked over my claim and found it just as I'd left it the fall before, excepting that a prairie fire during the winter had burned the grass. The next morning I returned to Oristown and announced my intentions of buying a team. The same day I drew a draft for $500 with which to start. Now, if there is anywhere an inexperienced man is sure to go wrong in starting up on a homestead, it is in buying horses. Most prospective homesteaders make the same mistake I did in buying horses, unless they are experienced. The inefficient man reasons thus, well, I will start off economically by buying a cheap team, and he usually gets what he thought he wanted, a cheap team. If I had gone into the country and bought a team of young mares for, say, $300, which would have been a very high price at that time, I would have them yet, and the increase would have kept me fairly well supplied with young horses, instead of scouting around town looking for something cheaper in the skate line as I did. I looked at so many teams around Oristown that all of them began to look alike. I am sure I must have looked at 500 different horses, more in an effort to appear as a conservative buyer than to buy the best team. Finally, I ran onto an Oklahoma grafter by the name of Noonmaker. He was a deceiving and unscrupulous rascal, but nevertheless possessed a pleasing personality which stood him in good in his schemes of deception and we became quite chummy. He professed to know all about horses. No doubt he did, but he didn't put his knowledge at my disposal in the way I thought he should, being a friend, as he claimed. 
He finally persuaded me to buy a team of big plugs, one of which was so awkward he looked as though he would fall down if he tried to trot. The other was a powerful four-year-old gelding that would have never been for sale around Oristown if it hadn't been that he had two feet badly wire-cut. One was so very large that it must have been quite burdensome for the horse to pick it up, swing it forward and put it down, as I look back and see him now in my mind. When I was paying the man for them, I wondered why Newmaker led him into the private office of the bank. But I was not left long in doubt. When I crossed the street, one of the men who had tried to sell me a team jumped me with, well, they got you, did they? His voice mingled with sarcasm and a sneer. Got who? I returned the question. Does a man have to knock you down to take a hint? He went on in a tone of disappointment and anger. Don't you know that man Noonmaker is the biggest grafter in Oristown? I would have sold you that team of mine for $25 less than I offered him if the gall darn grafter hadn't have come to mean, said, give me twenty-five dollars and I will see that the coon buys the team. I would have knocked him down with a club if I'd had one, the low-life bum. He finished with a snort and off he went. Stung by cracky was all I could say and feeling rather blue, I went to the barn where the team was stroked them and hoped for the best. I then brought lumber to build the small house and barn, an old wagon for the twenty dollars, one wheel of which the blacksmith had forgotten to grease, worked hard all day getting loaded, and wearied, sick and discouraged, I started at five o'clock p.m. to drive the thirty miles to Calias. When I was out two miles, the big old horse was wobbling along like a broken-legged cow, hobbling, stumbling, and making such a burdensome job of walking that I felt like doing something desperate. When I looked back, the wheel that had not been greased was smoking like a hot box on the 20th Century Limited. The sun was nearly down, and a cold east wind was whooping it up at about 60 miles an hour, chilling me to the marrow. The fact that I was a stranger in a strange land, inhibited wholly by people not my own race, did not tend to cheer my gloomy spirits. I decided it might be all right in July, but never in April. I pulled my wagon to the side of the road, got down and unhitched and jumped on the young horse, and such a commotion as he did make, I am quite sure he would have bucked me off, had it not for his big foot being so heavy. He couldn't raise it quick enough to leap. Evidently, he had never been ridden. When I got back to Oristown and put the team in the barn and warmed up, I resolved to do one thing and do it that night. I would sell the old horse, and I did for twenty-two fifty. I considered myself lucky, too. I had paid $190 for the team and harness the day before. I sat down and wrote Jessie a long letter telling her of my troubles and that I was awfully, awfully lonesome. There was only one other colored person in town, a barber, who was married to a white woman, and I didn't like him. The next day, I hired a horse, started early, and arrived at Callias in good time. At Hedrick I hired a sod mason, who was also a carpenter, at three dollars a day, and we soon put up a frame barn large enough for three horses, a sod house sixteen by fourteen, with a hip roof made of two by fours for rafters, and plain boards with tar paper, and sod with the grass turned downward, and laid side by side, the cracks being filled with sand. The house had two small windows and one door that was a little short on account of my getting tired carrying sod. I ordered the contractor to put the roof on as soon as I felt it was high enough 
to be comfortable inside. The fifth day I moved in. There was no floor, but the thick, short buffalo grass made a neat carpet. In one corner I put the bed, while in another I set the table. The one next to the door I placed the stove, a little two-hole burner gasoline, and in the other corner I made a bin for the horse's grain. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of the Conquest」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud Dealing and Mules It must have been about the 20th of April when I finished building. I started to batch and prepared to break out my claim. Having only one horse, it became necessary to buy another team. I decided to buy mules this time. I remembered that back on our farm in southern Illinois, mules were thought to be capable of doing more work than horses and eat less grain. So when some boys living west of me came one Sunday afternoon and said they could sell me a team of mules, I agreed to go and see them the next day. I thought I was getting wise. As proof of such wisdom... I determined to view the mules in a field. I followed them around the field a few times, and although they were not fine-looking, they seemed to work very well. Another great advantage was they were cheap, only $135 for the team and a 14-inch rod breaking plow. This looked to me like a bargain. I wrote him a check and took the mules home with me. Jack and Jenny were their names, and I hadn't owned Jack two days before I began to hate him. He was lazy, and when he went downhill, instead of holding his head up and stepping his front feet out, he would lower the bean and perform a sort of crow hop. It was too exasperating for words, and I used to strike him viciously for it, but that didn't seem to help matters any. I shall not soon forget my first effort to break prairie. There are different kinds of plows made for breaking the sod. Some kind that are good for one kind of soil cannot be used in another. In the gummy soils of the Dakotas, a long slant cut is the best. In fact, about the only kind that can be used successfully, while in the more sandy lands found in parts of Kansas and Nebraska, a kind is used which is called the square cut, the share being almost at right angles with the beam instead of slanting back from point to heel. Now in sandy soils this pulls much easier, for the grit scours off any roots, grass, or whatever else would hang over the share. To attempt to use this kind in wet, sticky land, such as was on my claim, would find the soil adhering to the plowshare, causing it to drag, gather roots and grass, until it is impossible to keep the plow in the ground. When it is dry, this kind of plow can be used with success in the gummy land, but it was not dry when I invaded my homestead soil with my big horse, Jack and Jenny, that first day of May, but very wet indeed. To make matters worse, Doc, the big horse, believed in speeding. Jenny was fair, but Jack, on the land side, was affected with hookworm hustle and believed in taking his time. I tried to help him along with a yell that grew louder as I hopped, skipped, and jumped across the prairie, and that plough began hitting and missing, mostly missing. It would gouge into the soil up to the beam, and the big horse would get down and make a mighty pull, while old Jack would swing back like a heavy end of a ball bat when the player draws to strike, and out would come the plough with a skip, 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 the big horse nearly trotting and dragging the two little mules, that looked like two goats beside an elephant. Well, I sat down and gave up to a fit of blues, for it looked bad, mighty bad for me. I had left St. Louis with two hundred dollars in cash, and had drawn a draft for five hundred dollars more on the Chicago bank, where my money was on deposit. And what did I have for it? One big horse, tall as a giraffe, two little mules, one of which was a torment to me, a sod house, an old wagon. As I faced the situation, there seemed nothing to do but to fight it out, and I turned wearily to another attempt, 
this time with more success. Before I had started breaking, I had invited criticism. Now I was getting it on all sides. I was the only colored homesteader on the reservation, and as an agriculturist it began to look mighty bad for the colored race on the little crow. Finally, with the assistance of dry weather, I got the plow so I could go two or three rods without stopping, throw it out of the ground, and clear the share of roots and grass. Sometimes I managed to go farther, but never over forty rods the entire summer. I took another course in horse trading or mule trading, which almost came to be my undoing. I determined to get rid of Jack. I decided that I would not be aggravated with his laziness and crow-hopping any longer than it took me to find a trade. So, on a Sunday, about two weeks after I bought the team, a horse trader pulled into Calais, drew his prairie schooner to a level spot, hobbled his horses, mostly old plugs of diverse descriptions, and made preparation to stay a while. He had only one animal, according to my horse sense, that was any good, and that was a mule that he kept blanketed. His camp was so situated that I could watch the mule from my east window, and the more I looked at the mule, the better he looked to me. It was Wednesday noon the following week, and old Jack had become almost unbearable. My continuing to watch a good mule do nothing, while I continued to fret my life away trying to be patient with a lazy brute, only added to my restlessness and eagerness to trade. At noon I entered the barn, and told old Jack I would get rid of him. I would swap him to that horse trader for his good mule as soon as I watered him. He was looking pretty thin, and I thought it would be to my advantage to fill him up. During the three days the trader camped near my house, he never approached me with an offer to sell or trade and it was with many misgivings that I called out in a loud, breezy voice and a David Harrow manner, "'Hello, Governor. How will you trade mules?' "'How'll I trade mules? Did you say how'll I trade mules? "'Huh? Do you suppose I want your old mule?' Drawing up one side of his face and twisting his big red nose until he resembled a German clown. "'Oh, my mule's fair,' I defended weakly. "'Nothing but an old dead mule,' he spit out, grabbing old Jack's tail and giving him a yank that all but pulled him over. "'Look at him, look at him,' he rattled away like an auctioneer. "'Go on, Mr. Collard Man, you can't work me that way.' He continued stepping around old Jack, making pretensions to hit him on the head. Jack may have been slow on the field, but he was swift in dodging, and he didn't look where he dodged either. I was standing at his side holding the reins when the fellow made one of his wild motions, and Jack nearly knocked my head off as he dodged. Nah, sir, if I considered a trade, that is, if I considered a trade at all, I would have to have a lot of boot, he said with an important air. How much? I asked nervously. Well, sir, he spoke with slow decision, I would have to have twenty-five dollars. What? I exclaimed, at which he seemed to weaken, but he didn't understand that my exclamation was of surprise that he only wanted twenty-five dollars when I had expected to give him seventy-five dollars. I grasped the situation, however, and, leaning forward, said, hardly above a whisper, my heart was so near my throat. I will give you twenty, as I pulled out my roll and held a twenty before his eyes, which he took as though afraid I would jerk it away, muttering something about it not being enough, and that he had ought to have had twenty-five. However, he got old Jack and the twenty, gathering his plugs and left town immediately. I felt rather proud of my new possession, but before I got through the field that afternoon, I became suspicious. Although I looked my new mule over and over, often during the afternoon while ploughing, I could find nothing wrong. Still, I had a chilly premonition, fostered no doubt by past experience, that something would show up soon, and in a few days it did show up. I learned afterward the trader had come thirty-five miles to trade me that mule. 
the mule I had traded was only lazy, while the one I had received in the trade was not only lazy, but ornery and full of tricks that she took a fiendish delight in exercising on me. One of her favorites was to watch me out of her left eye, shirking the while and crowding the furrow at the same time, which would pull the plough out of the ground. I tried to coax and cajole her into doing a decent mule's work, but it availed me nothing. I bore up under the aggravation with patience and fortitude, then determined to subdue the mule or become subdued myself. I would lunge forward with my whip, and away she would rush out from under it, brush the other horse and mule out of their places, and throw things into general confusion. Then, as soon as I was again straightened out, she would be back at her old tricks, and I'm almost positive that she used to wink at me impudently from her vantage point. Added to this, the colouring matter with which the trader doped her head faded, and she turned grey-headed in two weeks, leaving me with a mule of uncertain and doubtful age, instead of one of seven going on eight, as the trader represented her to be. I soon had the enviable reputation of being a horse trader. Whenever anybody with horses to trade came to town, they were advised to go over to the sod house north of town and see the colored man. He was fond of trading horses. Yes, he fairly doted on it. Nevertheless, with all my poor horse judgment, I continued to turn the sod over day after day, and completed ten or twelve acres each week. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The Conquest This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud The Homesteaders Of neighbors I had many. There was Miss Carter from Old Missouri, whose claim joined mine on the west, and another Missourian to the north of her, a loud-talking German north of him, and an English preacher to the east of the German. A traveling man's family lived north of me, and a big, fat, lazy barber who seemed to be taking the rest cure joined me on the east. His name was Starks, and he had drawn number 252. He had a nice level claim with only a few buffalo wallows to detract from its value, and he held the distinction of being the most uncompromisingly lazy man on the little crow. This, coupled with the unpardonable fault of complaining about everything, made him nigh unbearable, and he was known as the beefer. He came from a small town, usually the home of his ilk in Iowa, where he had a small shop and owned three and a half acres of garden and orchard ground on the outskirts of the town. He would take a fiendish delight in relating and re-relating how the folks in his house back in Iowa were having strawberries, new peas, green beans, spring onions, and enjoying all the fruits of a tropical climate, while he was holding down an infernal no-account claim on the little crow and eating out of a can. A merchant was holding down a claim south of him, and a banker lived south of the merchant. Thus it was a varied class of homesteaders around Callias and Megary, the first summer on the Little Crow. Only about one in every eight or ten was a farmer. They were of all vocations in life and all nationalities, excepting Negroes, and I controlled the colored vote. This was one place where being a colored man was an honorary distinction. I remember how I once requested the stage driver to bring me some meat from Megary, there being no meat shop in Callias, and it was to be left at the post office. Apparently I had failed to give the stage driver my name, for when I called for it, it was handed out to me, done up in a neat package, and addressed, Colored Man, Callias. My neighbors soon learned, however, that my given name was Oscar, but it was some time before they could all spell or pronounce the odd surname. During the month of June it rained twenty-three days, but I was so determined to break out one hundred and twenty acres that after a few days of the rainy weather I went out and worked in the rain. Starks used to go up to town about four o'clock for the mail, 
wearing a long yellow slicker, and when he saw me going around the half-mile lamp, he remarked to the bystanders, "'Just look at that fool nigger, a uh, working in the rain.' Being the first year of settlement in a new country, there naturally was no hay to buy, so the settlers turned their stock out to graze, and many valuable horses strayed away and were lost. When it rained so much and the weather turned so warm, the mosquitoes filled the air and covered the earth and attacked everything in their path. When I turned my horses out after the day's work was done, they soon found their way to town, where they stood in the shelter of some buildings and fought mosquitoes. Their favorite place for this pastime was the post office, where Billinger had a shed awning over the boardwalk, the framework consisting of two-by-fours joined together and nailed lightly to the building, and on top of this he had laid a few rough boards. Under this crude shelter the homesteaders found relief from the broiling afternoon sun, and swapped news concerning the latest offer for their claims. The mosquitoes did not bother so much in even so slight an enclosure as this, as every night Jenny Mule would walk on to the boardwalk, prick up her ears, and look in at the window. About this time the big horse would come along and begin to scratch his neck on one of the two-by-fours, and suddenly down would go Billinger's portable awning with a loud crash, which was augmented by Jenny Mule getting out from under the falling boards. As the sound echoed through the slumbering village, the big horse would rush away to the middle of the street with a prolonged snort and wonder what it was all about. This was the story Billinger told when I came around the next morning to drive them home from the storekeeper's oat bin where they had indulged in a midnight lunch. The performance was repeated nightly and got brother Billinger out of bed at all hours. He swore by all the gods of Buddha and the people of South Dakota that he would put the beasts up and charge me a dollar to get them. Early one morning I came over and found that Billinger had remained true to his oath, and the horse and mule were tied to a wagon belonging to the storekeeper. Nearby on a pile of rock sat Billinger, nodding away, sound asleep. I quietly untied the rope from the wagon and peaceably led them home. Then Billinger was in a rage. He had a small, screechy, tremulous voice, and it fairly sputtered as he tirated. "'If it don't beat all, I never saw the like. I was up all last night chasing those darned horses, caught them and tied them up, and along comes Deverall while I'm asleep and takes horses, rope, and all.' The crowd roared, and Billinger decided the joke was on him. "'Miss Carter, my neighbor on the west,' had her trouble, too. One day she came by, distressed and almost on the verge of tears, and burst out, Oh, 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 I hardly know what to do. I could never bear seeing anyone in such distress, and I became touched by her grief. Upon becoming more calm, she told me, The banker says that the man who is breaking prairie on my claim is ruining the ground. She was simply heartbroken about it, and off she went into another spasm of distress. I saw the fellow wasn't laying the sod over smoothly because he had a sixteen-inch plough, and had it set to cut only about eight inches, which caused the sod to push away and pile up on the edges, instead of turning and dropping into the furrow. I went with her and explained to the fellow where the fault lay. The next day he was doing a much better job. Those who have always lived in the older settled parts of the country sometimes have exaggerated ideas of life on the homestead, and the following incident offers a partial explanation. Maggory and Callias each had a newspaper, and when they weren't roasting each other and claiming their paper to be the only live and progressive organ in the country, they were building railroads or printing romantic tales about the brave homesteader girls. A little red-headed girl, nicknamed Jack, owned a claim near Callias. One day it was reported that she killed a rattlesnake in her house. The report of the great encounter reached Eastern dailies and was published as a Sunday feature story in one of the leading Omaha papers. It was accompanied by gorgeous pictures of the girl in a leather skirt, riding boots, and cowboy hat, entering a sod house 
and before her, coiled and poised to strike, lay a monster rattlesnake. Turning on her heel, and jerking the bridle from her horse's head, she made a terrific swing at Mr. Rattlesnake, and he, of course, met his Waterloo. This, so the story read, was the eightieth rattlesnake she had killed. She was described as Rattlesnake Jack, and thereafter went by that name. She was also credited with having spent the previous winter alone on her claim, and rather enjoyed the wintry nights and snow blockade. Now, as a matter of fact, she had spent most of the previous winter enjoying the comforts of a front room at the Hotel Callias, going to the claim occasionally, on nice days. She had no horse, and as to the eighty rattlesnakes, seventy-nine were myths, existing only in the mind of a prolific feature story writer for the Sunday edition of the Great Dailies. In fact, she had killed one small young rattler with a button. End of chapter 12chapter 13 of the conquest this is a liverbox recording all liverbox recordings are on the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit liverbox.org recording by larry johnson city tennessee the conquest by oscar michaud chapter 13 imaginations run amok I decided to utilize some of my spare time by doing a little freighting from Orristown to Gallius. Accordingly, one fair morning, I started for the former town. It began raining that evening, finally turning into a fine snow, and by morning a genuine South Dakota blizzard was raging. How the wind did screech across the prairie. I was driving the big horse and Jenny Mule to a wagon loaded with two tons of coal. They were not showed, and the hillsides had become slick and treacherous with ice. At the foot of every hill, Jenny Mule would lay her ears back, draw herself up like a toad when teased, and look up with a groan. While the big horse trotted on up the next slope, pulling her share of the load. When the wind finally went down, the mercury fell to twenty-five below zero, and my wrist, face, feet, and ears were frostbitten when I arrived at Callias. As is always the case during such severe weather, the hotel was filled, and laughing, storytelling, and good cheer prevailed. The Nicholson boys asked, how I made it, and I answered disgustingly that I have made it all right. If that Jenny Mule hadn't gotten faint-hearted, the remark was received as a good joke, and my suffering and annoyances of the trip slipped away into the past. That remark also had the further effect of giving Jenny Mule immortality. She became the topic of conversation, and just in hotel and post office lobbies, and even to this day the story of the faint-hearted mule often affords splendid entertainment at festive boards and banquet halls of the Little Crow, when told by a Nicholson. While working in the rain, the perspiration and the rainwater had caused my body to become so badly galled that I found considerable difficulty in getting around. To add to this discomfort, Jenny Mule was affected with a touch of moderism at times, especially while engaging in eating grain. One night, when I had wandered thoughtlessly into the barn, she gave me such a wallop on the right shin as to impair that member until I could hardly walk without something to hold to, as it had taken a fourteen hundred mile walk to follow the plow and break in a one hundred and twenty acres. I was about all in physically when it was done. As a means of recuperation, 
I took a trip to Chicago. While there, the call of the road affected me. I got reinstated in a couple of months to the coast, four months of free life on the plains. However, had changed me. After one trip, I came in and found a letter from Jesse saying she was sick, and although she never said, come and see me, I took it as an excuse and quit that peeing company for good, and here it passes out of the story, went down state to Emboro and spent the happiest week of my life. After I had returned to Dakota, however, I contracted an imagination that worked me into the state of jealousy. Concerning an individual who made his home in Emboro, and with whom I suspicioned the object of my heart to be unduly friendly, I say this is what I suspicioned. There was no particular proof, and I have been inclined to think in after years that it was more a case of over-energetic imagination run amuck. I contended, in my mind, and in my letters to her as well, that I should not have thought anything of it. If the man in the case had a little more promising future, but since his proficiency only earned him the munificent sum of three dollars per week, I continued to fret and fume until I at last resolved to suspend all communication with her. Now what I should have done when I reached that stage of imaginary insanity was to have sent Miss Rooks a ticket, some money, and she would have come to Dakota and married me, and together we would have lived happily ever after. As I see it now, I was affected with an idealism. Of course, I was not aware of it at the time. No young soul is. Until they have learned by bitter experience the folly that they should not do thus and so. And of course, there is the old excuse of good intentions. Somewhere I read that the road to not St. Peter is paved with good intentions. The result of my prolific imagination was that I carried out my resolutions, quit writing, and emotionally lived rather unhappily thereafter for some time at least. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Conquest This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter 14. The Surveyors. The entire Little Crow Reservation consisted of about two million acres of land, four-fifths of which was unopened and lay west of Megory County. Of the two million acres, perhaps one million five hundred thousand, ranged from fair to the richest of loam soil, underlaid with clay. The climatic condition is such that all kinds of crops grown in the central west can be grown here. Two hundred miles north, corn will not mature. Two hundred miles south, spring wheat is not grown. Two hundred west, the altitude is too high to ensure sufficient rainfall to produce a crop. But the reservation lands are in such a position that winter wheat, spring wheat, oats, rye, corn, flax, and barley do well. Ever since the drought of 94, all crops had thrived. 
the rainfall being abundant and continuing so during the first year of settlement. Orristown and other towns on the route of the railroad had waited twenty years for the extension, and now the citizens of Orristown estimated it would be at least ten years before it extended its line through the reservation, while the settlers, to the number of some eight thousand, hoped they would get the road in five years. However, no sleep was lost in anticipation. The nearest the reservation came to getting a railroad that summer was by the way of a newspaper in Magori, whose editor spent most of his time building roads into Magori from the north, south, and the east. In reality, the CNRW was the only road likely to run the reservation, and all the towns depended on its extension to overcome the long, burdensome freighting with teams. With all the country's local advantages, its geographical location was such as to exclude roads from all directions except the one taken by the CNRW. To the south lay nine million acres of worthless sand hills, through which it would require an enormous sum of money to build a road. Even then there would be miles of track which would practically pay no interest on the investment. At that time there was no railroad extending the full length of the state from east to west, most lines stopping at or near the Missouri River. Since then, two or three lines have been built into the western part of the state, but they experienced much difficulty in crossing the river, owing to the soft bottom which in many places would not support a modern steel bridge. For from one to two months in the spring, floating ice gives a great deal of trouble and wreaks disaster to the pontoon. A bird's-eye view of the little crow show it to look something like a bottle, the neck being the Missouri River, with the CNRW tracks creeping along its west bank. This is the only feasible route to the reservation, and the directors of this road were fully aware of their advantageous position. The freight rates from Omaha to Orristown a distance of 250 miles, being as high as from Omaha to Chicago, a distance of 500 miles. But getting back to the settlers around and in the little towns on the Little Crow, the first thing to be considered in the extension was that the route it took would naturally determine the future of the towns. Hedrick, Kirk, and Megory were government town sites, strung in a northwesterly direction across the country, ranging from eight to fifteen miles apart, the last being about five miles and a half east of the west line of the county. Now the county on the west was expected to be thrown open to settlement soon, would likely be opened under the lottery system, as was Megory County. After matters had settled, this began to be discussed, particularly by the citizens of Megory, five and one-half miles from the Tip County line. This placed Megory in the same position to handle the crowds coming into the next county, as Orristown had for Megory County, excepting Megory would have an advantage, for Tip County was twice as large as Megory. When this was all considered, the people of Megory began to boost the town on the prospects of a future boom. The only uncertain feature of the matter then to be considered was which way the road would extend. That was where the rub came in. Which way would the road go? This became a source of continual worry and speculation on the part of the towns, and the men who felt inclined to put money into the towns in the way of larger, better and more commodious buildings. But when they were encouraged to do so, there was always the bogey if. If the railroad should miss us, well, the man owning the big buildings was stung, that was all, while the man with the shack could load it on two or four wagons and with a few good horses land his building in the town the railroad struck or started. 
This was, and is yet, one of the big reasons shacks are so numerous in a town in a new country, which expects a road but knows not which way it will come. And the officials of the CNRW were no different from the directors of any other road. They were mum as dummies. They wouldn't tell whether the road would ever extend or not. The Orristown citizens claimed it was at one time in the same uncertainty as the towns to the west, and for some fifteen or twenty years it had waited for the road. With the road stopping at Orristown, they argued, it would be fully ten years before it left, and during this time it could be seen, Orristown would grow into an important prairie city, as it should. Everything must be hauled into Orristown as well as out, so it can be seen that Orristown would naturally boom. While nothing had been raised to the west to ship out as yet, still there was a growing population on the reservation, and thousands of carloads of freight and express were being hauled into and from Orristown monthly for the settlers on the reservation which filled the town with railroad men and freighters. Crops had been good, and everything was going along smoothly for the citizens and property owners of Orristown. Not a cloud on her sky of prosperity, and as the trite saying goes, everything was lovely and the goose hung high during the first year of settlement on the Little Crow. And now, lest we forget, Callus. Callis was located one and one-half miles east and three miles south of Megory, and five miles straight west of Kirk. If the CNRW extending its line west should strike all the government town sites, as was claimed by people in these towns who knew nothing about it and Callis, it would have run from Kirk to Megory in a very unusual direction. Indeed, it would have been following the section lines, and it is common knowledge, even to the most ignorant, that railroads do not follow section lines unless the section lines are directly in its path. If the railroad struck Kirk and Megory, it was a cinch it would miss Callis. If it struck Callis, perched on the banks of the Monka Creek, the route the Nicholsons, as promoters of the town, claimed it would take, the road would miss all the towns but Callis. This would have meant glory and a fortune for the promoters and lot holders of the town. It would also have meant that my farm, or at least part of it, would in time be sold for town lots. After I got so badly overreached in dealing with horses, for a time the opinion was general that the solitary negro from the plush cushions of a pea would soon see that growing up with a new country was not to his liking, and would be glad to sell at any old figure and beat it back to more ease and comfort. This is largely the opinion of most of the white people regarding the negro, and they are not entirely wrong in their opinion. I was quite well aware that such an opinion existed, but contrary to expectations, I rather appreciated it. When I broke out 120 acres with such an outfit as I had, as against many other real farmers who had not broken over 40 acres, with good horses and their knowledge of breaking prairie acquired in states they had come from, I began to be regarded in a different light. At first I was regarded as an object of curiosity, which changed to appreciation, and later admiration. I was not called a free-go-easy coon, but a genuine booster for Callis and the Little Crow. I never spent a lonesome day after that. The Nicholson brothers, however, gave the settlers no rest, and created another sensation of railroad building by their new contention that the railroad would not be extended from Orristown, but that it would be built from a place on the Monka Bottom two stations below Orristown, where the track climbed a 4% grade to Fairview, then on to Orristown. They offered as proof of their contention that the CNRW maintained considerable yardage there, 
and it does yet. Why it did, people did not know, and this kept everybody guessing. Some claimed it would go up the Monca Valley, as Nicholson claimed. This much can be said in favor of the Nicholsons. They were good boosters, or big liars, as their rivals called them, and if one listened long and diligently enough, they would have him imagine he could hear the exhaust of a big locomotive coming up the Monca Valley. While the people in the government town sites persisted loudly that the CNRW had contracted with the government before the towns were located to strike these three towns, and that the government had helped to locate them, that furthermore the railroad would never have left the Monca Valley, which had followed for some twenty miles after leaving the banks of the Missouri, all of which sounded reasonable enough, but the government and the railroad had entered into no agreement whatever, and the people in the government towns knew it and were uneasy. I had been on my claim just about a year, when one day Rattlesnake Jack's father came from his home on the Jim River and sold me her homestead for $3,000. My dreams were at last realized, and I had become the owner of 320 acres of land. But my money was now gone when I paid the $1,500 down on the Rattlesnake Jack place giving her back a mortgage for the remaining 1500 at 7% interest. And it was a good thing I did, too. I bought the place early in April, and in June the Interior Department rejected the proof she had offered the November before on account of lack of sufficient residence and cultivation. The proof had been accepted by the local land office, and a final receipt for the remaining installments of the purchase price, amounting to $480, was issued. A final receipt is considered to be equivalent to a patent or deed. But when Rattlesnake Jack's proof of residence got to the general land office in Washington in quest of a patent, the commissioner looked it over figured up the time she actually put in on the place, and rejected the proof, with the statement that it only showed about six months' actual residence. At that time, eight months' residence was required, with six months within which to establish residence, but no proof could be accepted until after the claimant had shown eight months' actual and continuous residence. From the time the settlers began to commute or prove up on the Little Crow, all proofs which did not show fully eight months' residence were rejected. This was done mostly by the register and receiver of the local land office, and many were sent back on their claims to stay longer. Many proofs were also taken by local U.S. commissioners, county judges, and clerks of courts, but these officers rarely rejected them, for by so doing they also rejected a $4.25 fee. About one-third of the persons who offered proof at that time had them turned down at the local land office. This gave the local commissioners, county judges, and clerks of courts a chance to collect twice for the same work. It may be interesting to know that a greater percentage of proofs rejected were those offered by women. This was perhaps not due to the fact that the ladies did not stay on their claims so much as it was conscientiousness. They could not make a forcible showing by saying they had been there every night, like the men would claim, but would say instead that they had stayed all night with Miss So-and-so this time, and with another that time, and by including a few weeks' visit at home or somewhere else, they would bungle their proofs, so they were compelled to try again. A short time after this, and evidently because so many proofs had been sent back, the Interior Department made it compulsory for the claimant to put in 14 months' actual residence on the claim before he could offer proof. With 14 months, they were sure to stay a full eight months at least. This system has been very successful. 
When Rattlesnake Jack was ordered back, after selling me the place, she wanted me to sign a quit-claim deed to her and accept notes for the money I had paid, which might have been satisfactory had it not been that she thought I had stopped to look back and failed to see the rush of progress the little crow was making that the long-anticipated news had been spread and was now raging like a veritable prairie fire and stirred the people of the little crow as much as an active stock market stirs the bulls on the stock exchange the report spread and stirred the everyday routine of the settlers and the finality of humdrum and inactivity was abrupt it came one day in early april the rain had kept the farmers from the fields a week it had been raining for nearly a month and we only got a clear day once in a while this day it was sloppy without and many farmers were in from the country we were all listening to a funny story ernest nicholson was telling and good fellows were listening attentively dr salter a physician had just been laid on a couch in the back room of the saloon, soused to the gills, when in the door John M. Keeley, a sort of near-to-well popular drummer, whose proof had been rejected some time before, and who had come back to stay a while longer, stumbled into the door of the local groggery. He was greeted with sallies and calls of welcome, and like many of the others, he was feeling good. He sort of leaned over and hiccuping during the intervals started, I've, the words were spoken chokingly, got news for you. He had by now got inside and was hanging and swinging at the same time to the bar. Then before finishing what he started, called Tom to the bartender, give me a whiskey before I... And here he leaned over and sang the words, Tell the boys the news. For the love of Jesus Keel, exclaimed the crowd in chorus, Tell us what you know. He drained the glass at a gulp and finally spit it out. The surveyors are in Orristown. End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of The Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter 15. Which town will the RR strike? the drummer's information soon received corroboration from other sources and although it seemed almost unbelievable it was discussed incessantly and excitement ran high these pioneers who had braved the hardships of homestead life had felt that without the railroad they were indeed cut off from civilization to them the advent of the surveyors in Orristown could mean only one thing, that their dreams of enjoying the many advantages of the railroad train would soon materialize. They fell to enumerating these advantages, the mail daily, instead of only once or twice a week, the ease with which they could make necessary trips to the neighboring towns, and most of all, the increase in the value of the land with this last subject they became so wrought up with excitement and anxiety as to the truth of the report that they could stay away from the scene of action no longer accordingly buggies and vehicles of all descriptions began coming into orristown from all directions i hitched doc and my new horse bolivar for which I had paid one hundred and forty dollars, to an old ramshackle buggy I had bought for ten dollars and joined the procession. Three miles west of Orristown, we came upon a crowd of circus day proportion, and in the midst were the surveyors. 
In their lead rode the chief engineer, a slender, wiry man with a black mustache and piercing eyes that seemed to observe every feature of surrounding prairie. Behind came a wagon loaded with stakes, accompanied by several men, the leader of whom was setting these stakes according to the signal of the engineer from behind the transit. Others on either side were also driving stakes. They were not only running a straight survey, but were cross-sectioning as they went. Even though the presence of these surveyors was now an established fact, these were days of grave uncertainties as to just what route the road would take. The suspense was almost equal to that of the criminal as he awaits the verdict of the jury. The valleys and divides lay in such a manner that it was possible the survey would extend along the Monca, thus passing through Callis. On the other hand, it was probable that it would continue to the northwest through Kirk and Megory, thus missing Callis altogether. When the surveyors reached a point five miles west of Hedrick, they swerved to the northwest and advanced directly toward Kirk. This looked bad for Callis. When Ernest Nicholson had learned that the surveyors were in Oristown, he had left immediately for parts unknown and had not returned. He was, in reality, the founder of Callis, and many of the inhabitants looked to him as their leader and depended upon him for advice. Although he had many enemies who heaped abuse and epithets upon him, calling him a liar, braggart, and windjammer when boasting of their own independence and self-respect, now that a calamity was about to befall them and their fond hopes for this priceless mistress of prairie were about to be wrecked upon the shoals of an imaginary railroad survey, they turned toward him for comfort as moths turn to a flame. It was earnest here and earnest there. As the inevitable progress of the surveyors proceeded in a direct line for Hedrick, Kirk, and Megory, the consternation of the Callisites became more intense as time went on, and the anxiety for Ernest to return almost resolved itself into mutiny. It became so significant that at one time it appeared that if Ernest had only appeared, the railroad company would have voluntarily run its survey directly to Callis in order to avoid the humiliation of Ernest's seizing them by the nape of the neck and marching them, survey, cars and all, right into the little hamlet. Now, there was one thing everybody seemed to forget or to overlook, but which occurred to me at the time and caused me to become skeptical as to the possibilities of the road striking Callis, and that was, if the railroad was to be built up in the Monco Valley, then why had the surveyors come to Oristown, and why had they not gotten off at Anona, the last station in the Monca Valley, where the tracks climbed the grade to Fairview? Many of the Megory and Kirk boosters had taken advantage of Ernest's absence, and through enthusiasm attending the advent of the railroad survey, persuaded several of Callis's businessmen to go into fusion in their respective towns. The remaining handful consoled each other by prophecies of what Ernest would do when he returned and plied each other for expressions of theories and ways and means of injecting enthusiasm into the local situation. Thousands of theories were given expression, consideration, and rejection, and the old one that all railroads follow valleys and streams was finally adhered to. I was singled out to give corroborative proof of this last by reason of my railroad experience. I was suddenly seized with a short memory, much to my embarrassment, as I felt all eyes turned upon me. However, the crowd were looking for encouragement and spoke up in chorus, Don't the railroads always follow valleys? It suddenly occurred to me 
that with all the thousands of miles of travel to my credit and the many different states I had traveled through, with all their rough and smooth territory, I had not observed whether the tracks followed the valleys or otherwise. However, I intimated that I thought they did. Of course they do, my remark was answered in chorus. Since then, I have noticed that a railway does invariably follow a valley, if it is a large one, and small rivers make excellent routes, but never crooked little streams like the Monca. When it comes to such creeks, and there is a tableland above, as soon as the road can get out, it usually stays out. This was the situation of the C and R.W., it came some twenty-five or thirty miles up the Monca from where it empties into the Missouri. There are fourteen bridges across and that many miles, which were, and still are, always going out during high water. It came this route because there was no other way to come, but when it got to Anona, as has been said, it climbed a four percent grade to get out, and it stayed out. End of chapter 15「of the Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter 16. Megory's Day. The first day of May was a local holiday in Megory, held in honor of the first anniversary of the day when all settlers had to be on their claims, and it was raining. During the first years on the Little Crow, we were deluged with rainfall, but this day the inclement weather was disregarded, it was Settler's Day, and everybody for miles around had journeyed thither to celebrate. Not only Settler's Day, but also the advent of the railroad. Only the day before, the surveyors had pitched their tents on the outskirts of the town, and on this day they could be seen calmly sighting their way across the south side of the embryo city. Megory was the scene of a continuous round of revelry. Five saloons were crowded to overflowing, and a score of bartenders served thousands of thirsty throats, while on the side opposite from the bar and in the rear gambling was in full blast. Professionals, tin horns, and pikers, in their shirt sleeves worked away feverishly drawing in and paying money to the crowd that surged around the roulette the chuck luck and the faro bank it seemed as though everybody drank and gambled this is megory's day they called between drinks and it would echo with have another watch megory grow Written in big letters and hung all along the streets were huge signs which read Megory, the gateway to a million acres of the richest land in the world. Megory, the future metropolis of the Little Crow. Watch her grow, watch her grow. The boardwalk four feet wide could not hold the crowd. It was a day of frenzied celebration a day when no one dared mention nicholson's name unless they wanted to hear them called liars windjammers and all a bluff ernest was still in the east and no one seemed to know where he was or what he was doing the surveyors had passed through megory and extended the survey to the county line five miles west of the town the right-of-way man was following and had just arrived from hedrick and kirk where he had made the same offer he was now making megory if he said addressing the town dads and he seemed to want it clearly understood the c and r w builds to megory we want you to buy the right-of-way three miles east and four miles west of the town 
Then Governor Ruhlbach, known as the squatter governor, acting as spokesman for the citizens, arose from his seat on the rude platform, and before accepting the proposition, needless to say it was accepted, called on different individuals for short talks. Among others, he called on Ernest Nicholson. But Frank, the junior member of the firm, arose and answered that Ernest was away engaged in purchasing the C&RW Railroad and that he, answering for Ernest, had nothing to say. A hush fell on the crowd, but Governor Rulbach, who possessed a well-defined sense of humor, responded with a joke, saying, Mr. Nicholson's being away purchasing the C&RW Railroad reminds me of the Irishman who played poker all night, and the next morning, yawning and stretching himself, said, I lost $900 last night, and seven and one-half of it was cash. The backbone of the town was beginning to weaken, while there were many who continued to insist that there was hope. Others contracted rheumatism from vigils at the surveyor's camp in vain hope of gaining some information as to the proposed direction of the right-of-way. The purchasing of the right-of-way and the unloading of carload after carload of contracting material at Oristown did little to encourage the belief that there was a ghost of a show for Callis. In a few days, corral tents were decorating the right-of-way at intervals of two miles, all the way from Oristown to Megory. In the early morning, as the sound of distant thunder could be heard, the dull thud of clods and dirt dropping into the wagon from the elevator of the excavator. Also the familiar jup and the thud of the Skinner's lines as they struck the mules in Callis one and one-half miles away. A very much discouraged and weary crowd met Ernest when he returned. But even in defeat, this young man's personality was pleasing. He was frank in telling the people that he had done all that he could. He had gone to Omaha, where his father-in-law joined him, thence to Des Moines, where his father maintained his office as president of an insurance company that made loans on Little Crow land. Together with two capitalists, friends of his father, they had gone into Chicago and held a conference with Marvin Hewitt, president of the CNRW, who had showed them the blueprints and, as he put it, any reasonable man could see it would be utterly impossible to strike Callis in the route they desired to go. The railroad wanted to strike the government town sites, but the president told them that if at any time he could do them a favor to call on him— and he would gladly do so. In a few days, a man named John Nodgen came to Callis. Towns which had failed to get a road looked upon him in the way a sick man would an undertaker. He was a red-haired Irishman with teeth wide apart and wildish blue eyes, who had the reputation of moving more towns than any other one man. He brought horses and wagons, blocks and tackle, and massive steel trucks. He swore like a stranded sailor and declared they would hold up any two buildings in Callis. The saloon was the first building deserted. The stock had not been removed when the house movers arrived, and in some way they got the door open and helped themselves to the booze, and when full enough to be good and noisy, began jacking up the building that had been the pride of the hopeful Callisites. In a few weeks, a large part of what had been Callis was in Megory, and a small part in Kirk. It had stopped raining for a while, and several large buildings were still on the move to Megory when the rain set in again. This was the latter part of July, and how it did rain, every day and night. One store building 100 feet long had been cut in two so as to facilitate moving, and the rains caught it halfway on the road to Megory. 
After many days of sticking and floundering around in the mud, at a cost of over $1,400 for the moving alone, not counting the goods spoiled, it arrived at its new home. The building in the beginning had cost only $2,300, out of which 30 cents per hundred had been paid for local freighting for Morristown. The merchant paid $1,000 for his lot in Megory and received $10 for the one he left in Callis. This was the reason why Rattlesnake Jack's father and I could not get together when he came out and showed me Rattlesnake Jack's papers. It was bad, and I readily agreed with him. I also agreed to sign a quitclaim deed, thereby clearing the place so she could complete her proof. Everything went along all right until it came to signing up. Then I suggested that as I had broken 80 acres of prairie, the railroad was in course of construction and land had materially increased in valuation, having sold as high as $5,000 a quarter section, I should have a guarantee that he would sell the place back to me when the matter had been cleared up. I will see that you get the place back, he pretended to reassure me, when she proves up again. Then we will draw up an agreement to that effect and make it $1,000 over what I paid, I suggested. I will do nothing of the kind, he roared, brandishing his arms as though he wanted to fight. And if you will not sign a quit claim without such an agreement, I will have Jack blow the whole thing. That is what I will do, do you hear? He fairly yelled leaning forward and pointing his finger at me in a threatening manner. Then we will call it off for today, I replied with decision, and we did. I confess, however, I was rather frightened. In the beginning, I had not worried, as he held a first mortgage of $1,500. I had felt safe and thought that they had to make good to me in order to protect their own interests. But now, as I thought the matter over, it began to look different. If he should have her relinquish, then where would I be? And the $1,500 I had paid them. I was very much disturbed, and called on Ernest Nicholson, and informed him how the matter stood. He listened carefully, and when I was through, he said, They gave you a warranty deed, did they not? Yes. I replied, it is over at the Bank of Callis. Then let it stay there. Tell him, or the old man rather, to have the girl complete sufficient residence, then secure you for all the place's worth at the time, then, and not before, sign a quick claim. And if they want to sell you the place, well and good. If not, you will have enough to buy another. And I followed his advice. It was fourteen months, however, before the Scotch-Irish blood in him would submit to it. But there was nothing he could do, for the girl had given me a deed to something she did not have title to herself, and had accepted $1,500 in cash from me in return. As the matter stood, I was an innocent party. About this time, I became imbued with a feeling that I would like most awfully well to have a little helpmate to love and cheer me. How often I longed for company to break the awful and monotonous lonesomeness that occasionally enveloped me. At that time, as now, I thought a darling little colored girl to share all my trouble and grief would be interesting indeed. Often my thoughts had reverted to the little town in Illinois, and I had pictured Jesse caring for the little sod house and cheering me when I came from the fields. For a time, such blissful thoughts sufficed the longing in my heart, but were soon banished when I recalled her seeming preference for the three-dollar-a-week menial. Another attack of the blues would follow, and my daydreams became as mist before the sun. About this time I began what developed into a flirtatious correspondence with a St. Louis octoroon. She was a trained nurse, 
very attractive, and wrote such charming and interesting letters that for a time they afforded me quite as much entertainment, perhaps more, than actual company would have done. In fact, I became so enamored with her that I nearly lost my emotional mind and almost succumbed to her encouragement toward a marriage proposal. The death of three of my best horses that fall diverted my interest. She ceased the apostolary courtship, and I continued to batch. Doc, my big horse, got stuck in the creek and was drowned. The loss of Doc was hardest for me to bear, for he was a young horse, full of life, and I had grown fond of him. Jenny Mule would stand for hours every night and whinny for him. In November, Bolivar, his mate, the horse I had paid $140 for not nine months before, got into the wheat, became foundered, and died. While freighting from Orristown in December, one of a team of dapple greys fell and killed himself. So in three months, I lost three horses that had cost over $400, and the last had not even been paid for. I had only three left, the other dapple gray, Jenny Mule, and old Greyhead, the relic of my horse trading days. I had put in a large crop of wheat the spring before, and had threshed only a small part of it before the cold winter set in and the snow made it quite impossible to complete threshing before spring. That was one of the cold winters which usually follow a wet summer, and I nearly froze in my little old soddy before the warm spring days set in. Sod houses are warm as long as the mice, rats, and gophers do not bore them full of holes but as they had made a good job tunneling mine, I was left to welcome the breezy atmosphere, and I did not think the charming nurse would be very happy in such a mess nohow. The thought that I was not mean enough to ask her to marry me and bring her into it was consoling indeed. Since I shall have much to relate, farther along concerning the curious and many-sided relations that existed between Callus, Magori, and other contending and jealous communities, let me drop this and return to the removal of Callus to Magori. The Nicholson brothers had already installed an office in the successful town and offered to move their interests to that place and combine with Magori in making the town a metropolis. But the town dads, feeling they were entirely responsible for the road striking the town with the flush of victory and the sensation of empire builders, disdained the offer. In this, Magori had made the most stupid mistake of her life, and which later became almost monumental in its proportions. It will be seen how, in the flush of apparent victory, she lost her head, and looked back to stare and reflect at the retreating and temporary triumph of her youth. And in that instant, the banner of victory was snatched from her fingers by those who offered to make her apparent victory real, and who ran swiftly, skillfully, and successfully to a new and impregnable retreat of their own. The Magori town dads were fairly bursting with rustic pride, and were being wined and dined like kings by the citizens of the town who had contributed the wherewith to pay for the seven miles of right-of-way. Besides, the dads were puffed young roosters just beginning to crow and were boastful as well. So Nicholson Brothers got the hoarse laugh, which implied that Magori did not need them. We have made Magori and now watch her grow— Ha, 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 watch her grow, came the cry, when the report spread that the town dads had turned Nicholson's offer down. Magori was the big I am of the little crow. Then Ernest went away on another long trip. It was cold weather, with the ground frozen when he returned. End 
of chapter 16. Chapter 17 of The Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter 17. Ernest Nicholson's Return. The Building West of Town. What's it all about? The big hotel from Callis had not long since been unloaded and decorated a corner lot in Magori. All that remained in Callis were the buildings belonging to Nicholson Brothers, consisting of an old two-story frame hotel, a two-story bank, the saloon, drugstore, their own office, and a few smaller ones. It was a hard life, for the Callisites and the Magoriites were not inclined to soften it. On the other hand, she was growing like a mushroom. Everything tended to make it the prairie metropolis. Land was booming and buyers were plentiful. Capital was also finding its way to the town, and nothing to disturb the visible prosperity. But a shrewd person, at that very time, had control of machinery that would cause a radical change in this community, and in a very short time, too. This man was Ernest Nicholson, and referring to his return, I was at the depot in Orristown the day he arrived. There he boarded an auto and went west to Magori. On his arrival there, he ordered John Nodgin to proceed to Callis, load the bank building, get all the horses obtainable, and proceed at once to haul the building to, no, not to Magori. This is what the Magoriites thought when, with 76 head of horses hitched to it, they saw the bank of Callis coming to Magori. But when it got to within half a mile of the south side, swerved off to the west. About six that evening, when the sun went down, the bank of Callis was sitting on the side of a hill that sloped to the north, near the end of the survey. Now what did it mean? That was the question that everybody began asking everybody else. What was up? Why was Ernest Nicholson moving the bank of Callis five miles west of Magori and setting it down on or near the end of the survey? There were so many questions being asked, with no one to answer, that it amused me. Then someone suggested that it might be the same old game, and here would come a pause, then the question, what old game? Why, another callous? Some bait to make money. Then, oh, I see, said the wise town dads, just a hoax. That answered the question, just a snare to catch the unwary. Tell them that the railroad would build to the Tip County line. Sell them some lots, for that is what the bluff meant. Get their good money, and then, oh, ha, ha, ha. It was too funny when one saw the joke, and Magoriites continued to laugh. Had not Nicholson Brothers said a whole lot about getting the railroad? and that it was sure coming up the monka. It had come, had it not? Ha, ha, ha. Ho, ho, ho. Just another Nicholson stall. Ha, ha, ha. And Nicholson's got the laugh again. The railroad is in Magori, and here it will stop for ten years. One hundred thousand people will come to Magori to register for Tip County lands and watch Magori grow was all that could be heard. Ernest would come to Magori, have a pleasant chat, treat the boys, tell a funny story, and be off. Nobody was mean enough or bold enough to tell him to his face any of the things they told to his back. Ernest was never known to say anything about it, his scheme simply kept John Nogden moving buildings. He wrote checks in payment that the bank of Callis cashed, 
for it was open for business the next day after it had been moved out on the prairie five miles west of Magori. The court record showed six quarter sections of land west of town had recently been transferred. The name of the receiver was unknown to anyone in Magori, but such prices, 40 to $50 per acre. The people who had sold brought the money to the Magori banks and deposited it. All they seemed to know was that someone drove up to their house and asked if they wanted to sell. Some did not, while others said they were only five miles from Magori, and if they sold, they would have to have a big price, because Magori was the town of the Little Crow, and the gateway to acres of the finest land in the world, to be open soon. What is your price, he would ask, and whether it was forty, forty-five, or fifty per acre, he bought it. This must have gone on for sixty days, with everybody wondering what it was all about, until it got on the nerves of the Magoriites, and even the town dads began to get a little fearful. When Ernest was approached, he would wink wisely, hand out a cigar, or buy a drink, but he never made anybody the wiser. A lady came out from Des Moines, bought a lot, and let a contract for a hotel building, 24 by 140, and work was begun on it immediately. This was getting ahead of Magori, where a hotel had just been completed, 25 by 100 feet, said by the Magoriites to be the best west of a town of 6,000 population, 150 miles down the road. Whenever anything like a real building goes up in a little town on the prairie with their collection of shacks, it is always called the best building between there and somewhere else. I shall not soon forget the anxiety with which the people watched the building which continued to go up west of Magori, and still no one there seemed willing to admit that Nicholson brothers were live but spent their argument in trying to convince someone that they were only windjammers and manipulators of knavish plots to amesh the credulous. What actually happened was this, and Ernest told me about it afterwards in about the following words. Well, Oscar, after McGorry turned our offer down, I knew there were just two things to do, and that was to either make good or leave the country. Magori is full of a lot of fellows that have never known anything but Kia Paha County, and when the road missed Callis and struck Magori, they took the credit for displaying a superior knowledge. I knew we were going to be the laughing stock of the reservation, and since I did not intend to leave the country, I got to thinking. The more I pondered the matter, the more determined I became that something had to be done, and I finally made up my mind to do it. Ernest Nicholson was not the kind of a man to make idle declarations. I went down to Omaha and saw some business friends of mine and suggested to them just what I intended to do, thence to Des Moines and got father, and again we went into Chicago and secured an appointment with Hewitt, who listened attentively to all that we had to say, and the import of this was that Magori, being over five miles east of the Tip County line, it was difficult to drive range cattle that distance through a settled country. They are so unused to anything that resembles civilization that ranchers hate to drive even five miles through a settled country, besides the annoyance it would habitually cause contrary farmers when it comes to accommodating the ranchers. Now that is not all. With sixty-six feet open between the wire fences, the range cattle at any time are liable to start a stampede, go right through, and a lot of damage follows. I showed him that most of the cattlemen were still driving their stock north and shipping over the C.P. and St. L. 
Now, knowing that the directors had ordered the extension of the line to get the cattle business, Hewitt looked serious, finally arose from his chair, and went over to a map that entirely covered the side of the wall and showed all the lines of the CNRW. He meditated a few minutes and then turned around and said, Go back and buy the land that has been described. It all seemed simple enough when it was done. By the time that the extension had been completed to Megory, the building that had been moved west of town had company in the way of many new ones, and by this time comprised quite a burg, and claimed the name of New Callis. The new was to distinguish between its old site and its present one. After Megory turned them down, Ernest had made a declaration or defiance that he would build a town on the Little Crow and its name would be Callus. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of the Conquest This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter 18. Comes Stanley, the Chief Engineer. McGorry was still on the boom, not quite as much as the summer before, but more than it was some time later, for as yet New Callus was still regarded as a joke, until one day Stanley, the same wiry-looking individual with the black mustache and the piercing eyes, got off the stage at Megory and began to do the same work he had started west of Oristown the year before. Oh, it was a shame to thus wreck the selfish dreams of these Megoryites upon the rocks of their own short-sightedness stanley was followed a few days later by a great contractor who had been to megory the summer before and who had become popular around town and was known to be a good spender they had bidden him good-bye along in december and although nothing was said about it the truth was megory did not wish to see any more railroad contractors for a while not for five or ten years anyway it is a peculiar thing that when a railroad stops at some little western burg that it is always going to stay ten or twenty years this has always been the case before according to the towns at the end of the line and at this time megory was of the same opinion as regarded the extension to new callus so oristown had been in regard to the extension to megory but Trellway built the road to New Callis, and built it the quickest I ever saw a road built. The first train came to Megory on a Sunday in June, schedules always commence on Sunday, and September found the same train in Callis, the new having been dropped. Megoryites admitted very grudgingly, a short time before, that the train would go on to Callis but would return to Megory to stay overnight, where it left at six o'clock the following morning. Now, at Megory, the road had a Y that ran onto a pasture on a two years lease, while at Callis Coal Chutes, a Y, a turning table, a roundhouse, and a large freight depot were erected. And then began one of the most bitter fights between towns that I ever saw or even read about. Five miles apart, with Callus perched on another hill, and like the old site, could be seen for miles around. Now the terminus, it loomed conspicuously. It was a foregone conclusion that when the reservation to the west opened, Callus was in the right position to handle the crowds that came to the territory to the west instead of Megory. Megory contended, however, that Callus, located on such a hill, could never hope for an abundance of good water and therefore could not compete with Megory, 
with her natural advantages, such as an abundance of good soft water, which was obtainable anywhere in town. There are certain things concrete in the future growth of a prairie town. The first is, has it a railroad? The next is, is the agricultural territory sufficient to support a good live town, a fair-sized town, and either one of the Dakotas has from 1,000 to 3,000 inhabitants? And last, are the businessmen of the town modern, progressive, and up-to-date? In this respect, Callis had the advantage over Megory, as will be seen later. Megory became my post office address after Callis had moved to its new location, and about that time the first rural mail route was established on the reservation. Megory boasted of this. The other things it boasted of was its great farming territory. For miles in every direction, tributary to the town, the land was ideal for farming purposes and at the beginning of the bitter rivalry between the two towns, Megory had the big end of the farm trade. They could see nothing else but Megory, which helped the town's business considerably. End of chapter 18「of the Conquest – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter 19. In the Valley of the Kiapaha. The Rivals. The Vigilance. Nothing is more essential to the upbuilding of the small western town than a good agricultural territory, and this was where Callis found its first handicap. When it had moved to its new location, scores of investors had flocked to the town, paying the highest prices that had ever been paid for lots in a new country town of its kind in the central west. Twenty-five miles south of the two towns, where a sand stream known as the Kiapaha wends its way, is a fertile valley. It had been settled thirty years before by eastern people, who hauled their hogs and drove their cattle and sheep fifty miles in a southerly direction to a railroad. Although the valley could not be surpassed in the production of corn, wheat, oats, and alfalfa, the highlands on either side are great mountains of sand, which produce nothing but a long reddish grass that stock will not eat after it reaches maturity, and which stands in bunches with the sand blown from around its roots to such an extent that riding or driving over it is very difficult. These hills rise to heights until they resemble the Sierras, and near the top, on the northwest slope of each, are cave-like holes where the strong winds have blown a squeegee. The wagon road to the railway on the south was sandy and made traveling over it slow and hazardous by the many pits and dunes. Therefore, it is to be seen, when the CNRW pushed its line through Megory County, everything that had been going to the road on the south began immediately to come to the road on the north where good hard roads made the traveling much easier, and furthermore, it was only half the distance. Kiapaha County was about as lonely a place as I had ever seen. After the sun went down, the coyotes from the adjacent sand hills, in a series of mournful howls, filled the air with a noise which echoed and re-echoed throughout the valley, like the music of so many faraway steam calliopes, and filled me with a cold, creepy feeling. 
For thirty years these people had heard no other sound save the same monotonous howls and saw only each other. The men went to Omaha occasionally with cattle, but the women and children knew little else but Kiapaha County. During a trip into this valley, the first winter I spent on the homestead in quest of seed wheat, I met and talked with families who had children, in some instances twenty years of age, who had never seen a colored man. Sometimes the little tads would run from me, screaming as though they had met a lion or some other wild beast of the forest. At one place where I stopped overnight, a little girl, about nine years of age, looked at me with so much curiosity that I became amused, finally coaxing her onto my knee. She continued to look hard at me, then meekly reached up and touched my chin, looked into my eyes, and said, Why don't you wash your face? When supper was ready, went to the sink and washed my face and hands. She watched me closely in the meanwhile, and when I was through, appeared to be vexed and with an expression as if to say, he has cleaned it thoroughly, but it is dirty still. About twenty years previous to this time, or about ten years after settlement in this valley, the pioneers were continually robbed of much of their young stock. Thieving outlaws kept up a continuous raid on the young cattle and colts, driving them onto the reservation where they disappeared. This continued for years, and it was said many of the county officials encouraged it, in a way, by delaying a trial, and inasmuch as the law and its procedure was very inadequate, on account of the county's remote location, the criminals were rarely punished. After submitting to such until all reasonable patience had been exhausted, the settlers formed a vigilant committee and meted out punishment to the evil doers who had become overbold and were well known. After hanging a few, as well as whipping many, the vigilanters ridded the county of rustlers and lived in peace thereafter. At the time the railroad was built to Megory, there was little activity other than the common routine attending their existence. But with Megory twenty-five miles to the north, and many of her former active and prosperous citizens living there, and while boardwalks and shack buildings still represented the main street, Megory was considered by the people of the valley very much of a city and a great place to pay a visit. Many had never seen or ridden on a railroad train, so Megory sounded in Kiapaha County as Chicago does to the downstate people of Illinois. The people of Kiapaha County had grown prosperous, however, and the stock shipments comprised many trainloads during an active market. Practically all this was coming to Megory when Callis began to loom prominent as a model little city. I could see two distinct classes, or personages, in the leaders of the two towns. Beginning with Ernest Nicholson, the head of the firm of Nicholson Brothers and called by Megoryites Chief, High Mogul, The Big It, and I Am, in absolute control of callous affairs, and the former Kiapaha County sand rats, as they are sometimes called, running Megory. The two contesting parties presented a contrast which interested me. The Nicholson brothers were all college-bred boys, with a higher conception of things in general, were modern, free, and up-to-date. While Megory's leaders were as modern as could be expected, but were simply outclassed in the style and perfection that the callous bunch presented. Besides, the merchants and businessmen, 
in the stockyards west of Megory, as Callis was cartooned by a Megory editor, were much of the same ilk. And referring to the cartoon, it pictured the editor of the Callis News as a braying jackass in a stock pen, which brought a great laugh from Megoryites, but who got it back, however, the next week by being pictured as a stagnant pond with two Megory editors as a couple of big bullfrogs. This had the effect of causing the town to begin grading the streets, putting in cement walks and gutters, for Megory had located in the beginning in an extremely bad place. The town was located in a low place, full of alkali spots, buffalo wallows underlaid with hard pan, which caused the surface to hold water to such an extent that when rain continued to fall any length of time, the cellars and streets stood in water. But Megory had the start with the largest and best territory, which had by this time been developed into improved farms. The real farmer was fast replacing the homesteader, it had the biggest and best banks. Regardless of all the efficiency of callous, it appeared weak in its banking. Now a farmer could go to Nicholson Brothers and get the largest farm loan because the boy's father was president of an insurance company that made the loan. But the banks there were short in the supply of time loans on stock security but Callis's greatest disadvantage was that directly west in Tip County, the Indians had taken their allotments within seven or eight miles of the town, and there was hardly a quarter section to be homesteaded. Now there was no doubt but that in the course of time the Indian allotments would be bought. Whenever the government felt disposed to grant the Indian a patent, which under the laws is not supposed to be issued until the expiration of 25 years. People, however, would probably lease the land, break it up, and farm it. But that would not occur until some future date, and Callis needed it at the present time. A western town, in most instances, gets its boom in the beginning, for later a dry rot seems an inevitable condition and is likely to overtake it after the first excitement wears away. Resurrection is rare. These were the conditions that faced the town on the Little Crow at the beginning of the third year of settlement. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of the Conquest. This is a Leverbox recording. All Leverbox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit leverbox.org. Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. The Outlaws' Last Stand. After the vigilantes had frightened the outlaws into abandoning their operations in the valley, the thieves sculled across the reservation to a strip of country some twenty-five miles northeast of where McGregor now stands. Here on the east the murky waters of the Missouri seek their level. To the north the White River runs like a cow path through the foothills, twisting and turning into innumerable bends. With its lime-like waters lapping the sides, bringing tons of shale from the gorgeous dark banks into its current, while on the south runs the whetstone, enclosed by many rough, ragged brown hills. To the west are the breaks of Landing Creek. In an angle between these creeks and rivers lies a perfect tableland known as Uli Flats, which is the most perfectly laying land and has the richest soil of any spot on the Little Crow. It took its name from the famous outlaw and squaw man by the name of Jack Uly. With him, the thieves from Kayapua Valley found cooperation, 
and together they had a few years previously operated as the most notorious band of cattle rustlers the state had known. For a hundred miles in every direction, this band plundered, stole, and ran the cattle and horses into the flats, where they were protected by the breaks of the creeks and rivers referred to. Mixed with half, quarter, eighth, and sixteenth breeds, they knew every nook and crook of the country. These operations had lasted until the year of the Little Crow opening, and it was there that Jack Uly made his last stand. Although the valley could not be surpassed in the production of grain and alfalfa, the highlands on either side were great mountains of sand. He had for many years defied the laws of the country and state, and had built a magnificent residence near a spring that pours its sparkling waters into a small lake, where now stands a sanitarium. Uli had been chief overseer, dictator, and arbitrator of the combined forces of Little Crow and Kayapua County outlaws and mixed bloods. The end came when, on a bright day in June, a posse led by the United States Marshal sneaked across the whetstone and secreted themselves in a cache between Yuli's corral and the house. Yuli was seen to enter the corral and having laid a trap. A part of the men came in from another direction and made it as if it was an advance when Yuli made a run for his house, which took him alongside the men hidden. Before he could change his course, he was halted and asked to surrender. He answered by dropping to the opposite side of the house and began firing. In the skirmish that followed, the horse was shot and fell on Yuli, but in the shots exchanged, two of the posse and Yuli were killed. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of the Conquest This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli The Conquest by Oscar Michaud Chapter Twenty One The Boom this valuable tract of land, comprising about 50,000 acres, had been entered after the opening by settlers and lay about as near to Kirk as it did to Megory. Hence its trade was sought by both towns, but with Kirk getting the larger part until Megory established a mill which paid two cents more for wheat and the farmers took advantage by hauling most of their produce to the former town. This included another strip of rich territory to the north of Megory and west of Landing Creek, where the soil is a rich gumbo, and the township thickly settled, so it is readily seen that Megory was advantageously situated to draw from all directions." This soon brought such a volume of business into the town as to make the most fastidious envy it, and the Megoryites were well aware of their enviable position. The town continued to grow in a sound, substantial way. Nicholson Brothers began leading booster trade excursions to the north, south, and east, with Ernest at the head in a big packard making clever speeches, and inviting all the farmers to come to Callis, where a meal at the best hotel was given free. A good, live, and effective commercial club was organized, which guaranteed to pay all a hog, cow, or calf would bring on the Omaha market, minus the freight and expenses. Ernest would explain with deep sincerity, which impressed the farmers of the valley, as well as the settlers on the Little Crow, that Callis wanted a share of their business, and was willing to sacrifice profit for two years in order to have the farmers come to the town and get acquainted, to see what the merchants, bankers, and real estate dealers had to offer. 
In making this offer, the people of Callis had the advantage over Megory, and that it derived profits from other sources, chiefly from great numbers of transients who were beginning to fill the hotels, restaurants, saloons, and boarding houses of the town. Being the end of the road and the place where practically every settler coming to Tip County must stay at least one night, it stood to reason they could make such an inducement and stick to it. However, this was countered immediately by Megoryites, who promptly organized a commercial club and began the same kind of bid for trade. Thus the small ranchmen of the valley found themselves an object of much importance and began to awaken a little. Now the land of the reservation had taken on a boom such as had never been realized or dreamed of. Land in the states of Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, and Nebraska had doubled in valuation in the previous ten years and was still on the increase in value. Crops had been good and money was plentiful. With a number of years of unbroken prosperity, the farmers had paid off mortgages and had a good surplus in the bank. Their sons and daughters were looking for newer fields. Retired farmers with their land to rent now, instead of the customary one-third delivered, demanded and received from two-fifths to one-half, or cash, from three to five and six dollars per acre. And with the prices in these states ranging from ninety to one hundred and fifty dollars per acre, which meant from fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars to buy a quarter section, which the renters felt was too high to ever be paid for by farming it. Therefore, western lands held an attraction, where with a few thousand dollars, some stock, and machinery, a man could establish a good home. As this land in southern South Dakota is in the Corn Belt, the erstwhile investor and home-seeker found a haven. There is always more or less gossip as regards insufficient moisture in a new country. The only thing to kill this bogey is to have plenty of rain, and plenty of rain had fallen on the little crow, too much at times. Large crops of everything had been harvested, but if the first three years had been wet, this fourth was one of almost continual rainfall. In the eastern states, the corn crop had been badly drowned out on the lowlands, and rust had cut the yield of small grain considerably, while on the rolling land of the little crow, the season was just right, and everything grew so rank, thick, and green that it gave the country, a raw prairie until less than four years before, the appearance of an old settled country. It looked good to the buyers, and they bought. Farms were sold as soon as they were listed. The price at the beginning of the year had been from 25 to $40 per acre, some places more. But after the first six months of the year, it began to climb to 45 and then to $50 per acre. Those who owned Little Crow Farms became objects of much importance. If they desired to sell, they had only to let it be known, and a buyer was soon on hand. The atmosphere seemed charged with drunken enthusiasm. Everybody had it. There was nothing to fear. Little Crow land was the best property to be had, better, they would declare, than government bonds, for its value was increasing in leaps and bounds. Choice farms close to town— if bought at fifty dollars per acre, could be sold at a good profit in a short time. This was done, and good old eastern capital continued to be paid for the land. The spirit of unrest that seemed to pervade the atmosphere of the community was not altogether the desire to have and to hold, but more to buy and to sell. Homesteads were sold in Megory County, and the proceeds were immediately reinvested in tip, 
where considerable dead Indian land could be purchased at half the price. At about that time, the auto fever began to infect the restless and over-prosperous settlers and businessmen alike. That was the day of the many two-cylinder cars. They made a dreadful noise, but they moved and moved faster than horses. They sailed over the country, the exhaust of the engine making a cracking noise. The motion, added to the speed, seemed to thrill and enthuse the investor until he bought whether he cared to or not. In previous years, when capital was not so plentiful, and when land was much cheaper and slower to sell, the agent drove the buyer over the land from corner to corner, crosswise and angling, and the buyer would get out here and there, and with a spade dig into the ground, and be convinced as to the quality of the soil. He then pondered the matter over for days, weeks, and sometimes months. Then maybe he would go back and bring the woman. The land dealers seriously object to buyers bringing the woman along, especially if the farm he has to sell has any serious drawbacks, such, for instance, as a lack of water. There were numerous farms on the highlands of the Little Crow where water could not be found, but they were invariably perfect in every other respect. The perfection in the laying of the land and quality of the soil was severely offset by the inability to get water while on the rougher and less desirable farms water can be easily obtained in the draws and the hills but the highlands were the more attractive and were sold at higher prices and much quicker regardless of the obvious defects now if the woman was brought to look it over, one of the first inquiries she made would be, now is there plenty of water? Furthermore, she was liable to steal a march on the dealer by having her husband hire a livery team, and with the eastern farmer and his wife drive out to the place and look the farm over without the agent to steer them clear of the bad places. They not only looked it over, but made inquiries of the neighbors as to its merits. Now country people have the unpardonable habit of gossip, and have complicated many deals of the real estate men by this weakness, even caused many to fall through, until the land sharks are usually careful to prevent a buyer from having a conversation with sigh. In my case, however, this was quite different. I was known as a booster, and since my land was located between the Monca and Magori, this was considered the cream of the county as to location, soil, and other advantages. Instead of being nervous over meeting me, the dealers would drive into the yard or into the fields and, as I like to talk, introduce the prospective buyers to me, and we would engage in a long conversation at times. I might add that exaggerated tales were current, which related how I had run as P.N. Porter, saved my money, come to the Little Crow, bought a half section, and was getting rich. The most of the buyers from Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, and Nebraska were unused to seeing colored farmers and my presence all alone on the former reserve added to their interest. In my favor was the fact that my service in the employ of the P.N. Company had taken me through nearly every county in the central states, and therefore, always given to observation, I could talk with them concerning the counties they had come from. Land prices continued to soar. Higher and higher they went, and to boost them still higher, as well as to substantiate the values, the bogey concerning insufficient moisture was drowned in the excessive rainfall. From April until August it poured, and the effect on the growing crops in the east 
became greater still in the way of drowned-out cornfields and overrank stems of small grain that grew to abnormal heights and with the least winds lodged and then fell to the ground. The crops on the reservation could not have been better, and prices were high. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of The Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter 22. The President's Proclamation. Coincident with the expectation came the President's proclamation throwing 4,000 claims in Tip County open to settlement under the lottery system at $6 per acre. Among the towns designated in the proclamation where the people could make application for a claim, Megory and Callis were nearest to the land. These were the places where the largest crowds were expected. Therefore, the citizens of these two vigorous municipalities began extensive preparations to entertain the crowds. Megory, being more on the country order, made more homelike preparations. Among the many conveniences prepared were a ladies' restroom and information bureau, which were located in a large barn previously used for storing hay. Callis, under the criticism that as soon as the road extended farther west it would be as dead as Oristown, now all but forgotten, prepared to get theirs while the crowds were in town, and they did, but that's ahead of the story. The time for the opening approached people seemingly from every part of the universe and from every vocation in life drifted into towns. Among these were included the investors, who stated that in the event of a failure to draw, they would buy deeded land. Next in order were the gamblers, from the tin horn and piker class to the fat professionals. Although every precaution was taken to keep out the characters of the city's underworld, who had characterized former openings, both towns were fully represented with a large share of pickpockets, conmen, lewd women, and their consorts. The many vacant lots on Main Street of both the towns were decorated with the typical scene at land openings. There were little tents with notaries assisted by many beautiful girls to prepare your application. There were many hotels with three and four beds to a room, as well as rooms to let over all the places of business containing two stories or more. There were tents with five hundred cots, and, lest we forget, there were the numerous drinking fountains, with bars the length of the building, behind which were scores of bartenders to serve the how dry I am on one side. On the other, in tents, back rooms and overhead could be heard the brrrr of the little ivory marble as it spun a circuit over the roulette wheel and the luck cages where the idle sports turned them over for their own amusement, to pass away the time. The Pharaoh Bank and numerous wheels of fortune also had a place. From the rear came the strains of ragtime music. These were some of the many attractions that met the trains carrying the first arrivals on the night of October 5th. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of The Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter 23. Where the Negro Fails. Long before I came west and during the years I had spent on the homestead, my closest companion was the magazines. From the time Thomas W. Lawson's frenzied finance had run as a serial article in a leading periodical, to Ida M. Tarbell's The History of the Standard Oil Company, I fairly devoured special articles on the subjects of timely interest. I enjoyed reading anything that would give me a more complete knowledge of what made up this great country in which we live, and which all Americans are given to boasting of as the greatest country in the world. And this brings to my mind certain conditions which exist concerning the ten odd millions of the black race in America and more this in itself had a tendency to open wider the gap between a certain class of the race and myself there are two very distinct types or classes among the american negroes i am inclined to feel that this is more prominent than most people are aware i have met and known those who are quick to think practical conservative as well as progressive, while there are those who are narrow in their sympathies and short-sighted in their views. Now, as a matter of argument, my experience has taught me there are more of this class than most colored people have any idea. The worst feature of this situation, however, is that a large number of the latter class have commingled with the former in such a way as to easily assume all the worthy proportions. They are a sort of dog in the manger, and are not in accord with any principle that is practical and essential to the elimination of friction and strife between the races. Among the many faults of this class is that they do not realize what it takes to succeed, nor do they care, but spend their efforts loudly claiming credit for the success of those who are honest in their convictions and try to prove themselves indispensable citizens. Nothing is more obvious and proves this more conclusively than to take notice, as I have, of their own selection of reading matter. Now, for instance, a few years ago, a series of articles under the title of Following the Color Line appeared in a certain periodical, the work of a very well-known writer whose specialty is writing on social conditions, strikes, etc. In justice to all concerned, the writer described the conditions which his articles covered, just as he found them, and in this, in my opinion, he differed largely from many of the southern authors whose articles are still inclined to treat the Ethiopians as a whole as the old time-worn aunt and uncle. Not intending to digress, I want to put down here that Negroes as a whole are changing to some extent, the same as the whites, and no liberty-loving colored man appreciates being regarded as aunt or uncle, even though some of these people were as honorable as could be. This is a modern age. Now, getting back to the discussion that I seem to have for the moment forgotten, and as regards the article, while worthy in every respect, it was no different in its way from any number of other articles published at that time, as well as now, that deal on great and complex questions of the day. Yet this article caused thousands of colored people who never before bought a magazine or book to subscribe for that magazine. It was later published in book form and is conspicuous in the libraries of many thousands of colored families. 
What I have intended to put down in this lengthy discourse regarding my race is, if they see or hear of an article concerning the race, they will buy that magazine to read the article spoken of and nothing more. Since living in the state, as a recreation, I was in the habit of taking trips to Chicago once or twice a year, and as might be expected, I would talk of South Dakota. In the course of a conversation, I have related a story of someone's success there and would be listened to with unusual attention. As I had found in them many who were poor listeners, at these times when I found myself the object of so much undivided attention, I would warm up to the subject until it had evolved into a sort of lecture and remarks of my you don't say so, and just think of it, would interrupt me. And a colored man. No, I would correct the least bit hesitant, a white man. Then, just like the sun disappearing behind a cloud, all interest would vanish. Furthermore, I have on occasions of this kind had attention of a few minutes before turned to remarks of criticism for taking up the time relating the success of a white man. The idea is prevalent among this class that all white people should be rich, and regardless of how ideal the success has been, I learn that no white person could be accepted as an example for this class to follow. By reading nothing but discussions concerning the race, by all but refusing to accept the success of the white race as an example and by welcoming any racial disturbance as a conclusion that the entire white race is bent in one great effort to hold him, the Negro, down, he cannot very well feel the thrill of modern progress and is ignorant as to public opinion. Therefore, he is unable to cope with the trend of conditions and has become so condensed in the idea that he has no opportunity that he is disinteresting to the public. One of the greatest tasks of my life has been to convince a certain class of my racial acquaintances that a colored man can be anything. Now, on the entire Little Crow Reservation, less than 800 miles from Chicago, I was the only colored man engaged in agriculture, and moreover, from Megory to Omaha, a distance of 300 miles. There was only one other Negro family engaged in the same industry. Having lived in the cities, I therefore was not a greenhorn, as some of them would try to have me feel when they referred to their clubs and social affairs. Among the many facts that confronted me as I meditated the situation, one dated back to the time I had run on the road. The trains I ran on carried thousands monthly into the interior of the Northwest. Among these were a great number of emigrants fresh from the old countries, but there was seldom a colored person among them, and those few that I had seen, with few exceptions, went on through to the Pacific Coast cities and engaged in the same occupation they had followed in the East. During these trips, I learned the greatest of all the failings were not only among the ignorant class, but among the educated as well. Although more agreeable to talk to, they lacked that great and mighty principle which characterizes Americans, called the initiative. Colored people are possible in every way that is akin to becoming good citizens, which has been thoroughly proven and is an existing fact. Yet they seem to lack the guts to get into the Northwest and do things, in seven or eight of the great agricultural states, there were not enough colored farmers to fill a township of 36 sections. Another predominating inconsistency is that there is that love of luxury. They want streetcars, cement walks, 
and electric lights to greet them when they arrive. I will remember it was something near two years before I saw a colored man on the reservation until the road had been extended. They had never come west of Orristown, but as the time for the opening arrived, the kitchens and hotel dining rooms of Magory and Callis were filled with waiters and cooks. During the preparation for the opening, the commercial club of Magory had lengthy circulars printed with photographs of the surrounding country, farms, homes, and the like to accompany. These circulars described briefly the progress the country had made in the four years it had been opened to settlement, and the opportunities waiting. By giving the name and address, the club would send these to any address or person with the statement, by the request of whoever gave the name. I gave the name of not less than one hundred persons, and sent them personally to many as well. I wrote articles and sent them to different newspapers, edited by colored people, in the East and other places. I was successful in getting one colored person to come and register, my oldest brother. End of chapter 23「Chapter Twenty Four of the Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Conquest by Oscar Meshaw. Chapter Twenty Four. And the crowds did come. The Prairie Fire. The registration opened at twelve o'clock Monday morning. Seven trains during the night before had brought something like 7,000 people. Of this number, about 2,000 got off at Megary, and the remainder went on through to Callias. The big opening was on, and the bid for patronage made the relations between the towns more bitter than ever. After the first few days, however, the crowds, with the exception of a few hundred, daily went on through to Callias and did not heed the catcalls and uncomplimentary remarks from the railway platform at Megary. Among these remarks flung at the crowded trains were, go on to Callias and buy a drink of water. Go on to Callias and pay a dime for the water to wash your face. Water was one of Callias's scarcities, as will be seen later. However, this failed to detract the crowd. The C&RW put on 15 regular trains daily and the little single track, unballasted and squirmy, was very unsafe to ride over, and the crowded trains had to run very slowly on this account. Because of the fact that it was difficult to find adequate side-tracking, it took two full days to make the trip from Omaha to Callias in return. All the day and night the toot-toot of the locomotives could be heard, and the sounds seemed to make the country seem very old indeed. Megary's brass band, organized for the purpose, undaunted, continued to play frantically at the depot to try to induce the crowded trains to unload a greater share, but to no avail, although the cars were stuffed like sandwiches. Those times in Callias were long to be remembered. As the trains disgorged the thousands daily, it seemed impossible that the little city could care for such crowds. The sidewalks were crowded from morn till night. The registration booths and the saloons never closed, and more automobiles than I had ever seen in a country town up to that time roared, and with their clattering noise took the people hurriedly across the reservation to the west. Along toward the close of the opening, a prairie fire, driven by a strong west wind, raced across Tip County in a straight line for Callias although fire guards sixty feet wide had been burned along the west side of the town it soon became apparent that the fire would leap them and enter the town unless some unusual effort on the part of the citizens was made to stop it it was late in the afternoon and as seems always the case a fire will cause the wind to rise and it rose until the blaze shut out the western horizon it seemed the entire world to the west was a fire 
ten thousand people lost in sightseeing gambling and revelry all of a sudden became aware of the approaching danger and began a rush for safety to the north south and east of the town the lands were under cultivation therefore a safe place from the fire that now threatened the town all business was suspended registration ceased and the huge cans containing more than one hundred thousand applications for lands were loaded on drays and taken into the country and deposited in the center of a large ploughed field for safety the gamblers put their gains into sacks and joined the surging masses and with grips got from the numerous check rooms all the people fled like stampeding cattle to a position to the north of town which was protected by a cornfield on the west ernest nicholson leading the businessmen and property owners bravely fought the oncoming disaster the chemical engine and water hose were rushed forward but were as pins under the drivers of a locomotive the water from the hose ran weakly for a few minutes and then with a blowing as of an empty faucet petered out from lack of water the strong wind blew the chemical into the air and it proved as useless the fire entered the city one house a magnificent residence was soon enveloped in flames which spread to another and still to another the thousands of people huddled on a bare spot but safe watched the miniature city of one year and the gateway to the homesteads of the next county disappear in flames megariites seeing the danger threatened her hated rival five miles away called for volunteers who readily responded and formed bucket brigades loaded barrels into wagons filled them with water and burned the roads in the hurry-up call to the apparently doomed city i could see the fire from where i was harvesting flax ten miles away in the cloud of smoke with the little city lying silent before it reminded me of a picture of pompeii before vesuvius it looked as if callius was lost then like a miracle the wind quieted down changed and in less than twenty minutes was blowing a gale from the east starting the fire back over the ground over which it had burned there it sputtered flickered and with a few sparks went out just as l a bell pulled onto the scene with lathered and bloody-eyed mules drawing a tank of megary water and was told by the nicholson brothers who were said to resemble mississippi steamboat roustabouts on a hot day that callias didn't need their water following the day of the high wind which brought the prairie fire that so badly frightened the people of the town the change of the wind to the east brought rain and about two hundred automobiles that had been carrying people over tip county into the town i remember the crowds but have no idea now how many people there were but that it looked more like the crowds on broadway or state street on a busy day than main street in a burg of the prairie this was the afternoon of the drawing and a woman drew number one while here and there in the crowd that filled the street before the registration exclamations of surprise and delight went up from different fortunates hearing their names called drawing a lucky number i felt rather bewildered by so much excitement and metropolitanism where hardly two years before i had hauled one of the first loads of lumber on the ground to start the town i could not help but feel that the world moved swiftly and that i was living not in a wilderness as stated in some of the letters i had received from colored friends in reply to my letters that informed them of the opening but in the midst of advancement and action when the drawing was over and the crowds had gone it was found that the greatest crowds had registered not at callias but at a town just south in nebraska which received forty five thousand while callias came second with forty three thousand and megary only received seven thousand something like one hundred fifteen thousand in all having applied the hotels in callias had charged one dollar the person and some of the large ones had made small fortunes while the saloons were said to have averaged over one thousand dollars a day after the opening land sold like hot hamburger sandwiches had a few weeks before end of chapter twenty four
Chapter 25 of The Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Blanchard. The Conquest by Oscar Majot. Chapter 25. The Scotch Girl. It had been just four years since I bought the relinquishment and seven since leaving southern Illinois. I had been very successful in farming, although I had made some very poor deals in the beginning, and when my crops were sold that season I found that I had made $3,500. Furthermore, I had in the beginning sought to secure the best land in the best location and had succeeded. I had put 280 acres under cultivation, with eight head of horses, I had done a little better in my later horse deals, and had machinery, seed, and feed sufficient to farm it. My efforts in the seven years had resulted in the ownership of land and stock to the value of $20,000, and was only $2,000 in debt, and still under 25 years of age. During the years I had spent on the Little Crow, I had kept batch, all the while, until that summer. A Scotch family had moved from Indiana that spring, consisting of the father, a widower, two sons, and two daughters. One of the boys worked for me, and as it was much handier, I boarded with them. The older of the two girls was a beautiful blonde maiden of twenty summers, who attended to the household duties, and considering the small opportunities she had to secure an education, was an unusually intelligent girl. She had composed some verses and songs, but not knowing where to send them, had never submitted them to a publisher. I secured the name of a company that accepted some of her writings and paid her fifty dollars for them. She was so anxious to improve her mind that I took an interest in her, and I received much literature in the way of newspapers and magazines, and read lots of copyright books. I gave them to her. She seemed delighted and appreciated the gifts. Before long, however, without any intention of being other than kind, I found myself being drawn to her in a way that threatened to become serious. While custom frowned on even the discussion of the amalgamation of races, it is only human to be kind, and it was only my intention to encourage the desire to improve, which I could see in her, but I found myself on the verge of falling in love with her. To make matters more awkward, that love was being returned by the object of my kindness. She, however, like myself, had no thought of being other than kind and grateful. It placed me as well as her in an awkward position, for before we realised it, we had learned to understand each other to such an extent that it became visible in every look and action. It reached a stage of embarrassment one day when we were reading a volume of Shakespeare. She was sitting at the table and I was standing over her. The volume was Othello. And when we came to the climax where Othello had murdered his wife, driven to it by the evil machinations of Iago, as if by instinct, she looked up and caught my eyes, and when I came to myself I had kissed her twice on the lips she held up. After that, being near her caused me to feel awkwardly uncomfortable. We could not even look into each other's eyes without showing the feeling that existed in the heart. Now during the time I had lived among the white people, I had kept my place as regards custom, and had been treated with every courtesy and respect, had been referred to in the local papers in the most complimentary terms, and was regarded as one of the Little Crow's best citizens. But when the reality of the situation dawned upon me, I became in a way frightened, for I did not by any means want to fall in love with a white girl. I had always disapproved of intermarriage, considering it as being above all things the very thing that a coloured man could not even think of, that we would become desperately in love, however, seemed inevitable. Lived a man. The history of an American Negro shows who had been the foremost member of his race. He had acquitted himself of many honourable deeds for more than a score of years in the interests of his race. He had filled a federal office, but at the zenith of his career had brought disappointment to his race and criticism from the white people who had honoured him by marrying a white woman, a stenographer in his office. They were no doubt in love with each other, which in all likelihood 
overcame the fear of social ostracism they must have known would follow the marriage. I speak of love and presume that she loved him, for in my opinion a white woman, intelligent and respectable, and knowing what it means, who would marry a coloured man, must love him and love him dearly. To make that love stronger is a feeling that haunts the mind. The knowledge that custom, tradition, and the dignity of both races are against it. Like anything forbidden, however, it arouses the spirit of opposition, causing the mind to battle with what is felt to be oppression. The sole claim is the right to love. These thoughts fell upon me like a clap of thunder and frightened me the more. It was then, too, that I realized how pleasant the summer just past had been, and that I had not been in the least lonesome, but perfectly content, ay, happy. And that was the reason. During the summer, when I had read a good story, or had on mind to discuss my hopes, she had listened attentively, and I had found companionship. If I was melancholy, I had been cheered in the same demure manner, yet, on the whole, I had been unaware of the affection growing silently, drawing two lonesome hearts together. With the reality of it upon us, we were unable to extricate ourselves from our own weak predicament. We tried avoiding each other, tried everything to crush the weakness. God has thus endowed. We found it hard. I have felt if a person could only order his mind as he does his limbs and have it respond or submit to the will, how much easier life would be. For it is that relentless thinking all the time until one's mind becomes a slave to its own imaginations that brings eternal misery where happiness might be had. To love is life. Love lives to seek reply. But I would contend with myself as to whether or not it was right to fall in love with this poor little white girl. I contended with myself that there were good girls in my race, and coincident with this, I quit boarding with them and went to batch again, to try to successfully combat my emotions. I continued to send her papers and books to read. I could hardly restrain the inclination to be kind. Then one day, I went to the house to settle with her father for the boy's work and found her alone. I could see she had been crying, and her very expression was one of unhappiness. Well, what is a fellow going to do? What I did was take her into my arms, and in spite of all the custom, loyalty, or the dignity of either Ethiopian or the Caucasian race, loved her like a lover. It was during a street carnival at Magori, some time before the Tip County opening, when one afternoon, in company with three or four white men, I saw a nice-looking coloured man coming along the street. It was very seldom any coloured people came to those parts, and when they did, it was with a show troupe or a concert of some kind. Whenever any coloured people were in town, I had usually made myself acquainted and welcomed them, if it was acceptable, and it usually was. So when I saw this young man approaching, I called the attention of my companions, saying, This is a nice-looking coloured man. He was about five feet eleven, of light brown complexion, and chestnut-like hair, neatly trimmed. He wore glasses and was dressed in a well-fitted suit that matched his complexion. He had the appearance of being intelligent and amiable. I was in the act of starting to speak when one of the fellows nudged me and whispered in my ear that it was one of the wood rings from a town a short distance away in Nebraska who was known to be of mixed blood but never admitted it. According to what I had been told, the father of the three boys was about half Negro, but had married a white woman, and this one was the youngest son. Needless to say, I did not speak, but kept clear of him. There is a difference in races that can be distinguished in the features, in the eyes, and even, if carefully noted, in the sound of the voice. It seemed the family claimed to be part Mexican, which would account for the darkness of their complexion. But I had seen too many different races, however, to mistake a streak of Ethiopian. Having been in Mexico, I knew them to be almost entirely straight-haired, being a cross between an Indian and a Spaniard. When I observed this young man, 
I readily distinguished the negro features, the brown eyes, the curly hair, and the set of the nose. The father had come into the sand hills of Nebraska some thirty-five years before, taking a homestead, but from where he came from no one seemed to know. It was there he married his white wife, and to the union was born the three sons, Frank, the eldest, Will, and Len, the youngest. The father sold the homestead some twenty years before, and moved to another county, and had run a hotel since in the town of Pensa, where they now live. Unlike his younger brother, Frank, the eldest son, could easily have passed for a white, that is, so long as no one looked for the streak. But when the fellow, whose timely information had kept me from embarrassing myself, and perhaps from insulting the young man, a few minutes later called out, Hello, Frank, to a tall man. One look disclosed to my scrutiny the negro in his features. I was not mistaken, it was Frank Woodring. In view of the fact that in some chapters of this story I dwell on the negro, and on account of the instance of many of them who declare they are deprived of opportunities on account of their colour. I take the privilege of putting down here a sketch of this Frank Woodring's life, and although these people deny a relation to the Negro race, it was well known by the public in that part of the country that they were mixed, for it had been told to me by everyone who knew them. Therefore, the instance cannot be regarded altogether as an exception. Shortly after coming to Pensa, he went to work for an Iowa man on a ranch nearby, and later a prosperous squaw man who owned a bank took him in, where in time he became bookkeeper and all-round handyman, later assistant cashier. The ranchman whom Woodring had worked for previously to entering the bank bought the squaw man out, made Woodring cashier, and sold to him a block of stock and took his note for the amount. In time Woodring proved a good banker and his efficient management of the institution which had been a state bank, with a capital stock of $25,000, had been incorporated into a national bank, and the capital increased to $50,000, and later on to $100,000. He dealt in buying and selling land, as well as feeding cattle on the side, and had prospered until he was soon well-to-do. Coincident with this prosperity, he had been made president of not only that bank, whose footing was near half a million dollars, but of some three or four local banks in Nebraska, also a Megory County Bank at Fairview, which is the county depository and a large bank and trust company at the town of Megory, with a capital stock of $60,000. Today, Frank Woodring is one of the wealthiest men in northwest Nebraska. The local ball team of their town was playing Megory that day, and a few hours later, out at the ballpark, I was shouting for the home team with all my breath. The batter struck a foul, and when I turned to look where the ball went, there, standing on the bench above me, between two white girls and looking down at me, with a look that betrayed his mind, was Len Woodring. Our eyes met for only the fraction of a minute, but I read his thoughts. He looked away quickly, but I shall not soon forget that moment of racial recognition. And now, when I found my affections in jeopardy regarding the love of the Scotch girl, I thought long and seriously over the matter and pictured myself in the place of the Woodring family, successful, respected, and efficient businessmen, but still members of the downtrodden race. I pondered as to whether I could make the sacrifice. Maybe they were happy, the boys had never known or associated with the race they denied, and maybe were not so conscientious as myself, although the look of Lens had betrayed what was on his mind. I had learned that throughout these Dakotas and Nebraska, that other lone coloured men who had drifted from the haunts and homes of the race, as I had, may be discontented, as I had been, and had, with time and natural development, through the increase in the valuation of their homesteads or other land they had acquired, grown prosperous and had finally, with hardly an exception, 
married into the white race. Even the daughter of the only coloured farmer between the Little Crow and Omaha was only prevented from marrying a white man at the altar when it was found the law of the state forbids it. I could diagnose their condition by my own. Life in a new country is always rough in the beginning. In the past, it had taken 10 and 15 years for a newly opened country to develop into a state of cultivation and prosperity that the Little Crow had in the four years. At the time it had been open to settlement, the reaction from the effects of the dry years and hard times of 93, 4 and 5 had set in and at that time, with plenty of available capital, the early extension of the railroad and other advantages too numerous to mention, life had been quite different for the settlers. Such advantages had not been the lot of the homesteader 20 and 30 years before. These people had no doubt been honourable and had intended to remain loyal to their race, but long, hard years, lean crops and the long, lonesome days had changed them. It is easier to control the thoughts than the emotions. The craving for love and understanding pervades the very core of a human and makes the mind reckless to even such a grave matter as race loyalty. In most cases, it had been years before these people had the means and time to get away for a visit to their old homes, while around them were the neighbours and friends of pioneer days, and maybe, too, some girl had come into their lives, like the one had into mine, who understood them and was kind and sympathetic. What worried me most, however, even frightened me, was that after marriage, and when their children had grown to manhood and womanhood, they, like the Woodring family, had a terror of their race, disowning and denying the blood that coursed through their veins, claiming to be some foreign descent, in fact anything to hide or conceal the mixture of Ethiopian. They looked on me with fear, sometimes contempt. Even the mixed blood Indians and Negroes seemed to crave a marriage with the whites. The question upmost in my mind became, would not I become like that? Would I too deny my race? The thought was a desperate one. I did not feel that I could become that way. But what about those to come after me? Would they have to submit to the indignities I had seen some of these refer to do in order that they may marry whites and try to banish from memory the relation of a race that is hated in many instances? For no other reason than the colouring matter in their pigment. Would my life and the thought involved and occupied my mind daily, innocent as my life now appeared, lead into such straits if I married a Scotch girl. It became harder for me, for at that time I had not even a correspondence with a girl of my race. As I look back upon it, the condition was a complicated affair. I confess at the time, however, that I was on the verge of making the sacrifice. This was due to the sight that had met my gaze when I would go on trips to Chicago, and such times I would return home feeling disgusted. End of chapter 25。Chapter 26 of The Conquest。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter 26. The Battle. Sometime after the opening, it was announced from Washington that the land office, which was located in one of the larger towns of the state, about 150 miles from the Little Crow, would be moved to one of the towns in the new territory. The land office is something like a county seat in bringing business to a town, and immediately every town in Magory County began a contest for the office. However, it was soon seen that it was the intention of the Interior Department to locate it in either Magory or Callis. 
so the two familiar rivals engaged in another battle. But in this, Megori held the high card. That was about the time the insurgents and stalwarts were in a struggle to get control of the state's political machinery. It had waxed bitter in the June primaries of that year, and the insurgents had won. Callis had supported the losing candidate, who had been overwhelmingly defeated, and both senators and one representative in Congress from the state were red-hot insurgents. The Nicholson brothers, bowing to tradition, were stand pats. Their father had been a stalwart before them in Iowa, where Cummins had created so much commotion with his insurgency. Ernest, with his wife, had left for the Orient to spend the winter. After leaving, the announcement came that the land office would be moved. Even had he been in Callis, the result would likely have been the same. But I had a creepy feeling that had he been on the ground, Megory would have had to work considerably harder, at least. After sending many men from each town down to the national capital, the towns fought it out, with, as I have stated, and which was to be expected, with both senators recommending Megory as having advantages over Callis in the way of an abundant supply of water and a national bank with a capital stock of $50,000, the Interior Department decided in favor of Megory, and Callis lost. Ernest, on hearing of the fight, hurriedly returned, went into Washington, secured an appointment with the secretary, and is said to have made a worthy plea for Callis. But to no avail, and the Megoryites returned home, the heroes of the day. I was away at the time, but was told a good share of the men of Megory were drunk the greater part of the week. Some evidence of the rejoicing was visible on my return, in the loss of an eye by a little gambler who became too enthusiastic and run up against a snag. What amused me most, however, was an article written especially for one of the Megory papers by a keeper of a racket store and a known shouter for the town. The article represented the contest as being a big prize fight on the Little Crow and read something like this. Big prize fight on the Little Crow. Principles. Megory the metropolis of the Little Crow. Reputation? The square deal. Callous boaster. Reputation grafting. Scene. Little Crow Reservation. Time. A.D. 190. Referee. Washington, D.C. Seconds for Megory. Flacker of the Megory National. Fred Crofton, Postmaster. For Callis, Mayor Rosie and a has-been, formerly of Washington. Round 1, September. Principals enter the ring and refuse to shake hands. Referee Washington, D.C. announces fight to be straight marquee of Queensbury. No hitting in the clinches and a clean break. A fight to the finish. They are off. Callis leads with a left to the face. Megory countering with a right to the ribs. They clinch. Referee breaks them. Then they spar, and as the gong sounded, appeared evenly matched. Round two, October. They rush to the center of the ring and clinch. Referee tells them to break. Just as this is done, Callis lands a terrific left to Megory's jaw, following with a right to the body, and Megory goes down for the count of nine, getting up with much confusion, only to be floored again with a right to the temple. Megory rises very groggy, when Callis lands a vicious left to the mouth, a right to the ear just as the gong sounded, saving her from a knockout. 
they go to their corners with betting three to one on callous and no takers. During the one minute's rest, the crowd whooped it up for callous, thousands coming her way. Megory looked serious, sitting in the corner, thinking how she had fallen down on some well-laid plans. Round three, November. They rush to a clinch and spar. Referee cautions Callus for butting. They do some more sparring, and both seem cautious, with honors even at the end of the third round. Round four, December. They rush to the center of the ring and begin to spar, and like a flash, Magori lands a terrific swing on Callus's jaw, following it up with a right to the heart. Callus cries foul, but referee orders her to proceed, while Magori, with eyes flashing and distended nostrils, faints and then, like the kick of a mule, lands a hard left to the mouth, following in quick succession with jolts, swings, jabs, and uppercuts. Mayor Rosie wants to throw up the sponge, but the referee says fight. Magori with a left to the face and right to the stomach, then rushing both hands in a blow to the solar plexus, Callus falls and is counted out with Magori winning the prize. Great Land Office. End of Chapter 26「Getting back to the affair of the Scotch girl, I hated to give up her kindness and friendship. I would have given half my life to have had her possess just a least bit of negro blood in her veins, but since she did not and could not help it any more than I could help being a negro, I tried to forget it, straightened out my business, and took a trip east, bent on finding a wife among my own. As the early morning train carried me down the road from Magori, I hoped with all the hope of early manhood I would find a sensible girl, and not like many I knew in Chicago, who talked nothing but clothes, jewelry, and a good time. I had no doubt there were many good colored girls in the East, who, if they understood my life, ambition, and morality, would make a good wife and assist me in building a little empire on the Dakota Plains, not only as a profit to ourselves, but a credit to the Negro race as well. I wanted to succeed, but hold the respect and good will of the community, and there are few communities that will sanction a marriage with a white girl, hence the sacrifice. I spent about six weeks visiting in Chicago and New York, finally returning west to southern Illinois to visit a family in Seadale, near M. Burrow, who were the most prosperous colored people in the town. They owned a farm near town, nine houses and lots in the city, and were practical people who understood business and what it took to succeed. They had a daughter whom I had known as a child back in the home town, M. Plus, where she had cousins that she used to visit. She had by this time grown into a woman of five and twenty. Her name was Daisy Hinshaw. Now, Miss Hinshaw was not very good-looking, but had spent years in school and in many ways was unlike the average colored girl. She was attentive and did not have her mind full of cheap, showy ideals. I had written to her at times from South Dakota, and she answered with many inviting letters. Therefore, when I wrote her from New York that I intended paying her a visit, she answered in a very inviting letter, 
but boldly told me not to forget to bring her a nice present, that she would like a large purse. I did not like such boldness. I should have preferred a little more modesty, but I found the purse, however, a large seal one in a Fifth Avenue shop for six dollars, which Miss Hinshaw displayed with much show when I came to town. The town had a colored population of about one thousand, and the many girls who led in the local society looked enviously upon Miss Hinshaw's catch and the large seal purse, and I became the man of the hour in Seadale. The only marriageable man in the town who did not gamble, get drunk, and carouse in a way that made him ineligible to decent society was the professor of the colored school. He was a college graduate and received sixty dollars a month. He had been spoiled by too much attention, however, and was not an agreeable person. Miss Hinshaw was dignified and desired to marry and to marry somebody that amounted to something, but she was so bold and selfish. She took a delight in the reports that were going the rounds that we were engaged, and I was going to have her come to South Dakota and file on a Tip County homestead relinquishment that I would buy, and we would then get married. The only objector to this plan was myself. I had not fallen in love with Miss Hinshaw and did not feel that I could. Daisy was a nice girl, however, a little odd in appearance, having a light brown complexion without color or blood visible in the cheeks, was small and bony, padded with so many clothes that no idea of form could be drawn. I guessed her weight at about ninety pounds, she had very good hair, but gray eyes that gave her a caddish appearance. She had me walking with her alone and permitted no one to interfere. She would not introduce me to other girls while out, keeping me right by her side and taking me home and into her parlor with her and her alone as company. One day I went uptown and while there took a notion to go to the little mining town to see the relatives who had got me the job there seven years before. But it was ten miles, with no train before the following morning. Just then the colored caller called out a train to Embro and St. Louis, and all of a sudden it occurred to me that I had almost forgotten Miss Rooks. Why not go to Embro? I had not expected to pay her a visit, but suddenly decided that I would just run over quietly and come back on the train to Seadale at five o'clock that afternoon. I jumped aboard, and as Embro was only eight miles, I was soon in the town and inquiring where she lived. I found their house presently. They were always moving, and just a trifle nervously rang the bell. The door was opened in a few minutes, and before me stood Jessie. She had changed quite a bit in the three years, and now with long skirts and the eyes looked so tired and dreamlike. She was quite fascinating. This I took in at a glance. She stammered out, Oh, Oscar Devereux, extending her hand timidly and looking into my eyes as though afraid. She looked so lonely, and I had thought a great deal of her a few years ago, and perhaps it was not all dead, and the next moment she was in my arms, and I was kissing her. I did not go back to Seadale on the five, nor the eight o'clock, and I did not want to on the last train that night. I was having the most carefree time of my life. They were hours of sweetest bliss." With Jessie snugly held in the angle of my left arm, we poured out the pent-up feelings of the past years. I had a proposition to make, and had reasons to feel it would be accepted. The family had a hard time making ends meet. 
Her father had lost the mail carrier's job and had run a restaurant later and then a saloon. Failing in both, he had gone to another town, starting another restaurant, and had there been assaulted by a former admirer of Jesse's, who had struck him with a heavy stick, fracturing the skull and injuring him so that for weeks he had not been able to remember anything. Although he was then convalescing, he was unable to earn anything. Her mother had always been helpless, and the support fell on her and a younger brother, who acted as special delivery letter carrier and received twenty dollars a month, while Jesse taught a country school a mile from town, receiving twenty-five dollars per month. This she turned over to the support of the household, and made what she earned sewing, after school hours, supply her own needs. It was a long and pitiful tale, she related as we walked together along a dark street, with her clinging to my arm and speaking at times in a half-sob. My heart went out to her, and I wanted to help and said, Why did you not write to me? Didn't you know that I would have done something? Well, she answered slowly, I started to several times, but was so afraid that you would not understand. She seemed so weak and forlorn in her distress. She had never been that way when I knew her before, and I felt sure she had suffered, and I was a brute not to have realized it. Twelve o'clock found me as reluctant to go as five o'clock, but as we kissed lingeringly at the door, I promised when I left Seadale two evenings later I would stop off at Emboro, and we would discuss the matter pro and com. This was Saturday night. The next morning I called to see Daisy. I was unusually cheerful, and taking her face in my hands, blew a kiss. She looked up at me, with her gray eyes alert, and with an air of suspicion, said, You've been kissing somebody else since you left here. Then, leading me into the parlor in her commanding way, ordered me to sit down and to wait there until she returned. She had just completed cleaning and dusting the parlor, and it was in perfect order. She seemed to me to be more forward than ever that morning, and I felt a suspicion that I was going to get a curtain lecture. However, I escaped the lecture, but got stunned instead. Daisy returned in about an hour, dressed in a rustling black silk dress with powdered face and her hair done up elegantly and without ceremony or hesitation planted herself on the set tea and requested, or rather ordered me, to take a seat beside her. She opened the conversation by inquiring of South Dakota and took my hand and pretended to pare my fingernails. I answered in nonchalant tones, but after a little she turned her head a little slantingly, looked down, began just the least hesitant but firmly. Now, what arrangements do you wish me to make in regard to my coming to South Dakota next fall? For the love of Jesus, I said to myself, if she hasn't proposed. Now, one advantage of a dark skin is that one does not show his inner feeling as noticeably as those of the lighter shade, and I do not know whether Miss Hinshaw noticed the look of embarrassment that overspread my countenance. I finally found words to break the deadly suspense following her bold action. Oh, I stammered, more than spoke. I would really rather not make any arrangements, Daisy. Well, she said, not in the least taken aback, a person likes to know just how they stand. Yes, of course, I added hastily. You see, I was just starting in on a lengthy discourse, trying to avoid the issue, when the doorbell rang, and a relative of mine, by the name of Menlo Robinson, 
who had attended the university the same time Miss Henshaw had, but had been expelled for gambling and other bad habits, came in. He was a bore most of the time with so much of his college talk, but I could have hugged him then. I felt so relieved. But Miss Henshaw put in, before he got started to talking, wickedly, that of course, if I did not want her, she could not force it. The next day at noon, I left for St. Louis, but did not mention that I was scheduled to stop off at Embro. Miss Henshaw had grown sad in appearance and looked so lonely I felt sorry for her and kissed her goodbye at the station, which seemed to cheer her a little. She was married to a classmate about a year later, and I have not seen her since. Jessie was glad to see me when I called that evening in Embro, and we went walking again and had another long talk. When we got back, I sang the old story to which she answered with, Do you really want me? Sure, Jessie, why not? I looked into her eyes that seemed just about to shed tears, but she closed them and snuggled up closely and whispered, I just wanted to hear you say you wanted me. End of chapter 27「Chapter twenty eight of the Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter twenty eight. The Breeds. Here the story may have ended. That is, had I taken her to the minister. But as everybody had gone land-crazy in Dakota, and I had determined to own more land myself, I told her how I could buy a relinquishment, and she could file on it, and then we would marry at once. Now, when a young man and a girl are in love, and feel each other to be the world and all that's in it, it is quite easy to plan, and Miss Rooks and I were no exception. Had we been in South Dakota instead of Southern Illinois, and had it been the month of October instead of January, nine months before, we would have carried out our plans. But since it was January, we mutually agreed to wait until the nine months had elapsed. But something happened during that time, which will be told in due time. I enjoyed feeling that I was at last engaged. It was positively delightful and when I left the next morning to visit my parents in Kansas, I was a very happy person. While visiting there, shooting jackrabbits by day, and boosting Dakota to the Jayhawkers half the night, I'd write to Miss Rooks sometime during each twenty-four hours, and for a time received a letter as often. Two sisters were to be graduated from the high school the following June and wanted to come to dakota in the fall and take up claims but had no money to purchase relinquishments i agreed to mortgage my land and loan the money but when all was arranged it was found one of them would not be old enough in time so my grandmother who had always possessed a roving spirit wanted to come and so it was settled when i got back to dakota and jumped into my spring work it was with unusual vigor and contemplation, and all went well for a while. Soon, however, I failed to hear from Jessie and began to feel a bit uneasy. When three weeks had passed and still no letter, I wrote again, asking why she did not answer my letters. In due time I heard from her, stating that she had been afraid I didn't love her, and that she had been told I was engaged to Daisy and as daisy would be the heir to the money and property of her parents she felt sure my marriage to miss hinshaw would be more agreeable to me than would a marriage with her who had only a kind heart and willing mind to offer so she had on the first day of april married one whom she felt was better suited to her impoverished condition 
Now what she had done was, in her effort to break off the prolonged courtship of the little fellow referred to in the early part of this story, and who was still working for three dollars a week, she had commenced going with another, a cook of forty-two years of age, and had thought herself desperately in love with him at the time. I had not even written to Miss Henshaw, and knew nothing whatever of any engagement. I was very downcast for a time, and like some others who have been jilted, I grew the least bit wicked in my thoughts, and felt she would not find life all sunshine and roses with her forty-two-year-old groom. Lots of excitement was on around Megori and Callias, and as I liked excitement I soon forgot the matter. With the location of the land office in Megori, and its subsequent removal from east of the Missouri, it was found there was only one building in the town, outside of the banks, that contained a vault, and a vault being necessary, it became expedient for the commercial club to provide an office that contained one. Two prosperous real estate dealers, whose office contained a vault, readily turned over their building to the register and receiver until the land office building, then under construction, should be completed. A building, twenty-five by sixty feet, was built in the street, just in front of the office, to be used as a temporary map room, and to be moved away as soon as the filing was over. The holders of lucky numbers had been requested to appear at a given hour on a certain day to offer filings on Tip County claims. By the time the filing had commenced, the hotels of both towns were filled, and tents covered all the vacant lots, while one hundred and fifty or more autos, to be hired at twenty-five dollars per day, did a rushing business. The settlers seemed to be possessed of abundant capital, and deposits in the local banks increased out of all proportion to those of previous times. Besides the holders of numbers, hundreds of other settlers who had purchased land in Megory County were moving in at the same time, bringing stock, machinery, household goods, and plenty of money. Those were bountiful days for the locators and land sharks. When Megory County opened for settlement a few years previous, it was found that the Indians had taken practically all their allotments along the streams, where wood and water were to be had. The most of these allotments were on the Manka bottom, below Old Callias. In fact, they had taken the entire valley that far up. The timber along the creek was very small, being stunted from many fires, and consisted mostly of cottonwood, elm, box elder, oak, and ash. All but the oak and ash, being easily susceptible to dry rot, were unfit for posts or anything except for shade and firewood. This made the valley lands cheaper than the uplands. The Indians were always selling, and are yet, what is furnished them by the government for all they can get. When given the money, spends it as quickly as he possibly can, buying fine horses, buggies, whiskey, and what not their only idea being that it is to spend. The Sioux Indians, in my opinion, are the wealthiest tribe. They owned at one time the larger part of southern South Dakota and northern Nebraska, and own a lot of it yet. Be it said, however, it is simply because the government will not allow them to sell. The breeds near Old Callias were easily flattered, and when the white people invited them to anything, they always came dressed in great regalia. But after the settlers came, there was not much intermarrying, such as there had been before. A family of mixed bloods, by the name of Kachal, owned all the land just south of Old Callias. In fact, the site where Callias had stood was formerly the allotment of a deceased son, the father, known as Old Tom Cutchall, was for years a landmark on the creek. Now and then, Nicholson brothers had invited the Cutchalls to some of their social doings, which made the Cutchalls feel exalted and higher still, when Ernest suggested he could get them a patent for their land and then would buy it. This suited Cutchalls' dandy. Ernest offered $7,000 for the section, and they accepted 
at that time, by recommending the Indian to be a competent citizen and able to care for himself, a patent would be granted on proper recommendation, and Nicholson Brothers attended to that, and got Mrs. Cutchall the patent. Tom, her husband, being a white man, could not be allotted, and she had been given the section as the head of the family. It is said they spent the seven thousand dollars in one year. The company of which the father of the Nicholson brothers was president made a loan of eight thousand dollars on the land, and shortly afterwards they sold it for twenty-three thousand dollars. The lots had brought more than one hundred thousand dollars in Callias, and were still selling, so this placed the Windy Nicholsons, as they had been called by jealous Megoriites, in a position of much importance, and they were by this time recognized as men of no small ability. Years before Megory County was open to settlement, many white men had drifted onto the reservation, and had engaged in ranching, and had in the meantime married squaws. This appeared to have been done more by the French than any other nationality, judging by the many French names among the mixed bloods. Among these were a family by the name of Amoureux, consisting of four boys and several girls. The girls had all married white men, and the little, while old Callius was in existence, two of the boys, William and George, used to go there often, and were entertained by the Nicholson brothers with as much splendor as Callius could afford. The Amoureux were high moguls in Little Crow society during the first two years, and everybody took off their hats to them. They were called the Rich Mixed Bloods, and were engaged in ranching, and owned great herds in Tip County. When they shipped, it was by the trainloads. The Amoureux and the Colons, another family of wealthy breeds, were married to white women, and the husbands, as head of families, held a section of land, and the children each held one hundred and sixty acres. Before the Nicholson brothers had left old Callias, and before they had reached the position they now occupied, as I stated, they had shown the Amoureux a good time. They did not have much Indian blood in their veins, being what are called quarter breeds, having a French father and a half-blood Indian mother, and were all fine-looking. George had seven children, and the family altogether had eleven quarter sections of land and two thousand head of cattle, so there was no reason why he should not have been the big chief but so much society and paid-for notoriety had brought about a change to him and his brother william who had always been a money-maker and a still bigger spender with the fine looks thrown in had shone like a skyrocket before bursting a rich indian is something worth associating with but a poor one is of small note the Amoureux spent so freely that in a few years they were all in, down and out, had nothing but their allotments left, and these the government would not give patents to. The Colognes had done likewise, and together they had all moved into Tip County. Now there was another Amoureux, the oldest one of the boys, who like the others had blowed his roll but happened to have an allotment in the very picturesque valley of the Dog Ear, in Tip County, near the center of the county, and when a bunch of promoters decided to lay out a town, they made a deal with Oliver, taking him into the company, he furnishing the land, and they the brains. They laid out the site and began the town, naming it Amaro in honor of the breed, which made Oliver feel very big indeed. End of chapter 28。Chapter 29 of The Conquest。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud in the valley of the dog ear the boom in megory and callias took such proportions that it made every investor prosperous a goodly number of whom sold out settled in amoureux 
and the beautiful town site soon became one of the most popular trade centers in the new county it was the only town site where trees stood and the investors thought it a good thing that they would not have to wait a score of years to grow them among the money investors in the town was old dad derpy the former orristown and meguri stage driver when talking with him one day he told me he had saved three thousand dollars while running the stage line and had several good horses besides dad as he was familiarly called had invested a part of his bank account in a corner lot and put up a two-story building and soon became an amaro booster old dad opened up a stage line between Callias and the new town but this line did not pay as well as the old one for no one rode with him except when the weather was bad as the people were all riding now in automobiles in a short time every line of business was represented in amaro and when the settlers began to arrive amaro did a flourishing business in coming from Callias, the trail led over a monstrous hill and from the top amro the name having been shortened nestling in the valley below reminding me of mexico city as it appeared from the highlands near cuernavaca a party from hedrick by the name of van nieder built a hotel fifty by one hundred feet with forty rooms and during the opening and filing made a small fortune the house was always full and high prices were charged and thus amro prospered during the month of april the promoters succeeded in having the governor call an election to organize the county the election to be held in june following the filing had been made in april and may and as conditions were no one could vote except cowboys indians and mixed bloods in the election amro won the county seat and settlers moving into the county were exceedingly mortified over the fact having to be governed eighteen months by an outlaw set who had deprived them of a voice in the organization of the county as amro had won it soon became the central city and grew as callias had grown and in a short time had a half dozen general stores two garages four hotels four banks and every other line of business that goes to make up a western town its four livery barns did all the business their capacity would permit while the saloons and gamblers feasted on the easy eastern cash that fell into their pockets in july the lot sales of the government towns were held but only one amounted to much that town being farthest west and miles from the eastern line of the county this was written and under a ruling of the interior department a deposit of twenty five dollars was accepted on an option of sixty days after which a payment of one half the price of the lot was required here it must be said that almost every dollar invested on the little crow had been doubled in a short time and in many instances a hundred dollars soon grew to a thousand or more practically all the lowest number holders had filed around written including numbers one and two ever since the opening of oklahoma in nineteen o one when number one took a claim adjoining the city of lawton and the owner is said to have received thirty thousand dollars for it the holder of number one in every opening of western land since has been a very conspicuous figure and this was not lost on the holder of number one in tip county who was a divorced woman she took her claim adjoining the town of written which fact brought the town considerable attention the lots in the town brought the highest price of any which had been sold in any town on the little crow up to that time several having sold for from one thousand two hundred to one thousand four hundred dollars and one as high as two thousand and fifty dollars the town of amro being surrounded by indian allotments had few settlers in its immediate vicinity the indians profiting by their experience in Megary county where they had learned that good location meant increase in the value of their lands had in selecting allotments taken nearly all the land just west of amro as they had taken practically all of the good land just west of Callias in the eastern part of tip county the good land all over the county had been picked over and the indians had selected much of the best but tip county is a large one and several hundred thousand acres of good land were available for homesteading though much scattered as to location when july arrived and still no surveyors for the railroad company had put in their appearance it was feared that no extension work would be commenced that year but shortly after the lot sale at written 
the surveyors arrived in the county and ran a survey west from Callias, eleven miles to a town named after the colognes referred to striking the town then proceeding northwest missing amro and crossing the dog ear about two miles north of the town then following a divide almost due west to the county line on the west running just south of a conspicuous range of hills known as the red hills missing every town in the county except cologne this caused a temporary check in the excitement around amro but as it had the county seat it felt secure as a county seat means much to a western village and felt the railroad would eventually go there in fact the citizens of the town boasted that the road could not afford to miss it pointing with pride to the many teams to be seen in her streets daily and the bee-like activity of the town in general i visited the town many times but from the first time i saw the place i felt sure the railroad would never go there as two miles to the north was the natural divide that the survey had followed all the way from cologne to the dog ear and on to the west side of the county which is a natural right of way when i argued with the people in the town that amro would not get the railroad i brought out a storm of protest End of chapter 29chapter thirty of the conquest this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rita boutros the conquest by oscar michaud chapter thirty ernest nicholson takes a hand after completing the first survey, however, the surveyors returned and made another that struck Amro. This survey swerved off from the first survey to the southwest between Cologne and Amro, and struck the valley of a little stream known as Mud Creek, which empties into the dog ear at Amro. But being a most illogical route, I felt confident this C and R W had no intention of following it perhaps only making the survey out of courtesy to the people in Amro, or possibly to show to the state railroad commissioners, if they became insistent, why they could not strike the town. About this time, Ernest Nicholson appeared on the scene, and purchased a forty-acre tract of land north of the town, for which he paid fifty-five dollars an acre, later paying ten thousand dollars for a quarter, joining the forty still later he purchased the entire section of airship land belonging to a man named jim riggins an orristown city justice and a former squaw man whose deceased wife had owned the land for this section of land the nicholsons paid thirty five thousand dollars the price staggered the people of amro who declared nicholson had certainly gone crazy they set up a terrible howl what were the blank Nicholsons sticking their noses into Tip County towns for? Were they not satisfied with Callias, where they had grafted everybody out of their money? No, the trouble, they all agreed, was that Ernest wanted to run the country, and wanted to be the big stick. But they consoled themselves for a while with the fact that Amro had the county seat and was growing. The settlers were trading in Amro, for Amro had what they needed. An indignation meeting was held, where, with much feeling, they denounced the actions of Ernest Nicholson in buying land north of the town, and announcing that he would build a town such as the little crow had never dreamed of, and that Amro should at once begin to move over to the new town site and save money. But they were hot, old dad derpy in his shirt sleeves corduroy and boots his shaggy beard flowing declared that the low-down stinking lying cuss would not dare to ask him to move to the town he had as yet not even named but ernest at the wheel of a big new sixty horsepower packard continued to buy land along the railroad survey all the way to the west line of the county in fact he bought every piece of land that was purchasable. I watched this fight from the beginning with interest, for I had become well enough acquainted with Ernest to feel that he knew what he was about. 
When the surveyors had arrived in Callius, Ernest had gone to Chicago. In declaring the road could not miss Amro, the people were much like inhabitants of Megory had been a few years before. While they prattled and allowed their ego to rule, they should have been busy, and when it was seen that the town might not get the railroad, they should have gone to Chicago and seen Marvin Hewitt, putting the proposition squarely before him, and requested that if he could not give them the road, to give them a depot if they moved to the line of the survey. By that time it was a town with two solid blocks of business houses and many good merchants and bankers. I often wondered how such men could be so pin-headed, sitting back, declaring the great C. and R. W. Railway could not afford to miss a little burg like Amro. But from previous observations and experience, I felt sure they would wait until the last dog was dead before trying to see what they could do. And they did. In the meantime, the promoters, who were nearly all from Megory or somewhere in Megory County, had learned that Ernest Nicholson was nobody's fool. They hooted the Nicholsons, along with the rest of the town, declaring Ernest to be anything but what he really was, until they had roused enough excitement to make Amro seem like a good thing. Then they quietly sold their interest to the Amaro brothers, who raked up about all that was left of the fortune of a few years previous, and paid $6,600 for the interest of the promoters, which made the Amaro the sole owners of the town site, and placed them in obvious control of the town's affairs, and again in the white society they liked so well. All the Callius lumber yards owned branch yards at Amro, and everybody continued to do a flourishing business. The Amroites paid little attention to the platting of the town site to the north, nor made a single effort to ascertain which survey the railroad would follow, but continued to boast that Amro would get the road. About this time, Ernest Nicholson called a meeting in Amro, inviting all the businessmen to be present, and hear a proposition that he had to make, stating he hoped the citizens of the town and himself could get together without friction or ill-feeling. The meeting was held in Derpy's Hall, and everybody attended, some out of curiosity, some out of fear and but few with any expectation or intention of agreeing to move to the north town site. Ernest addressed the meeting, first thanking them for their presence, then plunged headlong into the purpose of the meeting. He explained that it was quite impossible for the road to go to Amro. This he had feared before a survey was made but that he had ascertained while in Chicago that the road would not strike Amro. He then read a letter from Marvin Hewitt, the man of destiny, so far as the location of the railroad was concerned, which stated that the road would be extended, and the depot would be located on Section 20, which was the section Ernest had purchased. Then he brought up the matter of the distribution of lots, which was that to every person who moved or began to move to the new town site within thirty days, one half of the purchase price of the lot would be refunded. The price of the business lots ranged from 800 to 2000 dollars, while residence lots were from 50 to 300. Think it over, he said in closing, and was gone. Needless to say, they paid little attention to the proposition. The Amro Journal roasted and cartooned the Nicholson brothers in the same way Megory papers had done on account of the town of Callias. After thirty days had elapsed, the Nicholsons warned the people of Amro that it was the last opportunity they would have to accept his proposition, and when they paid no attention to his warning, he named the new town. I shall not soon forget how the people outside of the town of Amro laughed over the name applied to the new town, as its application to the situation was so accurate and descriptive of later events that I regret I must substitute a name for the purposes of this story, but which is the best I am able to find, Victor. 
Instead of moving to Victor, taking advantage of choice of location and the purchase of a lot at half price, the Amroites began making improvements in their town, putting down cement walks ten feet wide, the length of the two business blocks, and walks on side streets as well. A school election was called, and as a result, an $11,000 schoolhouse was erected a modern two-story building with basement and gymnasium. The building was large enough to hold all the population of Amro if all the men, women, and children were of school age, and still have room for many more. This act brought a storm of criticism from the settlers, and even many of the people of the town thought it quite a needless extravagance. But Van Neder, who was strong for education and for Amro, had put it through and figured he had won a point. He was the county superintendent. Most of the people claimed the town would soon grow large enough to require the building and let it go at that. People began drifting into Victor, buying lots and putting up good buildings. Nicholson's announced a lot sale, and preparations began for much active boosting for the new town. In the election to be held a year later, they hoped to wrest the county seat from Amro. When Ernest Nicholson saw the improvements being made in Amro and no sign of moving the town, he began to scheme, and I could see that if Amro wasn't going to move peacefully, he would help it along in some other way. However, nothing was done before the lot sale, which was advertised to take place in the lobby of the Nicholson Brothers' new office building in Callias. On the date advertised for the lot sale, crowds gathered and many who had no intentions of investing attended the sale out of curiosity. I took a crowd to Callias from Megori, among whom was Joy Flackler, cashier of the Megori National Bank, who stated that Frank Woodring had loaned the Nicholsons $50,000 to buy the town site. Megoriites still held a grudge against the Nicholsons, and Flackler seemed to wish they had asked the loan of him so he might have the pleasure of turning them down. The second day of the lot sale, a bunch of bartenders, gamblers, and Amro's rougher class appeared on the scene and distributed handbills which announced that Amro had contracted for a half section on the survey north of the town and would move in a body if moving was necessary. The crowd styled themselves Amro knockers, whose purpose it was to show prospective lot buyers that in purchasing Victor lots they were buying a pig in a poke. The knocking was done mostly in saloons, where the knockers got drunk and were promptly arrested before the sale started. The sale went along unhindered. The auctioneer, standing above the crowds, waxed eloquent in pointing out the advantages, describing Sioux City on the east and Deadwood and Lead on the west, and explaining that eventually a city must spring up in that section of the country that would grow into a prairie metropolis of probably 10,000 people and whether the crowd before him took his eloquence seriously or not they at least had the chance at the choice of the lots and locations and eighty four thousand dollars worth of lots were sold end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of the conquest this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter 31. The Macralines. As before mentioned, I was given largely to observation and to reading, and was fairly well posted on current events. I was always a lover of success, and nothing interested me more after a day's work in the field than spending my evening hours in reading. What I liked best was some good story with a moral. I enjoyed reading stories by Maud Radford Warren, largely because her stories were so very practical and true to life. 
having travelled and seen much of the country, while running as a porter for the P.N. Company. I could follow much of her writings, having been over the ground covered by the scenes of many of her stories. Another feature of her writings which pleased me was the fact that many of the characters, unlike the central figures in many stories, who all become fabulously wealthy, were often only fairly successful and gained only a measure of wealth and happiness that did not reach prohibitive proportions. Perhaps I should not have become so set against stories whose heroes invariably become multimillionaires, had it not been for the fact that many of the younger members of my race, with whom I had made acquaintance in my trips to Chicago and other parts of the country, always appeared to intimate in their conversation that a person should have riches thrust upon them if they sacrificed all their good times, as they termed it, to go out west, of course, the Easterner, in most stories, conquers and becomes rich, that is, after so much sacrifice. The truth is, in real life, only about one in ten of the Eastern people make good at ranching or homesteading, and that one is usually well supplied with capital in the beginning, though of course there are exceptions. Colored people are much unlike the people of other races. For instance, all around me in my home in Dakota were foreigners of practically all nations except Italians and Jews, among them being Swedes, Norwegians, Danes, Assyrians from Jerusalem, many Austrians, some Hungarians, and lots of Germans and Irish, these last being mostly American-born, and also many Russians. The greater part of these people are good farmers, and were growing prosperous on the little crow, and seeing this, I worked the harder to keep abreast of them, if not a little ahead. This was my fifth year, and still there had not been a colored person on my land. Many more settlers had some, and Tip County was filling up, but still no colored people. My white neighbors had many visitors from their old homes, and but few but had visitors at some time to see them and see what they were doing. During my visit to Kansas the spring previous, I had found many prosperous colored families, most of whom had settled in Kansas in the seventies and eighties, and were mostly ex-slaves, but were not like the people of southern Illinois, contented and happy to eke a living from the farm they pretended to cultivate, but made their farms pay by careful methods. The farms they owned had from a hundred and sixty acres to six hundred and forty acres, and one colored man there at that time owned eleven hundred acres with twelve thousand dollars in the bank. Wherever I had been, however, I had always found a certain class in large and small towns alike whose object in life was obviously nothing but who dressed up and aped the white people. After Miss Rooks had married, I was again in the condition of the previous year, but during the summer I had written to a young lady who had been teaching in Embaro, and whom I had met while visiting Miss Rooks. Her name was Orleans McCrellin and her father was a minister, and had been the pastor of our church in M. Plus when I was a baby, but for the past seventeen years had been acting as presiding elder over the southern Illinois district. Miss McCrellin had answered my letters, and during the summer we had been very agreeable correspondents, and when, in September, I contracted for three relinquishments of homestead filings, I decided to ask her to marry me, but to come and file on a Tip County claim first. To get the money for the purchase of the relinquishments, I had mortgaged my 320 acres for $7,600, the relinquishments costing in the neighborhood of $6,400. October was the time when the land would be open to homestead filing, and Miss McCrellin had written that she would like to homestead. After sending my sister and grandmother the money to come to Dakota, 
I went to Chicago, where I arrived one Saturday morning. I had, since being in the West, stopped at the home of a maiden lady about thirty-five years of age, and in talking with her I had occasion to speak of the family. Evidently she did not know I had come to see Orléans, or that I was even acquainted with the family. I spoke of the Reverend McCrellin, and asked her if she knew him. "'Who, old N.J. McCrellin?' she asked. "'Humph!' she went on with a contemptuous snort. "'Yes, I know him, and know him to be the biggest old rascal in the Methodist church. He's lower than a dog,' she continued, "'and if it wasn't for his family, they would have thrown him out of the conference long ago. But he has a good family, and for that reason they let him stay on.' but he has no principle and is mean to his wife, never goes out with her nor does anything for her, but courts every woman on his circuit who will notice him and has been doing it for years. When he is in Chicago, he spends his time visiting a woman on the west side. Her name is Mrs. Ewis. This recalled to my mind that during the spring I had come to Chicago I had become acquainted with Mrs. Ewis's son and had been entertained at their home on Vernon Avenue, where at that time the two families, McCrellin and Ewis, rented a flat together, and although I had seen the girls, I had not become acquainted with any of the McCrellin family then. Orlean was the older of the two girls— what Miss Ankin had said about her father did not sound very good for a minister. Still, I had known in southern Illinois that the colored ministers didn't always bear the best reputations, and some of the colored papers I received in Dakota were continually making war on the immoral ministers. But since I had come to see the girl, it didn't discourage me when I learned her father had a bad name although I would have preferred an opposite condition. I went to the phone a few minutes after the conversation with Miss Ankin and called up Miss McCrellin, and when she learned I was in the city, she expressed her delight with many exclamations, saying she did not know I would arrive in the city until the next day, and inquired as to when I would call. "'As nothing is so important as seeing you,' I answered, "'I will call at two o'clock, if that is agreeable to you.' She assured me that it was, and at the appointed hour I called at the McCrellin home and was pleasantly received. Miss McCrellin called in her mother, whom I thought a very pleasant lady. We passed a very agreeable evening together, going over on State Street to supper, and then out to Jackson Park. I found Miss McCrellin a kind, simple, and sympathetic person, in fact agreeable in every way. I had grown to feel that if I ever married I would simply have to propose to some girl, and, if accepted, marry her and have it over with. I was tired of living alone on the claim, and wanted a wife and love, even if she was a city girl. I felt that I hadn't the time to visit all over the country to find a farmer's daughter. I had lived in the city and thought if I married a city girl, I would understand her anyway. I could not claim to be in love with this girl, nor with anyone else, but had always had a feeling that if a man and woman met and found each other pleasant and entertaining, there was no need of a long courtship. And when we came in from a walk, I stated the object of my trip. Miss McCrellin was acquainted with a part of the story, for, as stated, she had been teaching in M. Burrow at the time. I went there to see Miss Rooks, and had seen her take up with the cook and marry foolishly. She had stated in her letters that she had been glad that I wrote to her, and that she thought Miss Rooks had acted foolishly and when i explained my circumstances and stated the proposition she seemed favorable to it i told her to think it over and i would return the next day and explain it to her mother when i called the next morning and talked with her and her mother they both thought it all right that orlean should go to dakota and file on the homestead then we would marry and live together on the claim 
but her mother added somewhat nervously and apparently ill at ease that i had better talk with her husband as the reverend was then some three hundred and seventy-five miles south of chicago attending conference i couldn't see how we could get together but we put in the sunday attending church and sunday school and that evening went to a downtown theater where we saw lou dockstader's minstrels with neil o'brien as captain of the fire department which was very funny and i laughed until my head ached the next day was spent in trying to communicate with the reverend over the long distance but we did not succeed fortunately at about five o'clock mrs ewis came over from the west side i had known mrs ewis to be a smart woman with a deeper conviction than had mrs mccrailene whom she did not like but as mrs mccrailene was in trouble and did not know which way to turn mrs ewis was approached with the subject Orléans was an obedient girl, and although she wanted to go with me, it was evident that I must get the consent of her parents. She was nearly twenty-seven years old, and girls of that age usually wished to get married. Her younger sister had just been married, which added to her feeling of loneliness. The result of the consultation with Mrs. Ewis as she afterward explained to me, was that it was decided that it would not be proper for Orléans to go alone with me, but if I cared to pay her way, she would accompany us as chaperon. I was getting somewhat uneasy, as I had paid twelve hundred dollars into the bank at Megory for the relinquishment, which I would lose if someone didn't file on the claim by the second of October. It was then about September 25th, and I readily consented to incur the expense of her trip to Megory, where we soon landed. While I had been absent, my sister and grandmother had arrived. On October 1st, all three were ready to file on their claims, and Dakota's colored population would be increased by three and four hundred and eighty acres of land would be added to the wealth of the colored race in the state. Hundreds of others had purchased relinquishments, and were waiting to file also. A ruling of the department had made it impossible to file before October 1st, and when it was seen that only a small number would be able to file on that day, the register and receiver inaugurated a plan whereby all desiring to file on tip county claims should form a line in front of the land office door and when the office opened the line should file through the office in the order in which they stood and numbers would be issued to them which would permit them to return to the land office and make their filings in turn thereby avoiding a rush and the necessity of remaining in line until admitted to the land office. End of chapter 31。Chapter 32 of the Conquest。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros The Conquest by Oscar Michaud Chapter 32 A Long Night People began forming into line immediately after luncheon, on the afternoon of the last day of September, and continued throughout the afternoon. When I saw such a crowd gathering, I got my folks into the line. When it is taken into consideration that the land office would not open until nine o'clock the next morning this seemed like a foolish proceeding it was then four o'clock and the crowd would have to remain in line all night to hold their places to be exact just seventeen hours remaining in line all night was not pleasantly anticipated and nights in october in south dakota are apt to get pretty chilly but the line continued to increase, and by ten o'clock the street in front of the land office was a surging mass of humanity, 
mostly purchasers of relinquishments, waiting for the opening of the land office the next morning, and to be in readiness to protect the claim they had contracted for. Hot coffee and sandwiches were sold, and kept appetites supplied, and drunks mixed here and there in the line kept the crowd wakeful, many singing and telling stories to enliven the occasion. I held the place for my fiancé through the night, and although I had become used to all kinds of roughness, sitting up in the street all the long night was far from pleasant. About two o'clock in the morning, squatters, who had spent the early part of the night on the prairie in order to be on their claims after midnight, began to arrive and took their places at the foot of the line. All land not filed on by the original number holders was to be open for filing as soon as the land office opened, and squatters had from midnight until the opening of the land office in which to beat the man who waited to file before locating on the land a squatter's right holding first in such cases. Many had hired autos to bring them in from the reservation immediately after midnight or as soon after midnight as they had made some crude improvements on the land. Many auto-loads arrived with a shout, and claimants leaped from the tonneaus, falling into line almost before the vehicles had stopped. The line wound back and forth along the street like a snake, and formed into a compact mass, until after sunrise the noisy autos kept a steady rush, dumping their weary passengers into the street. By the time the land office opened in the morning, the line filled the street for half a block, and fully seventeen hundred persons were waiting for a chance to enter the land office. An army of tired, swollen-eyed, and dusty creatures they appeared, some of whom commenced stealing their positions in the line to latecomers, having gotten into line for speculation purposes only and offered their places for from ten to twenty-five dollars, and, in a few instances, places near the door sold for as high as fifty dollars. Under a ruling of the land officials, no filings were to be accepted except from holders of original numbers until October 1st, and this ruling made it expedient for holders of relinquishments of early numbers to get into line early, as the six months allowed for establishing residence expired for the first hundred original numbers on that day, and in cases where residence had not been properly established, the land would be open to contest as soon as this period had expired. Many hundreds had purchased relinquishments, hence the value placed on the positions nearest the land office store. It was three o'clock by the time the line had passed through the land office and received their numbers. The land office closed at four o'clock for the day, which left but one hour for the protection of those who must offer their filings that day or face the chances of a contest. Some had protected their claims by going into the land office before the ruling was made, and filing contests on the claims for which they held relinquishments. But most of the buyers had not thought of such a thing, and land grafters had complicated matters by filing contests on various claims for which they knew relinquishments would be offered, and then withdrawing the contest for a consideration. This practice met with strong disapproval, as most of the people had invested for the purpose of making homes, and the laws made it impossible to change the circumstances. These transactions had to be completed before the line formed, however, as after the line formed no one could enter the land office to offer either filing, relinquishment, or contest without a number issued by the officials. The line was full of such grafters, and as not more than one hundred filings could be taken in a day, it can readily be seen that some of the relinquishment holders were in danger of losing out through a contest offered before they had an opportunity to file. 
The crowds that flock to land openings, like other games of chance, are made up in a measure of speculators, people who journey to one of the registration points and make application for land, figuring that if they should draw an early number, that is, in the first five hundred, they would file, no thought of making a home, but simply to sell the relinquishment for the largest possible price. When the filings were made, about sixty had dropped out of the first five hundred, and even more out of the second five hundred, evidently thinking they were not likely to get enough for the relinquishment to pay them for their trouble and original investment, since it cost them a first payment of two hundred and six dollars on the purchase price of six dollars per acre and a locating fee of twenty five dollars and in some cases the first expense reached three hundred dollars if the relinquishment was not sold before the six months allowed for establishing residence expired it was necessary to establish residence making sufficient improvement for that purpose or lose the money invested out of the first four thousand numbers some two thousand had filed and practically half of this number had contracted to sell their relinquishments the buyers had deposited the amount to be paid in some bank to the credit of the claimant to be turned over when the purchaser had secured filing on the land the bank acting as agent between the parties to the transaction i shall long remember october first nineteen blank in Megori, called the magic city and claiming a population of three thousand but probably not exceeding one thousand five hundred actual inhabitants though filled with transients from the beginning of the rush a year before and had at no time during this period less than two thousand five hundred persons in the town my bride-to-be and my grandmother had received numbers one thirty eight and one thirty nine which would likely be called to file the second day while my sister received one seventy on the afternoon of the second orleon and my grandmother who had raised a family in the days of slavery and was then about seventy-seven years of age were called and came out of the land office a few minutes later with their blue papers receipts for the two hundred six dollars first payment and fees which i had given the agent before they entered the land office their agent went into the land office with them to see that they got a straight filing which they received my sister however was not called that day and the next day being sunday she would not be called until the following monday the place my grandmother had filed on had been bought by a megory school teacher who had paid one thousand four hundred dollars to a real estate dealer for the relinquishment of the same place the claimant had issued two relinquishments which was easy enough to do though the relinquishment accompanied by his land office receipt was the only bona fide one and we had the receipt the teacher had stood in line the long night through behind my sister and then lost the place the dealer who sold her the relinquishment was very angry as he was to get six hundred dollars in the deal giving the claimant only eight hundred when i learned this and that the teacher had lost out i was very sorry for her but it was a case of first come first served and many other mix-ups between buyers and dealers had occurred i went to the teacher and apologized as best i could she looked very pitiful as she told me how she had taught so many years to save the money and her dreams had been of nothing but securing a claim her eyes filled with tears, and she bent her head and began crying, and thus I left her. The next morning I sent Miss McCraleen and Mrs. Ewis back to Chicago, and proceeded to the claims of my sister and grandmother, which I found to be good ones. I had whirled around them in an auto before I bought them, and though being satisfied that they laid well, I had not examined the soil or walked across them. In a week I had two frame houses, ten by ten, built on them, and within another week they had commenced living on them. 
Shortly after they moved on to the claims came one of the biggest snowstorms I had ever seen. It snowed for days, and then came warm weather, thawing the snow, then more snow. The corn in the fields had not been gathered, nor was it all gathered before the following April. Most of the settlers in the new county were from twenty to fifty miles from Callias, and winter caught many of them without fuel, and the suffering from cold was intense. The snow continued to fall until it was about four feet deep on the level. Fortunately, I had hauled enough coal to last my folks through the winter, and they had only to get to Ritten, a distance of eight miles, to get food. I had just gathered two loads out of a ninety-acre field. Being snowbound with nothing to do, I watched a fight between Amro and Victor with interest. End of chapter 32Chapter 33 of The Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Conquest by Oscar Michaud. Chapter 33 The Survival of the Fittest. After the lot sale, Amro still refused to move. It was then Ernest Nicholson said the town had to be overcome somehow, and he had to do it. The businessmen of the town continued to hold meetings and pass resolutions to stick together. They argued that all they had to do to save the town was to stick together. This was the slogan of each meeting. The county seat, no doubt, held them more than the meetings, but it was not long before signs of weakening began to appear here and there along the ranks. Victor to the north, in the opinion of the people abroad, would get the road. Lots were being bought up, and business people from elsewhere were continuing to locate and erect substantial buildings in the new town and then it was reported that george roan who had recently sold his livery barn in amro where he had made a bunch of money had bought five lots in victor paying fancy prices for them by getting a refund of fifty per cent if he moved or started his residence hotel by january first this report could not be confirmed as roan could not be found but soon conflicting reports filled the air, and old Dad Derpy, who loved his corner lot in Amro, like a hog loves corn, made daily trips up and down Main Street, railing the boys. The more he talked, the more excited he became. My good men, he would shout, with his arms stretched above his head like Billy Sunday after preaching a while. Stick together. Stick together. We've got the best town in the best county, in the best state, in the best country in the world. What more do you want? He would fairly rave, with his old eyes stretched widely open and his shaggy beard flowing in the breeze. He continued this until he bored the people and weakened the already weakening forces. There were many good businessmen in Amro, among them young men of sterling qualities, college-bred, ambitious, and with dreams of great success and of establishing themselves securely. Many of them had sweethearts in the East and desired to make a showing and profit as well and how were they to do this in a town in which even outsiders though they might not admire the nicholsons were predicting failure for those who remained and declaring they were foolish to stay this young blood was getting hard to control and to hold them something more had to be done than declaring ernest nicholson to be trying to wreck the town and break up their homes poor fools i would think as i listened to them talking as though ernest nicholson had anything to do with the railroad missing the town it was simply the mistaken location it had been an easy matter for the promoters whose capital was mostly in the air to locate amro on the allotment of oliver amaro because they could do so without paying anything and did not have to pay fifty five dollars an acre for deeded land as nicholson had done being centrally located with enough buildings to encourage the building of more, they induced the governor to organize the county when few but illiterate Indians and thieving mixed bloods could vote, fairly stealing the county seat before the bona fide settlers had any chance to express themselves on the matter. They had doggedly invested more money in cement walks and other improvements when disinterested persons had criticized their actions, loading the township with $11,000 seven per cent interest bearing bonds that sold at a big discount 
to build a schoolhouse large enough for a town three times the size of Amram. This angered the settlers, and being dissatisfied because they were disenfranchised by the rascals who engineered the plan, Amro began rapidly to lose outside sympathy. Ernest Nicholson had a pleasing personality, and forceful as well. He was a king at reasoning, and whenever a weak Amorite was in Callias, he was invited into the town site company's office, which was luxuriously furnished, the walls profusely decorated with pictures of prominent capitalists and financiers of the Middle West, some of whom were financing the schemes of the fine-looking young men who were trying to show these struggling waifs of the prairie the inevitable result. All that was needed was to break into the town in some way or other, for it was essential that Amro be absorbed by Victor before the election, ten months away. The town should be entirely broken up. If it still existed, with or without the road, it had a good chance of holding the county seat. A county seat is a very hard thing to move. In fact, according to the records of western states, few county seats have ever been moved. Megary's county seat was located 40 miles from Megary, in the extreme east end of the county, where the county ran to a point, and the river on the north and the south boundary of the county formed an acute angle, yet the county seat remains at Fairview, and the voters keep it there, where no one but a handful of farmers and the few hundred inhabitants of the town reside. When trying to remove the county seat, every town in the county jumps into the race, persisting in the contention that their town is the proper place for the county seat and when election comes, the farmers who represent from 65 to 90 percent of the vote in states like Dakota vote for the town nearest their farm, thinking only of their own selfish interests and forgetting the county's welfare, as the victor must have a majority of all votes cast. Another example of this condition is near where this story is written, on the east bank of the Missouri. It is a place called Keeler, the most godforsaken place in the world with only three or four ramshackle buildings and a post office, with little or no county trade. Yet this is the county seat, the capital of one of the leading counties of the state, while half a dozen good towns along the lines of the C.M. and St. Louis Road cart their records and hold court in Keeler, 20 miles from the railroad. Every four years, for 30 years, the county seat has been elected to stay at Keeler, as no town can get a majority of all votes cast against Keeler, which doesn't even enter the race. All of these facts had their bearing on Ernest Nicholson in his office at Callias, and had helped to hold Amro together, until Van Netter was called into Callias and into the private office of King Ernest, as Amro had named him. What passed in that office at this interview is a matter of conjecture, but when Van Netter came out of the office, he carried a check for 7000 five hundred dollars, and Ernest Nicholson became the owner of the two-story, fifty-by-one-hundred-foot hotel and lot, Amro's most popular corner. When this news reached Amro, pandemonium reigned. Businessmen passed from one place of business to another, talking in low tones and shaking their heads significantly, while old dad Derpy, nearer maniac than ever before, went the rounds of the town shouting in a high staccato tone, what do you think of it? What do you think of the ordinary low-down rascals selling out, selling out to that band of dirty thieves and town records? By the living gods! With his arms folded like a tragedian, eyes rolled to the skies, and his form reared back till his knees stuck forward. Then raising his hand, he solemnly swore, I'll stay in Amro, I'll stay in Amro, I'll stay in Amro, till his voice rose to a hoarse scream. I'll stay in Amro until the town is deserted to the last D blank N building and the last dog is dead. And he did, though I cannot say as to the last dog. Nicholson had the hotel closed, and although the snow was more than knee deep on the level, a force of carpenters at once began cutting the building in two, preparing to move it into the new town. Old Macalacy Finn, a one armed hatchet faced Irishman, with a long sandy mustache and pop eyes, who had moved brick buildings in the Windy City, was sent to Amro and declared in Joe Cook's saloon that he'd put that damn cracker box in Victor in fifteen days, and armed with a force of carpenters and laborers, 
the plaster was soon knocked off the walls of the largest and best building in amro and thrown into the streets while the new cement walks only fifty feet in front and one hundred by eight at the side were broken into slabs and piled roughly aside then huge timbers twenty four by thirty two inches and sixty feet long from the redwood forests of washington followed the jack screws and blocks under the building two sixty horsepower mounted tractors with double boilers and horsepower locomotive construction low wheels and high cabs where the engineer perched like a bird steamed into the town and prepared to pull the structure from its foundations the crowd gathered to watch as the powerful engines began to cough and roar with an occasional short puff like fast passenger engines on the new york central the power being sufficient to tear the building to splinters creaky in every joint the hotel building began slowly moving out into the street the telephone wires which belonged to the nicholsons had been cut and thrown aside and the town was temporarily without telephonic communications the powerful engines easily pulled the hotel between banks of snow which had been shoveled aside to make room for the passing of the building across the grades and ditches and on toward victor a block and tackle was used whenever the building became stuck fast and in a few days the hotel was serving the public on a corner lot in victor where it added materially to the appearance of the town following the footsteps of old callias the town now being broken by the removal of the hotel the dark cellar over which it stood gaping like an open grave to be gazed into at every turn became a small consequence and in victor the price of corner lots had advanced from one thousand five hundred to two thousand and three thousand dollars while inside lots were being offered at from one thousand two hundred to one thousand eight hundred dollars which had formerly priced from eight hundred to one thousand two hundred dollars this did not discourage those who wanted to move to the new town all that was desired by former rock-ribbed amorites was to get to victor they talked nothing but victor the name of amro was almost forgotten before the hotel building had fairly left the town other traction engines were brought to the town the snow was a great hindrance and to get coal hauled from callias cost seventy five cents a hundred labor and board was high and in fact all prices for everything were very high it was in the middle of one of the cold winters of the plains but money had been made in amro and was offered freely in payment for moving to the new town it was bitter cold and the snow was light and drifting the ground frozen under the snow two feet deep but the frozen ground would hold up to the buildings better than it would when the warm weather came and started to thaw the soil being underlaid with sand it would be impossible to move the buildings over it if rain should come as it would be likely to do in the spring and with the melted snow to hinder it would then be very difficult to move the buildings it was small wonder that they were anxious to get away from the disrupted town at this time and the road between amro and victor became a much used thoroughfare the traction engines pounding from early morning until late at night filled the air with the noise as of railroad yards while the happy faces of the owners of the buildings arriving in victor and the anxious ones waiting to be moved gave material for interesting study of human nature george rowan had built a new barn in victor and was much pleased over having sold the old one in amro before the town went to pieces thereby saving the expense of removal and getting a refund of fifty per cent of the purchase price of the lots he purchased in victor many buildings continued to arrive from amro and new ones being erected did credit to the name of the new town by growing faster than any of the towns on the reservation including callias or megary End of chapter 33。by Oscar Michaud. Chapter 34 East of State Street I had in due time heard from Orlean saying she and Mrs. Ewis had arrived safely home. 
She wrote, When I came into the house, Mama grabbed me and held me for a long time as though she was afraid I was not real. She had been so worried while I was away and was so glad I had returned before Father came. They had received a telegram from her father saying that he had again been appointed presiding elder of the Cairo district and would be home within a few days. I judged from what Mrs. Ewis had told me that the Reverend was not much of a businessman and a hard one to make understand a business proposition or to reason with. He had only two children, and Orlean, as Mrs. Ewis informed me, was his favorite. She had always been an obedient child, was graduated from the Chicago High School and spent two years at a colored boarding school in Ohio that was kept up by the African M.E. Church, had taught two years, but had not secured a school that year. She had saved a hundred dollars out of the money she had earned teaching school. The young man who married her sister worked for a trading stamp corporation and received $13 a week, while the reverend was supposed to receive about $1,000 a year as presiding elder. There were some 12 or 15 churches on his circuit, where quarterly conference was held every three months, and each church was expected to contribute a certain amount at that time. Each member was supposed to give 25 cents, which they did not always do. In a town like Embro, for instance, where the church had 100 members, not over 25 are considered live members. That is, only 25 could be depended upon to pay their quarterly dues regularly, the others being spasmodic, contributing freely at times or nothing at all for a long time. Orlean often laughed as she told me some of the many ways her father had of making the dead ones contribute, but with all the tricks and turns the position was not a lucrative one, there being no certainty as to the amount of the compensation. Mrs. Ewis told me the family had always been poor, and got along only by saving in every direction. I could see this, as Orlean seemed to have few clothes, and had worn her sister's hat to Dakota. Her sister was said to be very mean and disagreeable, and if anyone in the family had to do without anything, it was never the sister. She was quarrelsome and much disliked, while Orlean was the opposite, and would cheerfully deprive herself of anything necessary. Her mother, Mrs. Ewis, went on to tell me, was a devil, spiteful and mean, and as helpless as a baby. I believed a part of this, but not all. I had listened to Mrs. McCrayline, and while I felt she was somewhat on the helpless order, I did not believe she was mean, nor a devil." Meanness and deviltry are usually discernible in the eyes, and I had seen none of it in the eyes of either Mrs. McCrayline or Orlean. But I did not like Ethel, and from what little Miss Ankin told me about the Reverend, I was inclined to believe that he was likely to be the devil, and Mrs. Ewis's information regarding Mrs. McCrayline was probably inspired by jealousy. I remember that back in M. Plus, the preacher's wives were timid creatures, submissive to any order or condition their elder husbands put upon them, submitting too much in order to keep peace, never raising a row over the gossip that came to their ears from malicious sisters and church workers. As long as I could remember, the colored ministers were accused of many ugly things concerning them and the sisters, mostly women who worked in the church, but I had forgotten it until I now began hearing the gossip concerning Reverend McCrayline. Orlean, her father and her brother-in-law 
had begun buying a home on Vernon Avenue for which they were to pay $4,500. Of this amount, $300 had been paid, 100 by each of them. It was a nice little place, with eight rooms and with a stone front. Ethel had not paid anything, using her money in preparation for her wedding, which had taken place in September. Claves and her father had spent two hundred on it, which seemed very foolish, and were pinched to the last cent when it was done. Claves had borrowed five dollars from his brother when they went on the wedding trip to pay for a taxi to the depot. The wedding tour and honeymoon lasted two weeks and was spent in Racine, Wisconsin, sixty miles north of Chicago. They had just returned when I went to Chicago. When I first called, Mrs. Claves did not come down, but when we returned to the house, she condescended to come down and shake hands. She put on enough airs to have been a king's daughter. With the three hundred dollars already paid on the home, they figured they should be able to pay for it in seven years in monthly installments of thirty-five dollars, paying the interest upon the principal at the same time, excepting two thousand, which was in a first mortgage, and drew five per cent, and payable semi-annually. The house was in a quiet neighborhood much unlike the south end of Dearborn Street and Armour Avenue, where none but colored people live. The better class of Chicago's colored population was making a strenuous effort to get away from the rougher set, as well as to get out of the black belt which is centered around Armour, Dearborn, State, and 31st. Here the saloons, barber shops, restaurants, and vaudeville shows are run by colored people, also the clubs and dance houses. East from State Street to the lake, which is referred to by the colored people of the city as East of State, there is another and altogether different class. Here, for a long while, colored people could hardly rent or buy a place. Then, as the white population drifted farther south to Greenwood Avenue, Hyde Park, Kenwood, and other parts now fashionable districts, some of the avenues including Wabash, Rhodes, Calumet, Vernon, and Indiana began renting to colored people, and a few began buying. Chicago is the Mecca for Southern Negroes. The better class continued to desert Dearborn and Armour and paid exorbitant rent for flats east of State Street. Some lost what they had made on Armour Avenue, where rent was sometimes less than one-half what was charged five blocks east, and had to move back to Armour. As more colored people moved toward the lake, more white people moved farther south. Rent began falling, and real estate dealers began offering former homes of rich families first for rent, then for sale and many others began buying, as Reverend McCrayline had done, making a small cash payment, and in this way otherwise unsaleable property was disposed of at from five to ten per cent more than it would have brought at a cash sale. The place they were buying could have been purchased for $3,800 or $4,000 in cash. After moving east of State Street, these people formed into little sets which represented the more elite and later developed into a sort of local aristocracy, which was not distinguished so much by wealth as by the airs and conventionality of its members, who did not go to public dances on State Street and drink can beer. Here, for a time, they were secure from the vulgar intrusion of the noisy loudmouths, as they called them, of State Street. The last time I was in Chicago, State Street, the deadline, had been crossed, 
and a part of Wabash Avenue is almost as noisy and vulgar as Dearborn. Beer cans, rough clubs, and dudes were becoming as familiar sights as on armor, and a large part of that part of the east side is so filled up with colored people that it is only a question of time until it will be a part of the black belt. Orlean's brother-in-law had come to Chicago several years previous from a stumpy farm in the backwoods of Tennessee. He was the son of a jack-legged preacher and was very ignorant, but had been going with the girl he married some six years, and she had trained him out of much of it, and when he finally figured in the $200 wedding referred to, he felt himself admitted into society and highly exalted. He thought the Reverend a great man, Mrs. Ewis had told me, referring to him as a simian-headed negro who tried to walk and act like the Reverend. The McCray lines, especially Ethel, referred to themselves as the best people. I thought they were. They were not wicked, and I also guessed that Ethel felt very aristocratic, and I wondered whether I would like the Reverend. He seemed to be regarded as a sort of monarch, judging from the way he was spoken of by the family, but I had a hunch that he and I were not going to fall in love with each other. Still, I hoped not to be the one to start any unpleasantness and would at least wait until I met him before forming an opinion. I received a letter from him when he returned from the conference. He did not write a very brilliant letter, but was very reasonable and tried to appear a little serious when he referred to my having his daughter come to South Dakota and file on land. He concluded by saying he thought it a good thing for colored people to go west and take land. I received another letter from Orlean about the same time, telling me how her father had scolded her about going to the theater with me the Sunday night I had taken her, and pretended, as he had to me, to be very serious about the claim matter. But she wrote like this, quote, I know, Papa, and I could see he was just pleased over it all that he just strutted around like a rooster. End quote. She wanted to know when I was going to send the ring, but as I had not thought about it, I do not recall what answer I made her, but do remember that my trip to get her and Mrs. Ewis and send them home again, including my own expenses, amounted to one hundred sixty dollars, besides the cost of the land, and having had to pay my sister's and grandmother's way also, and get them started on their homesteads, had taken all of seven thousand six hundred dollars I had borrowed on my land, that I was snowbound with my corn in the field, and my wheat still unthreshed, I began to write long letters, trying to reason this out with her. She was willing to listen to reason, but seemed so unhappy without the ring, and I imagined as I read her letters that I could see tears. She said when a girl is engaged, she feels lost without a ring, and too, here she seemed to emphasize her words, everybody expects it. I was sure she was telling the truth for with girls east of State Street, and west as well, the most important thing in an engagement is the ring, sometimes being more important than the man himself. When I lived in Chicago, and since I had been living in Dakota and going to Chicago once a year, I knew that Loftus brothers had more mortgages on the moral future and jobs of the young society men, for the diamonds worn by their sweethearts or wives than would appear comforting to the credit man. It made no difference what kind of a job a man might have, as all the way from a boot black or a janitor to head waiters and post office clerks were included, 
and their woman folks wore some size of a diamond. I asked myself what I was to do. I could not hope to begin changing customs, so I bought a forty-dollar diamond set and a small eighteen-carat ring, which just fit, as she wrote later, in the sweetest kind of letter. I had written I was sorry that I could not be there to put it on, such a story. I had never thought of diamond rings or going after my wife after spending so much on preliminaries. What I had pictured was what I had seen while running to the Pacific coast, girls going west to marry their pioneer sweethearts who sent them the money or a ticket. They had gone, lots of them, to marry their brawny beau and lived happily ever after but the bow weren't negroes, nor the girls colored. Still, there are lots of colored men who would be out west building an empire, and plenty of nice colored girls who would journey thither and wed if they really understood the opportunities offered. But very few understand the situation or realize the opportunities open to them in this western country. I had expected to get married Christmas, but the snow had put a stop to that plan. Besides, I was so far behind in my work and had no place to bring my wife. I had abandoned my little soddy and was living in a house on the old town site, where I intended staying until spring. Then I would build and move on to my wife's homestead in Tip County. When Christmas came, Grandma and sister came down from Britain and stayed while I went to Chicago. I could scarcely afford it, but it had become a custom for me to spend Christmas in Chicago, and I wanted to know Orlean better, and I wanted to meet her father. I had written her that I wasn't coming, and when I arrived in the city and called at the house, her mother was surprised, but pleasantly. I thought she was such a kind little soul. She promised not to tell Orlean I was in the city. Orlean had secured a position in a downtown store, ladies' furnishings, and received five fifty per week, but couldn't keep it. And when I was gone, she called up Orlean and told her I was in the city. When I called in the evening, instead of surprising Orlean, I was surprised myself. The reverend hadn't arrived from southern Illinois, but was expected soon. Orlean had worked long enough to buy herself a new waist and coat, and Mrs. Ewis, who was a milliner, had given her a hat, and she was dressed somewhat better than formerly. The family had wanted to give her a nice wedding, like Ethel's, but found themselves unable to do so. The semi-annual interest on their $2,000 loan would be due in January, and a payment also, about $150 in all. The high cost of living in Chicago did not leave much out of $18.50 per week, and colored people in southern Illinois are not very prompt in paying their church dues, especially in midwinter. In fact, many of them have a hard time keeping away from the poorhouse or off the county, and when the reverend came home, he was very short of money. I remember how he appeared the evening I called. He had arrived in town that morning. He was a large man, standing well over six feet and weighing about two hundred pounds, small-boned and fleshy, which gave him a round, plump appearance and although he was then near sixty, not a wrinkle was visible in his face. He was very dark, with a medium forehead and high-bridged nose, making it possible for him to wear nose-glasses, the nose being very unlike the flat-nosed negro. The large square upper lip was partly hidden by a mustache sprinkled with gray, and his nearly white hair worn in a massive pompadour, contrasted sharply with the dark skin and rounded features. His great height gave him an unusually attractive appearance of which he, I later learned, was well aware and made the most. 
In fact, his personal appearance was his pride, but his eye was not the eye of an intelligent or deep-thinking man. They reminded me more of the eyes of a pig, full but expressionless, and he could put on airs, such a drawing up and spreading out, seeming to give the impression of being hard to approach. When introduced to him, I had another hunch we were not going to like each other. I was always frank, forward, and unafraid, and his ceremonious manner did not affect me in the least. I went straight to him, taking his hand in response to the introduction and saying a few commonplace things. They were very homelike for city people, inviting me to supper and treating me with much respect. The head of the table was occupied by the reverend when he was at home and by Claves when the reverend was away. I could readily see where Ethel got her airs. It took him about thirty minutes to get over his ceremonious manner, after which we talked freely, or rather I talked. He was a poor listener, and although he never cut off my discourse in any way, he didn't listen as I had been used to having people listen, apparently with encouragement in their eyes, which makes talking a pleasure. So I soon ceased to talk. This, however, seemed still more awkward, and I grew to feel a trifle displeased in his company. On the following Sunday, we went to morning service on Wabash Avenue at a big stone structure. It appeared to be a rule of the household that the girls should go out together. This displeased me very much, as I had grown to dislike Ethel and Claves did not interest me. Both talked of society and swell people they wanted me to meet, putting it in such a way as to have me feel I was meeting my betters, while the truth of the matter was that I did not desire to meet any of their friends, nor to have them with us anywhere we went. When church services were over, we went to spend the time before Sunday school opened with some friends of theirs named Latimer, who lived on Wabash Avenue near the church, and who were so nearly white that they could easily have passed for white people. The family consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Latimer and Mr. Latimer's sister, and were the most interesting people I had ever met on any of my trips to Chicago. They inquired all about Dakota and whether there were many colored settlers in the state, listening to every word with careful attention and approving or disapproving with nods and smiles. While they were so deeply interested, Claves, who had a reputation for butting in and talking too much, interrupted the conversation, blurting out his opinion, stopping me and embarrassing them, by stating that colored people had been held in slavery for two hundred years, and since they were free, they did not want to go out into the wilderness and sit on a farm, but wanted to be where they could have freedom and convenience and this was sanctioned by a friend of Claves, who was still more ignorant than he. This angered Orlean, and when we were outside, even Ethel expressed her disgust at Claves' ignorance. They told me that the Latimers were very well-to-do, owning considerable property besides the three-story building where they lived. To me, this accounted for their careful attention, for it is my opinion that when you find a colored man or woman who has succeeded in actually doing something and not merely pretending to, you will find an interesting and reasonable person to converse with, and one who will listen to a description of conditions and opportunities with marked intelligence. Orlean and I attended a few shows at the downtown theaters during the week, the first being a pathetic drama which our friends advised us to see entitled Madam X. I did not like it at all. The leading character is the wife of a businessman who has left her husband and remains away from him two years, presumably discouraged over his lack of affection, is very young and wants to be loved, 
as the old story goes, and the husband is too busy to know that she is unhappy. She returns after two years and asks forgiveness and love, but is turned away by the husband. Twenty years later, in the closing act, a court scene decorates the stage. A woman is on trial for killing the man she has lived with unlawfully. She had been a woman of the street and lived with many others before living with the one murdered. The young lawyer who has her case is her son, although he is not aware of this fact. He has just been admitted to the bar, and this is his first case, having been appointed to the defense by the court. He takes the stand and delivers an eloquent address on behalf of the woman, who appears to be so saturated with liquor and cocaine as to be oblivious of her surroundings. She expires from the effect of her dissipations, but just before death she looks up and recognizes her son, she having been the young wife who left her home twenty-two years before. The unhappy father, who had suffered as only a deserted husband can, and who had prayed for many years for the return of the wife, is present in the courtroom and together with the son are at her side in death. As the climax of the play is reached, suppressed sobs became audible in the balcony, where we had seats. The scene was pathetic indeed and I had hard work keeping back the tears while my betrothed was using her handkerchief freely. What I did not like about the play was the fact of her going away and taking up an immoral life instead of remaining pure and returning later to her husband. The husband, as the play goes, had not been a bad man and was unhappy throughout the play and I argued this with Orlean all the way home. Why did she not remain good, and when she returned he could have gathered her into his arms and lived happily ever after? Not only my fiancé, but most other women I have talked with about the play contend that he could have taken her back when she returned and been good to her. The man who wrote the play may have been a tragedian, but the management that put it on the road knew a money-maker and kept it there as long as the people patronized the box office. The next play we attended suited me better, as to my mind it possessed all that Madame X lacked, and instead of weakness and an unhappy ending, this was one of strength of character and a happy finale. It was The Fourth Estate by Joseph Medal Patterson, who served his apprenticeship in writing on the Chicago Tribune. It was a newspaper play, and its interest centered around one Wheeler Brand, who, through the purchase of a big city daily by a Western man with the bigness to hand out the truth regardless of the threats of the big advertisers, becomes managing editor. He relentlessly goes after one Judge Bartling, whose rotten decisions had but sufficed to help big business and without regard to their effect upon the poor. The one really square decision was recalled before it took effect. To complicate matters, the young editor loves the judge's daughter, and while Brand holds a high place in Miss Bartling's regard, he is made to feel that to retain it he must stop the fight on her father. Brand pleads with her to see the moral of it, but is unable to change her views. One evening, Brand secures a flashlight photo and telephone witnesses of an interview with the judge the photo showing the judge in the act of handing him a $10,000 bribe. Late that night, Brand has the article exposing this transaction in type and ready for the press, when the proprietor, who has heretofore been so pleased with Brand's performance, but whose wife has gained an entrance into society through the influence of Judge Bartling, enters the office with the order to kill the story. This was a hard blow to the coming newspaper man. The judge calls and jokes him about being a smart boy but crazed with ideals, 
but is shocked when he turns to find his daughter has entered the office and has heard the conversation. He tells her to come along home with Papa, but she decides to remain with Brand. She has thought her father in the right all along, but now that she has heard her father condone dishonesty, she can no longer think so. Wheeler disobeys orders and sends the paper to press without killing the story, and all's well that ends well. In a week or so, I was back in Dakota, where the thermometer registered 25 below with plenty of snow for company. I received a letter from the Reverend shortly after returning home, saying they hoped to see me in Chicago again soon. I did not know what that meant unless it was that I was expected to return to be married, but as I had been to Chicago twice in less than four months, and had suggested to Orlean that she come to Megory and be married there, I supposed that it was all settled. But this was where I began to learn that the McCrayline family were very inconsiderate. I had not claimed to be wealthy or to have unlimited amounts of money to spend in going to and from Chicago, as though it were a matter of eighty miles instead of eight hundred. I had explained to the Reverend that it was a burden rather than a luxury to be possessed of a lot of raw land until it could be cultivated and made to yield a profit. I recalled that while talking with the Reverend in regard to this, he had nodded his head in assent, but with no facial expression to indicate that he understood or cared. The more I knew him, the more I disliked him, and was very sorry that Orlean regarded his as a great man, although his immediate family were the only ones who regarded him in that light. I had learned to expect his ceremonious manner, but was considerably tried by his apparent dullness and lack of interest or encouragement of practical ideas. I put volumes into my letters to Orlean, trying to make clear why she should condescend to come to Megory and be quietly married, instead of obliging me to return to Chicago. I had no more money— as it was expensive to keep my grandmother and sister on their claims. They had no money, and I had no outside support, not even the moral support of my people, nor of Orleans, who all seemed to take it for granted that I had plenty of ready money. I had not taken a cent out of the crop I had raised, the corn still standing in the field, with a heavy snow on the ground, and my small grain still unthreshed. However, my letters were in vain. Miss McCrayline could see no other way than that if I cared for her, I'd come and marry her at home, which she contended was no more than right, and would look much better." I sighed wearily over it all and began to suspect I was in the right church, but in the wrong pew. End of chapter 34